Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? There are none. On that basis, I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one. A Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill to, uh, 2021. Further consideration in Committee of the Whole. Senate. Senator Sewell. Hi, Deputy President. I think you'll find that Senator McKim would, is seeking the call. Okay, and I'll just introduce where we're up to. Thank you. And then we'll go to Senator McKim. The committee is considering the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill 2021 and Amendments 1 and 2 on Sheet 1142, uh, moved by Senator Cash on behalf of Senator Hanson. And I'm going to go to Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy President. Well, this amendment confirms that One Nation is nothing more than <laughs> lapdogs to the government. Three weeks ago, this Senate had the government on the ropes on its JobKeeper rorts. We had a government bill to give the Treasurer a new round of powers to make COVID support payments, and the Senate supported an amendment, moved by Senator Patrick, requiring that a public register of who got JobKeeper be established. The Senate had clearly said to the government, if you want the parliament to give you more powers to give out more money, then we want a little bit of transparency in return. So we collectively sent an amended bill down to the House. The government then rejected those amendments and we had a standoff. So collectively, we had to answer the question, do we insist or do we fold? Well, the Australian Greens were up for insisting. At that time, the entirety of the crossbench were up for insisting. But then, unfortunately, the Labor Party went to water like a dog on a hot day. The bill came back to the Senate and the Australian Labor Party folded as they so often do. Now here we are again with a new round of amendments to a different government bill and it's one nation who have folded this time. Worse than that, they're actually providing cover for the government. Their amendment, which would require ASIC to, to report details of JobKeeper payments to publicly listed companies only, is next to useless because we already have that information, because publicly listed companies report that information. For the benefit of Senator Roberts, that's what being a publicly listed company actually involves. Now, Ownership Matters have done some work on this overnight. By their count, while ASX 300's 300 companies certainly got a lot of JobKeeper, around $2.5 billion, that accounts for less than 5 per cent, less than 5 per cent, colleagues, of the total of around $90 billion in JobKeeper payments. So with One Nation's amendment, we won't even know about the other 95 
20%. Any JobKeeper payments made to private companies, for example, or any other entities not listed in Australia will remain secret. Payments made to private schools will remain secret. Payments made to companies owned by foreign governments, including the CCP, which One Nation claimed to be so worried about, will remain secret. Payments made to companies domiciled in tax havens will remain secret. We will find out next to nothing that we didn't already know. But what One Nation's amendment actually does is provide a significant amount of cover and a massive escape hatch for the government. Just as public pressure on the JobKeeper rorts starts mounting to unsustainable levels, in steps One Nation to help out their mates in the Liberal Party. We've got more reports in the ABC this morning showing that at least $6 billion in JobKeeper payments went to companies that increased their turnover in both the June and September quarters of last year. But thanks to One Nation stitch up with the government, we won't ever find out who the majority of those companies are. We won't know who has profited so massively at the expense of the Australian public. We won't know which mates of this government lined their pockets in one of the biggest financial rorts this country has ever seen as Australia's biggest support package became Australia's most rorted support package. And we won't know because Labor failed to insist on amendments when we had the government on the ropes last week and because One Nation have stepped up and showed that they are patsies to the government in helping the government out of this massively increasing public pressure which is coming to bear on the JobKeeper rorts. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is, uh, Senator McAllister. I rise to contribute <coughs> briefly, and I did make a contribution about this amendment last night. But I want to put Labor's position very firmly on the record, particularly given the unreasonable, partisan and inaccurate characterisation of Labor's position by Senator McKim just now. Of course, Labor has led the campaign, led the public campaign around JobKeeper and transparency, and I commend the work of my colleague Andrew Lee in the other place who has assiduously documented the organisations that have received JobKeeper whose profitability and whose turnover in fact increased rather than decreased during the pandemic. Because in the early months of JobKeeper, 15 per cent of the money went to firms with rising earnings. These firms then received about $13 billion across the whole program. It's eye-watering. It is an eye-watering number. And it's why Labor led that debate about JobKeeper misuse, pointing to firms such as Accent Group, AP Eagers, Best and Less, as well as the Men's Only Australian Club and the King's School, all of whom got JobKeeper despite increasing their earnings. Now, some companies have repaid with repayments totalling $225 million. That's a big number, isn't it? But it's not nearly as big as $13 billion—$13 billion of waste that this government has been happy just to overlook and ignore. Now, in New Zealand, they're committed to transparency around these issues. They've had an online register listing all recipients of their wage subsidy scheme, and around 5 per cent has been repaid. That is almost certainly a result of having greater transparency. That is what transparency produces, and it's why in this dimension and others, including around tax policy, we argue consistently for much greater transparency. Proposing a transparency register for the JobKeeper program is responsible from a policy and a governance stance. Transparency is not something that has ever been a priority for this government, which slips and slides away from accountability whenever provided an opportunity to do so. 
On this occasion, they are trying to hide historical amounts of waste and gross mismanagement of public money. And that's the real problem here. The government do not want to see, do not want Australians to see how badly they have steered the JobKeeper ship. When you look at a firm like Best and Less, who told investors that this was a one-off sugar hit from JobKeeper that was never to be repeated, well, that's the sort of example you don't need. That's the sort of failure in policy design that you'd think a government might be interested in. But instead of confronting the problems, instead of confronting the waste, instead of confronting their own mistakes, owning up to it with the community, the government's approach, as always, is to try and hide it. Look at a car sector firm like AP Eagers, $130 million in JobKeeper, despite an increase in their profits. We want to see government providing transparency because with greater accountability comes better public behaviour. It's public firms that have made the lion's share of JobKeeper repayments. Yes, $225 million paid back by 25 companies, and almost all of that is by public firms because of the scrutiny that came as a result of listed entities being required to disclose JobKeeper. For the unlisted firms, we're only getting dribs and drabs. And that is the problem, isn't it? It's the problem with the amendment that's before us because it only deals with the companies that are already required to disclose the JobKeeper that they have already received. Senator McKim has sought to mischaracterise Labor's position on this. When this matter was last debated in this place, we supported an amendment for JobKeeper transparency, and that's consistent with the public approach. It's consistent with the campaign run by Andrew Lee, my colleague. But this government, so scared of transparency, were willing to play chicken with the resources that are so desperately needed to support the economy right now for Australian businesses and families. And they threatened to hold up that bill, threatened the Australian public that if the Senate insisted on its amendment, then they would be willing, in an act of vindictive cowardice, to delay rolling out money altogether for the community. Well, that's not a risk that Labor is willing to take because we know that this is an immensely difficult time for businesses all around the country affected by the lockdowns that are a direct consequence of this government's failure in managing the pandemic. Difficult choices, but a responsible choice made by Labor to prioritise support for the economy. But we said at the first opportunity we would seek to introduce this amendment again, and this Senate should continue to introduce amendments to drive transparency. And people paying attention to this debate will not be fooled by silly partisan contributions like the one made by Senator McKim, which seek to make some electoral point for the Greens at the expense of Labor, neglecting the fact that it is in fact the Labor Party that has driven this campaign in the public domain. Later today, I imagine we will hear from Senator Patrick, who is moving a far more comprehensive amendment that goes to transparency of JobKeeper. And we support that approach. In fact, the amendment moved by Senator Patrick is the same as the amendment submitted by me. And as I outlined last night, we have gone through a sorry saga where One Nation initially said, yes, they support this approach. Then they said, oh, it's moved by Labor. We don't support it because Labor hurt our feelings recently. A novel confession that their approach in this chamber is driven by childish emotions rather than an assessment of the policy proposition, but there you go. But now we find ourselves with One Nation with an entirely different proposition again. One which will assist businesses around the country to conceal their receipts from JobKeeper. And it puts the lie to the assertion from One Nation that they're on the side of the battlers. How can it possibly be on the side of the battlers 
to support and prop up this government in concealing waste and mismanagement. It doesn't sound like something that battlers would be interested in to me. It doesn't sound like something the people of Queensland would be interested in to me. And I think One Nation should explain why it is that they are supporting such a limited, ineffective, redundant approach to transparency when a much more comprehensive option is on the table. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator. Chair, I seek the call. Uh, the, I'm giving the call to uh, Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Chair. And I have spoken on this. I would just make a, a quick comment about partisan uh, statements being made around the change. Look, I, I, I do acknowledge the work that Andrew Lee has been doing on this, and I do believe the Labor Party are um, concerned about this. I think they made a tactical blunder when uh, they backed down on the insistence, but I don't uh, doubt their commitment uh, related to this issue. Um, I'm, I'm also very surprised with One Nation uh, not supporting it. Uh, they have brought transparency measures to the chamber before, which I've supported uh, and others have supported. It, it, uh, this seems very much uh, at odds with uh, some of the past conduct. Uh, and uh, this JobKeeper rorting, and that's what it has been, uh, companies that have uh, taken advantage of the goodwill uh, and the lack of prudential uh, safeguards from the Treasurer to uh, basically to loot money from the taxpayer. And uh, you know, there's a saying, you know, the, the, the thing that people who operate in uh, dark places fear the most is light. That's what we're trying to do in relation to this, is to shine a little bit of light on exactly what is going on here. Um, now, um, you know, as Senator Hanson, I, I won't go into private conversations, but did indicate that she was going to support this. Uh, she did call me uh, later to say that she was proposing an amendment, and uh, uh, so she was up front with me. I, I didn't see the amendment until just prior to this bill being debated, but it is a dud amendment. It basically uh, requires disclosure where disclosure is already required. Uh, in, in relation to public list, publicly listed companies. Now, I would like to, through you, Chair, and I know that Senator Roberts has uh, uh, indulged uh, in the past in relation to this, I would like to ask uh, a couple of questions of Senator Roberts about his, uh, about his amendment. Uh, the first one goes to the fact that uh, this amendment doesn't include foreign-owned uh, subsidiaries I point to an article in the AFR by Michael Roden on the 3rd of August that talks about the company, uh, uh, minor, the Minor Consolidated Minerals, booking $1.8 million in JobKeeper uh, with no loss in, uh, in profit. And it's a company that's well known for transfer pricing back to its Chinese-owned uh, 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 parents through a tax haven. Uh, I just w wonder that noting that no foreign subsidiaries, i.e. companies that are operating in Australia with an ABN but are a subsidiary of a foreign company uh, but are not listed on the Australian stock market, why it is that One Nation has decided to exclude them, that, those particular companies, from, uh, from this disclosure requirement? If, uh, I'd be grateful if uh, Senator Roberts could answer that question. Thank you, uh, Senator Patrick. I do believe Senator Roberts was seeking the call, so we'll go there now. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. I'd be delighted to answer that question and any others that uh, Senator Patrick has. Mm -hmm. I'll put that in context. Do we want showmanship or substance in the Senate? Parliament, for many people in our country, has lost relevance. People laugh at Labor and Liberal and Nationals in particular because it just uh, fails to have accountability. What we want to do is look at something substantive and significant, not just shaming people indiscriminately. One Nation, like its leader, Pauline Hanson, has strength of character. We can admit when we made an error. And we also value strong debate within our own party room. A staffer raised an issue with Senator Patrick's uh, amendment, and it led to a lot of a debate within our, within our party room. What we realised is that Senator Patrick's uh, amendment is not a transparency measure at all. It is a dud. 
and it will do damage, potentially. So what I'd like to do is to explain why, and then I'll get to Senator Patrick's question. Senator Patrick seeks to require the Commissioner of Taxation to publish JobKeeper payment information for entities with a turnover greater than $10 million. So note the restriction there, $10 million. So Senator Patrick is admitting there is some need for some restrictions. The proposal is said to be a transparency measure, that, is, that it is intended to allow taxpayers to see what has happened to the $90 billion spent on the JobKeeper program in the hope that the information will lead to some form of government or recipient accountability. One Nation wants the government held accountable for money wasted through the poor design of the JobKeeper program, something that the Parliament signed off on. So we don't bury the government in that. We take partial responsibility for it, and as every senator should. And it wants JobKeeper recipients who enrich themselves at the expense of taxpayers to be held accountable and the money to be returned. Unfortunately, Senator Patrick's proposal will not lead to accountability, the purpose of any transparency measure. The proposal is poorly conceived, although well intended. Senator Patrick's proposal is founded on the power of shame, but that power is ineffective against the shameless. The individuals who pocketed JobKeeper payments intended to help workers, Australian workers, through the toughest of times, are shameless, and this amendment will not shame them into returning the money. It will give us very little to understand about their circumstances or their, what they've done. Senator Patrick's proposal shines no light on the amount of money wasted by poor design of the JobKeeper program, because the proposal pro provides no way in which JobKeeper payments can be matched to other entity financial information. Without seeing the total picture of profit and loss, no one can form a view about waste and enrichment at individual business level or at a global level. Senator Patrick's proposal shows a failure to start with the end in mind, a necessary requirement for something useful to be achieved for good policy. It's been suggested Senator Patrick's proposal would have held, would have held accountable the big tax avoiders, that is privately owned entities and companies which are entirely owned by foreign companies. It won't and it can't. In the face of total failure by Senator Patrick's proposal to hold anyone accountable, One Nation was left with no choice but to put forward an alternative proposal. And that's what we've done in Senator Hansen's amendment. Senator Hansen's proposal is the first step in delivering accountability to taxpayers, real accountability, <coughs> not showmanship. She wasn't born politically in Senator Xenophon's circus. She was born in the real world of Australian small businesses and Australian workers and families. It will shine light, Senator Hansen's proposal will shine light on, these, on Australia's largest employers and largest recipients of JobKeeper payments. The reputational damage to listed companies who paid executives bonuses from JobKeeper cannot be underestimated, and that will be occurring with Senator Hansen's amendment. Senator Hansen's proposed amendment on sheet 1442 will see ASIC publish on its website a consolidated report on JobKeeper payments by listed entity. This information will be useful because the matching financial information will be available in a standardised form, and that is one key to accountability. Senator Hansen's transparency measure, a real transparency measure, will lead to a level of accountability through reputational damage to listed companies and by qualifying part of the money wasted by the poor design of the JobKeeper program. It will not tarnish those that have done the right thing. It will not lump everyone in the same basket. It will separate those, obviously, who have rorted it and, and deserve shame from those who have done the right thing by their employees. Senator Patrick's amendment is not an alternative trans transparency measure because it can achieve nothing. It is open to the Senate to work on other transparency measures which will lead to accountability in respect of the JobKeeper program. I gave an invitation to Senator Patrick and the Labor Party last night when I spoke about joining us to get real accountability through a proper, thorough audit. Neither mentioned it in their responses. Not one word about it. One Nation welcomes the opportunity to retrospectively fix the design of the JobKeeper program. If One Nation's amendment is not supported, we will know that Senator Patrick, the other crossbench senators, Labor and the Greens, were only ever interested in virtue <coughs> signalling rather than accountability. Peter Strong, the former head of COSBOA, said that Senator Patrick's um, am amendment will be very difficult for small and medium enterprises to comply with. 
Senator Patrick's amendment purports to do one thing and doesn't achieve that. It's an ill-conceived ill dud. What I would do is continue now to address some of the points that Senator McAllister and Senator Patrick raised last night. Senator Patrick's amendment would ultimately lead to every Australian business being forced to disclose their profit and loss statements, which could potentially lead to the nation's banks calling in loans of businesses they deem a risk following the impact of COVID. That's a serious threat, because the Labor Party and the Liberal Nationals have given the banks extraordinary power in this, this uh, country. Secondly, businesses needed to meet the test only once, and that was very simple. Mum and dad businesses had to see a 30% decline in their turnover in any month, in any given month that the JobKeeper payment began. Any business with a turnover of $1 billion had to show a decline in their business of 50%. Quite clear, the ATO, the Australian Taxation Office, ultimately determined the legitimacy of all JobKeeper applications. If Senator Patrick and Labor is worried about Gina Reinhart received, that, whether or not Gina Reinhart received JobKeeper, we can assure you she didn't, as one of our staff phoned her and asked the question this morning. The mining and farming sectors of this nation help pay for the spoils of JobKeeper, and they will continue to pay for the spoils of JobKeeper long into the future. I'll make some miscellaneous comments. Our position is based because this is an issue of context and fairness. It is not about simply naming and shaming. That shames the guiltless, the innocent. This is about context and fairness. And one of our staff has pointed it out to us, and we had the guts, Senator Hanson and I, to discuss this and debate it, and then come to a different conclusion from our initial conclusion. We don't, ha we don't mind saying we made a mistake. We don't mind saying we're sorry. We don't mind saying we're wrong. We don't mind saying we, we don't know, can you help us? But now, after we've done more work, we know our position is correct on this. And we want to protect workers and honest employers, and we want to have an effective transparency measure, not a dud. Because what's on trial is not Aussie workers, not the employees. We've got to remember that. We're happy to be hard on foreign firms and Aussie form, firms, but it's important to uphold Aussie values in doing so, and that means fairness and integrity. We do what is best in accord with Australia's national interest, in accord with Australian values. That's extremely important. Can I have the call? So uh, I'd just like to finish up by saying that a small business, a tractor dealer, employing very few people, can sell enough equipment after the drought has broken recently in places to cross that $10 million threshold. We need to understand that small business, business in context. We are tired of Labor Party spending decades protecting foreign companies. The Petroleum Rent Resources Tax comes to mind and many other initiatives. Senator Patrick's amendment is an ill-conceived dud that we woke up to at the last minute. We ask the senators interested in genuinely and fairly holding recipients accountable to vote for our amendment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. I believe you're seeking the call, Senator Hanson. Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, look, this whole thing, and we said when Senator Patrick put it up, yes, it sounded good to actually hold companies accountable who got the job seeker program. After further investigation into it and the information that we received, of course, it's, got, it's not going to achieve what it was attempted to. Um, <clears throat> Senator Roberts has covered a lot of the issues here. And it's quite interesting to hear Labor. I mean, say so here we have two senators on one nation side of the parliament doing the work that most of the Labor should have been on top of because they put up the same amendment, which is going to achieve absolutely nothing at the end result of what you want is accountability. It's not going to achieve that. Yet we can actually we can actually find out the information, put up an amendment that is going to have more results than what this uh, politicking and getting out there saying to people, look what we're doing, aren't we great? We're going to call for accountability, which will achieve absolutely nothing. Do you know why Labor, actually, if they're really serious about you know, accountability, then why haven't they put up an amendment 
that says companies pay back the money. Why? Because they're too gutless. That's exactly right. They're too gutless. And they also know that if you did that, companies would actually shut down, close their doors, and people would lose their jobs. Now, what we've done is we've dug deep into this. Um, Senator Patrick, he's up for re-election. And this is important, you know, I'm out there beating the drum and I'm actually want accountability, which will prove absolutely nothing. Oh, it all sounds good on the surface. That's what we get on the floor of Parliament all the time. What sounds good? But it constantly comes back into the Parliament, and I've found it for the last five years that we're band-aiding legislation that has been poorly drafted and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Now, with this, um, what we've put up the amendment, the proposed amendment on sheet 1442 will see ASIC publish on its website a consolidated report on JobKeeper payments by listed entity. This information will be useful because the matching financial information will be available in standardised form. And my amendment is, trans is a transparency measure will lead to a level of accountability through reputation damage to listed companies and by qualifying part of the money wasted by the poor design of the JobKeeper program. Senator Patrick's amendment is not an alternative transparency measure because it can achieve nothing. You see, with public listed companies, they actually have to show their profit and loss. Private listed companies don't. What are we comparing it to? Absolutely nothing. Senator Patrick, I've got to tell you, you should have been in the show, the greatest showman on earth, because that's what it is. What you're trying to sell us is a lemon. And the Labor Party have gone along with you. And you know what? The Labor Party really don't want to see this get up. They know with our votes, and that's why you're trying to shame One Nation into in we supporting your, your amendment, which is useless, because the Labor Party knows that it will get knocked back in the lower house. You've got no chance of getting it up. But at least with us, our amendment, there is a chance that it will get up and will come to accountability. So Labor are just smoke and mirrors, again, as usual. They don't even know what they're talking about. They're actually going on this little trip with you, prop you up, have a go at One Nation. Remember, everyone, it's coming into election time and there's going to be no end result. Not only that, I remember when I tried to get my dairy bill up and it needed one vote. That one vote was, was Rex Patrick. He didn't support it. But he said to me, he said, I go back and I talk to the people in my electorate. I actually find out what their feelings are and how they feel about things. Well, Senator Patrick, have you watched, read the newspaper today, the advertiser in your state? Are you aware that small businesses are totally against you? You have not consolidated, you have not spoken to them, you have not consulted with them. They are against you on this. And you say you talk to people? That's not the case, not what I'm hearing. So this is just a grandstanding to say, look at me, what I'm achieving. You're achieving nothing. And like I said, if the Labor Party go along with this, then you're too bloody gutless because you should have actually put up an amendment on how you're going to get the money back. No one's done that. And this shaming businesses, you know, you're going to tie up everyone into this, that people who have done the right thing, but you might have those rat bags out there that are going to tie up, tie up these small, small mums and dads businesses that have done the right thing, that it could have a, an a unintended consequences on them. Who knows? It might be the banks that have come after them, all these radical groups that might come after them, the name and shame. You know, there are people in our society, doesn't matter how much heat you put on them to shame them, it will not change their stinking attitude. So what we do, we start with legislation that is going to expose those people and it makes a start which will work. Your amendment will not work. Now, I have tried to work with the government to actually see sense in this, to actually, you know, make accountability. That's why Senator Roberts and I have worked hard together on this, to come up with a solution. Like I said, we are constantly trying to work with the government or the opposition or crossbenchers to come up with something that is right for the people of this country. We're sick of these 
you know, Labor hasn't got me, or we're not supporting this amendment because it's been rushed. How many times have I heard that with my amendments? Oh, we're not supporting it because it's rushed. Because Labor is so um, bloody-minded that they don't want to support anything that may be good for the people of Australia because they don't want to see that One Nation is doing their job. That's why they don't support us on most of our amendments that is good for this country. So if good legislation is put up by whoever, what side of politics, we will support it. But I am opposing your amendment because it achieves nothing. And I'm not going to put those small businesses into a situation where they may be attacked unnecessarily and unwarranted. So I say to Labor again, unless you've got a real fair income argument on this, you should be supporting my amendment because I tell you now, Patrick hasn't got a chance of getting up and you damn will know it too because you know it'll be thrown out because you haven't got the numbers in the lower house. So it'll be thrown out anyway. So let's get common sense um, here and put up and support this amendment that is going to bring some accountability to this country because that's what you really want, isn't it? You do want accountability. It's not out there grandstanding. It's not saying, look what I'm doing. You know, I'm trying to get accountability, which will achieve nothing because there's no transparency. And a lot of these privately listed companies, they don't put up their, their profit and loss statements. So what are you comparing it to? Nothing. Sorry, Rex, you tried, but your amendment is a lemon. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I'll just go through a few points uh, raised by Senator Hanson. I'll, I'll first point out that uh, Senator Roberts didn't answer my question, but I'll give him an opportunity to perhaps do that again. Um, the, the, uh, the dairy bill, I asked uh, local, uh, the local dairy industry, they didn't want to support it, and that's the basis upon which I opposed it. In relation to the advertiser this morning, go and have a look at the poll associated with the article that re you refer to. Over 70 per cent of uh, the people who responded to that said they don't think that the, um, the, the money that we're asking to be disclosed here is private information, it's public information. So I am certainly listening. You say that my uh, amendment could have unintended consequences when we know that if it's not uh, passed, it already has had unintended consequences. This is the biggest public expenditure scandal in the history of the Commonwealth. And One Nation are basically standing there saying, we're going to help cover it up. We're going to help cover it up. To suggest that my amendment doesn't do anything is to ignore the experience in New Zealand, where they've done exactly what my amendment does. They've, uh, they've managed to uh, get 5% return on their wage subsidy program. We've got 0.25%. So there is empirical data that shows, and I know how much uh, Senator Roberts likes to look at empirical data. The empirical data shows that in actual fact, transparency does, does work. Now, going back to my questions, which uh, my question that wasn't answered, and it just surprises me, um, uh, this amendment does not, does not uh, cause disclosure of any uh, foreign-owned subsidiaries in Australia. So money that, can, that, that may have been taken and then probably uh, using things like transfer pricing. Uh, uh, I'm sure that there are oil and gas companies that may have subsidiaries that have uh, collected JobKeeper. We won't know because, uh, because uh, you're not going to support my amendment. Uh, that uh, may also have uh, taken uh, taxpayers' money when it wasn't needed and used it to fill the, the pockets of foreign uh, investors, funneling our money, our taxpayers' money, from the pockets of Australians into the pockets of foreign investors. I wonder why it is that you haven't chosen to include public schools. There are four public, uh, sorry, uh, private schools. Okay, private schools uh, received JobKeeper. There are four in Ipswich that uh, received uh, JobKeeper. They didn't have a loss in turnover. That is money that has gone to public schools that won't go to, uh, sorry, to private schools that won't go to the public schools where the battlers are. You know, we, we, we've seen uh, last night in the boardrooms around Australia, there would have been champagne flowing, toasting to Malcolm Roberts and to, uh, and to um, 
uh, Senator Hanson, Senator Roberts and Senator Hanson, because they're, they're all about Bollinger, not Battlers. And that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the truth of the situation. Why is it that you're letting private universities not have to disclose? Why is it that you're letting subsidiaries of universities not, ha uh, not to uh, disclose? Clubs. Perhaps some of the good golf, golf clubs that Senator Roberts goes to, uh, you know, where, where people like me probably can't afford to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe uh, they don't want uh, the fact that they might have taken JobKeeper disclosed to them, uh, disclosed to the public. Uh, what about unlisted public companies? They're just as capable of looting the, the, uh, the taxpayer as anyone else. What about the private companies, those large grandfathered uh, companies that don't even have to provide a, a financial report to ASIC? They get away scot-free in relation to this. And it's bizarre because you, you, you know, you've supported uh, my grandfathering amendment, uh, which is uh, about disclosure, about disclosure of large private companies, and yet you won't uh, support this, which is, is, again, trying to deal with the biggest public expenditure scandal in the history of this country. And it's not going away. There are stories going to break over the weekend uh, uh, as to some of the entities that are, have received uh, this money and, and profited. And every time one of them breaks, everyone's going to be thinking about how it is that Senator Hanson, Senator Roberts did not support a good transparency measure. And I find it really confusing that, uh, that the suggestion is made that uh, my amendment is a dud because on four separate occasions, One Nation has supported it. For the last uh, month, One Nation has supported it. When it comes to the crunch, however, they falter. They, they join the side of uh, the looters. And uh, that is really disappointing. Uh, I, uh, I wonder whether or not uh, Senator Roberts can explain to the chamber exactly why they decided to exclude those particular companies. There are 10,000 companies that would be disclosed, uh, as the Tax Commissioner has indicated, in relation to my amendment. There are 2,090 companies listed on the Australian stock market. There's 8,000 companies we don't get to know about. Probably of the, well, of the sort of companies, not probably, but of the, of the nature of the companies and the entities and the organisations that I have described. Political parties. Political parties uh, could receive JobKeeper. They could have received it and still uh, maintain their income through donations and all the other methods that they use to receive money. And uh, they won't be disclosed under this particular uh, amendment of Senator Roberts. I wonder if he can explain that. It just doesn't seem to make any sense. Uh, I'd, I'd ask that Senator Roberts gives an explanation. Senator Roberts. I'll seek to. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I need to correct a, a, a mistake by Senator Patrick. I play no golf. I don't go to golf clubs. I used to play rugby union and rugby league. Uh, I think golf is a nice way to wreck a, wreck a, a walk, and that's about it. Um, secondly, I've already answered Senator Patrick's question about the context twice now, once last night and once I addressed it last night and, and again just now. What we really want to do, and I invite Senator Patrick to discuss with us after this debate, how we can get a real audit, because Senator Hanson and I want something meaningful and strong that actually gets the money back gets the money back to the people's government. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, it seems we're uh, perhaps likely to go to a vote on this shortly. I just wanted to indicate that Labor will be supporting Senator Hanson's motion. For all the reasons I explained earlier, I, I do think it is an inadequate response. Um, I think that it is unlikely to be effective I think that it does little more than is already um, required of these companies, and it leaves many, many companies um, without scrutiny whatsoever. Notwithstanding that, it would be churlish to vote against it, uh, 
and on the Labor side we generally try and make our decision based on the policy position, not on the grounds of hurt feelings. So Senator Roberts and Senator Hanson will be voting for your amendment. Senator Patrick. Yeah, just to avoid an unnecessary division, I will also be voting for the amendment, not because it does very much, but it does do some consolidation. It leaves a gaping hole in this, in this public scandal. I might just finally point out to Senator Roberts that uh, Senator McKim has a private member's bill uh, that seeks to recover this money, and I, I guess you're going to support it based on what you've said. Thank you. Thank you. I have before uh, me... Madam, Madam Chair, I, I'm just seeking Sorry, the call Senator, Senator McKim. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, I thank Senator Patrick for uh, reminding Senator Roberts of, uh, of the bill that the Australian Greens currently have before a Senate inquiry. Um, just really quickly, um, uh, before we uh, wrap up debate on this amendment, I wonder if uh, either the Minister or uh, Senator Roberts could confirm um, that this amendment will not catch um, private companies, uh, private schools and foreign-owned companies, and therefore that um, companies that are owned by foreign governments, like, for example, the CCP, will not be caught by the provisions of this amendment. I wonder if Senator Roberts would be able to, um, to respond to that, please. Senator Roberts? It won't. It, it, it will not, but it will also not capture innocent companies that are that are privately owned and small businesses and medium enterprise businesses. And Australians value fairness and integrity. We need to make sure that any system that is put forward is fair to the employers because the employers have a significant responsibility for the employees. This was designed, poorly though it is, and, poor, and despite all the senators approving it, this was designed to protect workers. And that's where the money ends up with Australian workers. We will invite you to discuss with us a proper audit for returning money that has been incorrectly paid to, to companies, and we would love to work with you, Senator McKim, on that, providing it is legitimate and proper and fair. Any further uh, speakers? If not, uh, before the chair, we have the motion, the amendment that was moved by Senator Cash on behalf of um, Senator Hanson bracket one and two sheet 1442 uh, be agreed to. All of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Are we then moving to Senator Patrick's amendment, which is... Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair. I, uh, I uh, seek leave to move Amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1411 and uh, Amendment 1 and 2 on sheet 1387 by leave. Has that been granted? Leave granted, oh, Senator sorry. Patrick. Uh, my apologies. So that, that's the, uh, the opposition amendment. So I just restrict that to, to uh, uh, Amendment 1 and 2 on sheet 1411. I apologise. Yes, that's yours. You have Chair. the call. Chair? Yes, Senator Patrick, you have And to... look, I just want to basically say that this, this amendment is designed to provide a level of transparency around uh, those companies that receive JobKeeper. We must understand that JobKeeper was, uh, was on the 8th of April uh, uh, passed by this parliament, not as uh, a scheme with any particular form, but as a head of power that allowed the Treasurer to introduce or to uh, declare rules around the program that is now known as JobKeeper. Um, the parliament had very little to do with the construction of the JobKeeper scheme, and, and that was uh, the case because it was an emergency. Everyone understood it was an emergency, and we wanted to get through the pandemic. We wanted to keep uh, uh, employers and employees connected, and uh, so it was the will of this parliament that uh, the program be implemented. But the details came down to the Treasurer, and he basically created an honesty system. Honesty system where you didn't have to show anything uh, as actuals, rather simply you were able to project and indicate to the tax office that you thought that your 
revenue would drop by either 30 or 50 percent, depending on the nature of the of the company. Um, the idea behind that was was quite was quite okay. Uh, particularly in those circumstances, there would have been a lot of cash flow issues for companies, and uh, uh, what uh, what was put in place was good. What unfortunately didn't happen was there was no clawback regime put in place to deal with uh, either dishonesty or people who uh, got through the, the, the bump uh, and actually did a lot better than perhaps they might have done in the previous uh, year. And that's where the problem lies. This is There's been a huge prudential failure in relation to uh, in relation to the JobKeeper program. It is, a, it is a massive scar that will sit with, with Treasurer Frydenberg for uh, years to come. It is, this, this is going to bring about the biggest scandal, biggest public expenditure scandal in the history of this company. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Treasurer Frydenberg. Um, what, uh, what we need to do in these circumstances is to address the situation where we find that money has been funneled from the wallets of taxpayers to the wallets of invest investors and to executives by way of executive bonuses. And uh, one of the ways to do that is simply to shine a light. Uh, light is a great disinfectant. Uh, the, this amendment mirrors the scheme that the New Zealand government um, voluntary, uh, vol voluntarily put in place uh, because they clearly believe in the benefit of transparency. Uh, everyone can go to a to the New Zealand website. They just have to Google wage, wage subsidy disclosure uh, New Zealand, and uh, they will they will be taken to a site where you can look up any company, any company at all that received a payment, a wage subsidy payment. It's public money. It's not it's not private information. You know when when you take when, you, when a business goes to a bank and gets money, um, that is private business. When a business gets money off the public, that's public business. And, uh, and New Zealand has recognised that. We've seen a situation in New Zealand where uh, they are paid out far less in wage subsidies. I think it's around the order of $13 billion and have received $600 million plus back. We've paid out $90 billion and only got two hundred million back. They've got a five percent return. We've got a zero point two five percent return. And this amendment seeks to shine the light. It doesn't won't name and shame companies, companies that needed JobKeeper. No one begrudges the fact that they got that money. What it will do, however, is allow employees to identify whether their company received uh, JobKeeper, they'll understand how well the company was doing. Uh, you know, it just simply will lay out the basis for potentially more companies sticking their hand up and saying, you know what, we get, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to return the money that we didn't actually need, the money that came from the public purse that could be used for social housing, for um, health, for aged care, for a whole range of things. That, uh, that we need and uh, where we struggle to get money. Uh, you know, it could be education, university uh, degrees, whatever it is. Uh, this is public money that uh, has come from our debt register. It is money that will be paid for, not by me uh, or anyone else in this chamber, but rather our children and our, and our grandchildren. And that is such a shame. And uh, I urge the Senate to support my amendment. Uh, just before I call Senator McAllister, I just want to clarify that this uh, amendment proposed by Senator Patrick, if that is uh, passed, then the opposition's amendment is negated by that. Uh, so as long as people are very clear with that. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, I have spoken a number of times in the committee stage, and so I don't intend to labour uh, or repeat um, some of the ideas that I've already presented. But Labor is totally committed <laughs> to making sure that we are transparent about this and many other questions in terms of the corporate largesse that is 
so casually doled out by the government—$13 billion in this instance. Now, I was clear about the deficiencies of the amendment that has just passed in this chamber. Listed companies received only 3 per cent of the entire JobKeeper program. There is no harm in what the government cooked up with One Nation, but it adds nothing to the transparency that Australian taxpayers are calling for, and it doesn't address the staggering waste that Mr Frydenberg has overseen. That amendment will deal with 120 companies in total, and they receive $2.5 billion. But meanwhile, we know there are over 150,000 firms who were beneficiaries of that $13 billion in JobKeeper. They had rising takings, and we will know nothing about them. The amendment that is before us now, in contrast, does deal with this issue. It would require much broader transparency. It's an amendment that uh, was moved, at least in, against this bill, by me in the first instance, and an identical amendment moved by Senator Patrick to accommodate the hurt feelings previously described that One Nation have about uh, various other matters unrelated to this question. Um, just like Harvey Norman's repayment of six million this week shows the importance of public scrutiny. The positive effects that ASIC has already generated by requiring some measure of transparency <coughs> shows us exactly why we need a much clearer picture of the big firms that profited from JobKeeper. And the reason that we brought this amendment forward, the reason that we, we brought a similar amendment forward, the reason we support Senator Patrick's amendment now, the reason that we voted for a similar amendment in a previous debate is that we know that the government is desperately trying to cover up $13 billion of waste. $13 billion of waste. We'd like to know where it went. So would most Australians. And the question is, why does the government persist in trying to cover it up? Thank you. Any, oh, sorry, Senator. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. I'd just like to put on the record the Greens' uh, support for Senator Patrick's amendment. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, tried through a number of ways over the last few months to bring this information uh, to light to ensure that there is accountability uh, for the use of taxpayers' money and public money. And uh, you know, we're disappointed uh, it won't pass today because uh, One Nation are not voting for it. Uh, but uh, we still think it's an important amendment for the record. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Roberts, seeking the call remotely. S Senator Roberts, have you got your unmuted? We can't hear thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to correct something that uh, Senator McKim and I both um, concurred on. We were wrong because, of course, foreign, com foreign government companies, foreign companies that are foreign owned by foreign co companies operating in Australia that are owned by foreign governments were never able to claim JobKeeper. That was something we all discussed in the Senate. Uh, so I just want to draw that to people's attention. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. If there's no further um, speakers, then I will put the amendment that has been moved by Senator Patrick, uh, one and two, sheet one four one one. Uh, is that amendment agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those who are opposed say no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Division, ring the bells for four minutes, please.
comes out. Oh, what kind of great things. Okay. Stop the bells. So the question is that uh, amendments one and two on sheet 1442 moved by Senator Cash on behalf of Senator Hanson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator uh, Urquhart as teller for the ayes. Oh, beg your pardon, it wasn't crossed out. So we <coughs> I'll repeat that. So the matter we're dealing with is amendments one and two on sheet 1411 as moved by Senator Patrick. Uh, the ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 12 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is uh, negated. Uh, 
I am in the hands of the Senate. Senator McAllister, you're seeking the call. Uh, I'm going to end the committee stage if I don't get a call. The question now is that the bill. Sir. I had understood that Senator Hanson Young was going to persist with her amendment, and I just wondered if now was the moment. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Is seeking well, the call? Uh, now can be the moment, Senator McAllister. Um, this amendment is in relation to uh, a much needed uh, avenue of support for our arts and entertainment industry, who we know have been smashed throughout this COVID-19 period and the pandemic. Lockdowns, border closures, health restrictions have meant that live events in particular, live performance and other types of live events, just don't have certainty going forward. The insurance industry have, of course, done what the insurance industry always does, puts up high premiums, which effectively squeezes anyone in the real world out of being able to access them. This amendment uh, simply requests of the government that they establish an insurance guarantee for live performance and live events going forward. Even once we get to uh, the phase of opening up, once we have uh, an appropriate number of people vaccinated in this country, including young people, I might add, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, but once we get to opening up, companies, small businesses, those in the entertainment and live performance sector simply can't plan without access to insurance. There is a market failure. And so what this amendment requires is for the government to establish a mechanism to underwrite and guarantee insurance. It's not going to cost the government any money. Companies and businesses will pay into it as they would uh, an insurance company. It's simply to fill the gap because there has been a market failure. If the role of government isn't to step in at times like this, what is the role of government? I mean, it is just simply uh, unworkable for this industry to continue limping on without proper support from the government of the day. And this uh, would go some way. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it goes some way to giving the industry a helping hand. And I hope the government considers in good faith uh, this proposal. And if they don't take this one up, do something that will help, that will deliver insurance going forward for this sector so that we can get the show back on the road. Senator Hanson, are you seeking leave to move that amendment? Uh, yes, I am. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Minister? Thank you, Chair. The government will not be supporting Senator Hanson's uh, amendment. Uh, I should remind the chamber that this bill is, in fact, about the administration and oversight of organisations with, dedu uh, with deductible gift recipient status, and it's about removing preferential tax treatment for offshore banking units. It's not about COVID support measures for any industry. Senator Hanson. Hanson Young. I just correct, Chair. You've said Senator Hanson a few times. The minister said Senator Hanson. And I just make it really clear, I am Senator Hanson Young. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, my apologies there. I think we know you are Senator Hanson Young. Senator uh, McAllister, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor does support this amendment. And it would be far preferable, of course, if the measures contained in this amendment were instead contained in a bill brought forward by the government. That would be better, wouldn't it? Because I, in fact, don't. We would not particularly. Uh, we would much rather prefer uh, that the government actually dealt with this challenge. At the moment, we have an uncosted amendment that's brought forward by a Greens Party senator. Um, we are in this position, though, because the government is dragging its feet. Now, the opposition has joined with the live entertainment industry to call for an insurance fund for live entertainment and events. We've been calling for it for months. And I think anyone who enjoys live entertainment, anyone who enjoys festivals understands why, because there has been a heartbreaking list 
of events where enormous amounts of time, money, energy, commitment from festival organisers, from artists, all to nothing, because the pandemic brings significant uncertainties. But the lack of support for the industry is crippling it. And the people I know that work in the festival sector are beside themselves. The artists are beside themselves because they can see a lifetime's investment in building their businesses, in building their audiences, in building their reputations, in building their financial resources, draining away with almost zero interest from the government. The government, I should say, has announced a very similar measure for the screen sector more than a year ago. Now that's worked very well since, and the screen industry is doing well. But the federal government says no to the live entertainment and events sector when it asks for exactly the same thing, and it's impossible to know why. Certainly no explanation provided here in the chamber on the substantive policy issue. The Minister for Arts tries to say that this should be a responsibility for the states. It's a pretty common refrain, isn't it? Passing the buck to someone else, making it someone else's responsibility. Well, I happen to think that having a thriving live entertainment sector, a thriving arts sector, a thriving live performance sector is in our national interest. It's part of our national identity. It's a core part of our economy. It's a key element of soft power. There are so many reasons why supporting this sector should be considered an absolute priority for this government, but they have washed their hands of the live entertainment sector from the very beginning of the pandemic. It is time for the government to sit up and listen, to pay this industry some respect. It's time for the government to introduce its own bill for a live entertainment and events insurance fund. So in supporting this amendment, I do have some caveats to put on the table. We do strongly support the principle behind this amendment. We've argued for it publicly. We are concerned that it's not costed. It gives us some comfort that the amendment as proposed leaves it up to the government to decide the level of appropriation. This kind of fiscal uncertainty is not Labor's preference. But we are only at this point because of this government's failures. And I ask the minister to consider asking her colleagues, asking her colleagues, why is it that they will not lift a finger for the live entertainment sector? Because they are desperate. They are crying out for help and support. And so far, it's crickets from your side of the chamber. Any further speakers? No further speakers. The uh, amendment before us was moved by Senator Hanson Young on sheet one. Uh, 402. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Sorry? The ayes have it. You're calling a division? Ring the bells for four minutes, please.
<coughs> Stop the bells. So the question is that the amendment on sheet 1402, number one, is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order, there being 12 ayes and 14 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. So the question now is that the bill stand as amended. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. <coughs> uh, the committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill of 2021 and, and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number two, Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 6, Bill 2021, resumption of the second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 6, Bill 2021. I can confirm from the outset that Labor strongly supports the passage of this bill, particularly the superannuation family law elements in Schedule 5 which I will, I will talk about in more detail shortly. Overall, this bill contains a number of relatively minor technical amendments. Schedule 1 clarifies the operation of income tax law in relation to the renewable energy target, ensuring that generators are not taxed when they later rectify a failure to meet a target in a given year. Schedule 2 allows for increased penalties to, apply, to be applied to breaches of industry codes prescribed by the Competition and Consumer Act. I will note that increasing penalties for breaches of the Franchising Code was expressly recommended by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services. Labor supports franchise being, franchisees being protected by industry codes as recommended. Schedule 3 removes some minor red tape for self-managed superannuation funds and other small super funds. Schedule 4 makes a number of technical amendments to the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 to provide regulatory certain, certainty for industry codes. These amendments primarily ensure that industry codes may confer functions and power appropriately. But I turn now to Schedule 5, which is uh, the area of most interest for me personally in this bill. This amends the Taxation Administration Act and the Family Law Act to create a new mechanism for sharing superannuation information for family law proceedings. It sounds a little dry. I understand that, but Labor has been calling for this reform to be implemented for many years. It is long overdue. Now, of course, most things associated with women's policy in this government are long overdue, starting with Tony Abbott as the Minister for Women, which was the very least you can say about that was that it was an inauspicious start. We have had eight years where Australian women's interests have been neglected, ignored, dismissed, ridiculed, mocked. 
Generally, there is very little that this government can point to where they have made any ground at all for Australian women. It's only when tens of thousands of women all around the country marched on this parliament, marched in their cities, marched in little towns like Lismore, that this government has been dragged kicking and screaming to acknowledge that more than 50 per cent of the Australian population deserves a proper response to the issues that concern them. Back to the specifics of this measure. This was first announced in 2018. Sorry, sorry, Senator McAllister. If senators want to have a conversation, can you please leave the chamber as I'm having difficulty hearing the speaker. Senator McAllister. This, is, uh, of course, was first announced back in 2018 as part of the grandly titled Women's Economic Security Package. And it promised $3.3 million for the Australian Taxation Office to develop an electronic information sharing system to ensure the family law courts have better visibility of parties' superannuation assets when making property orders. The then Attorney-General put out a release, media release, big announcement, 2018, and they said that this electronic information sharing system would commence on 1 July 2020. Well, that was not to be. And when asked about it, the Attorney General's Department told me in an estimates hearing some time ago that that's because it really just wasn't a priority. Just now, a year later, the government's finally got around to legislating this critical measure. And it really isn't good enough. It is an indication that this government cares so little about women's economic security and, as I'll go on to argue, also about their safety, because I want to talk about why this matters. Talk about the problem that this measure is trying to fix. Parties to a family law proceedings are legally required to disclose all their assets to the court, including superannuation. However, in practice, parties may forget or, let's be honest about it, deliberately withhold information about their superannuation assets. And getting full visibility of superannuation in family law matters can be complex, can be time-consuming and costly. It often requires parties to use subpoenas and other formal court processes, and there is no guarantee of success. And the non-disclosure of superannuation assets can often disproportionately disadvantage women during to a, due to a significant disparity in superannuation savings between men and women. Very well understood superannuation gap. What then happens is that that lack of financial disclosure by a former partner can result in women receiving a smaller share of property than they would otherwise be entitled to. So this scheme is designed to help all women access their share of superannuation assets, but it will especially impact disadvantaged women and those experiencing family violence. Because non-disclosure of assets in family law proceedings can also delay cases, and sometimes that is the main point of the non-disclosure. Stakeholders did terrific work laying the groundwork for this policy initiative, and their work began a very long time ago. So in 2018, the Women's Legal Service uh, in Victoria put out a study, and it was titled Small Claims, Large Battles. It looked at a whole series of cases, clients that they had assisted, and it found that two-thirds of clients that they surveyed faced delays caused by a former partner failing to make the necessary financial disclosure. Here's the kicker. In 87 per cent of those cases, the women surveyed reported that family violence was a factor in the relationship breakdown. Let's be honest about what's happening here. We have controlling, abusive partners. They are controlling and abusive in the relationship. And when a woman decides to leave, they seek to further extend and perpetuate their abuse and their control through prolonging proceedings. They withhold information deliberately. It's described as systems abuse. And it means that women are stuck for years and years trying to extricate themselves from an abusive relationship and unable to conclude the matter. It also means these tactics that women are deprived during this period of the financial resources they need to start a new life. These women are strong and resilient, and they deserve support. And instead, they've been frustrated. Now, the government recognised this problem back in 2018. 
And here we are in the middle of 2021, finally getting around to a piece of legislation to actually address it. Three years. Think about the women who might have benefited from these provisions in the three years that have elapsed since the, these issues were first acknowledged by the government. It is simply not good enough. It is disgraceful, in fact. And one can't help wondering if the rush now is only because the Women's Safety Summit is on on Monday. Superannuation is often one of the biggest assets in relationships, and non-disclosure of these assets just continues a cycle of crippling emotional and financial abuse, as well as the economic control experienced by family violence victim survivors. The failure to implement this scheme in a timely way has had serious financial impl implications for disadvantaged women, especially those suffering from violence. Instead of implementing much-needed reform, this government has prioritised other reforms. It's not like there's been a shortage of bills on superannuation come before this chamber. We spend hours and hours debating superannuation in this chamber. But this is the one bill, the one bill where there's been no time made on the government program for three years. What did this government do, though? They did ask. They did do this for women. They asked women to raid their own superannuation balances to pay for their own costs during the pandemic, the very pandemic that crushed women's workforce opportunities. These policies also created an opportunity for perpetrators to exploit and financially abuse their partners. And the government has done nothing to address the superannuation gap in retirement. Women continue to face homelessness and destitution. This is totally unacceptable. I want to conclude by really thanking, really thanking the advocates who have championed this issue. Organisations like Women in Super, organisations like the Victorian Women's Legal Service, the organisations and the individuals that contributed their stories to small claims, large battles. Their role absolutely vital in securing this incredibly important reform. For eight years, this government has ignored and neglected women's safety and their economic interests. It's not a surprise that this reform, like so many other reforms, is overdue. The government has time and time again been forced kicking and screaming into action, but on every occasion its action is too little and too late. The reforms contained in Schedule 5 of this bill are welcome. They will make a difference to the lives of women, but it will take much more than one oft-repeated promise, announced and re-announced, belatedly delivered, for this Prime Minister and his government to earn back the trust of Australian women. Senator Patrick. I think I'm supposed to talk. Oh, sorry, Senator Hanson. Sorry, Senator. I had the wrong speech in front of, uh, list in front of me. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not very happy about this bill being rushed through today. I just don't feel that we've had enough time to actually debate it or discuss it. It's been joined by Labor. Labor is quite happy to do it. But when we're discussing superannuation, and I understand that it will streamline the access to superannuation balances that the judge can access it to deal with the court case before them. And I know there is a, it was a long process and costly for, to get this account. Listening to Senator McAllister and her debate about this issue is about protecting women. Well, the last time that I actually attended a court, it was based, based on both parties both men and women. Both men and women suffer the situation of separation or a divorce. Both are subject to domestic violence. And I admit that more cases are reported from men who are the perpetrators of domestic violence, but 25 per cent are also from women. Men are also suffering at the hands of women in and cases and through divorce. What I'm upset about is that we have had a family law inquiry which we've handed down recommendations with regards to the family law courts. We have got a submission in at the moment and under that submission is about prenup agreements. Now, I would have liked to, if we look at superannuation, that is a person's, um, what they've worked for, it actually superannuation is in lieu of wages that they would have received. So what we could have 
potentially have and what we do see is happening is that you've got relationships that um, people on a second marriage, possibly, you know, first marriage, getting married at 40 or 50 or even 60 years of age, are ended up in a relationship which doesn't last. But these people have accumulated the superannuation over a long period of time. That's what they have foregone in wages, has gone into the superannuation. They get tied up in a relationship. They don't have to be married as long as they've been together for six months. Now, that relationship may break down in a couple of years' time. So why should the, the ex-partner be entitled to the superannuation of someone that they weren't with at the time? Superannuation and family law courts should be taken from the date of their relationship starting together, upon marriage or living together, after a certain period of time. It should not be taken back the last 20 or 30 years. So those people who think they're going to make some money out of it, and, and they do. And I've heard that from a lot of people. That's where we should have had an amendment to this bill, which I wanted to put up, an amendment to say that superannuation accumulated prior to their relationship should not come into consideration. That would be fair, fair on all strands. And I know there are also a lot of probably men out there who get tied up with, with women purely for the money. And we've heard that time and time again, as in, in the reverse situation that women will go after whatever they can of their uh, partner. We've got power-hungry, you know, greedy people out there use whatever they can to pull the other person down and get out of them what they can. Our parliament is about what should be fair and just for the people. This is not. You know, you've, you've, you've pushed this, this bill through, which we didn't have enough time to debate it. You've got a cut-off point that's coming now, so you rushed it through. But Labor said yes, and all, all Senator McAllister was talking about the poor women out there. Well, I wish you would be fair to everyone and look at it on a balanced point of view. And you're talking about family violence. Family violence is not you. If you text someone and you keep saying, I want to see my child, I want to see my child, I want to see my child, that's classified as domestic violence. That is totally different to someone who's been bashed. Totally different. But we don't define what is domestic violence. But you put it all in together because it sounds good. <clears throat> you talk about controlling men over the women. Well, I can tell you for a fact there are a lot of controlling women over men. But you won't admit that. Controlling women that tells their husband, sorry, you can't, you can't go and have a beer with your mates. You can't go fishing. You can't do this. And it is happening all the time, or you're spending too much money. It works from both sides. I'm sick of the debate of whether it's men or women. Look at a topic and you actually you determine what is fair and just. I'm sorry to see this going through, to be pushed through, because we need to deal with this, and it should not have been dealt with. But I, what I've heard is, oh, the minister wants this to go through in a rush because <clears throat> she's actually going to give, be given a speech. She wants something to go out there and wave the banner and say, look what I've done. And you've supported this. Labor has supported this. And you give a pat on the back to women's organisations. You're not fair. You're not looking at what is fair and just right across the board. And again, this is where One Nation stands up ahead above everyone else there because we are trying to do what is right for right across our whole society. But you won't admit that 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 there are men out there that are being mistreated ill, you know, in our court system, through the child support, through everything. You won't admit it. You're always on about the women. I'm a female. I've been through it. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not taking sides here. I'm trying to find out a balance that is fair. And that's all One Nation ever does in this parliament, is try to, you know, find out what's fair and just for all concerned. But I'm not happy with this bill being pushed through. But again, you've done your deals, you know, your deals with, with the Liberal Party to push it through without, you know, finding the right outcomes for the Australian people. Well, I won't be supporting the bill based on that because it's been rushed through and there is a lot more to it we should have actually been addressing in this bill, not just to give a minister the right to say, oh, look what I've done. And that's basically what it is. I'm not happy. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Hume. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Firstly, I'd like to thank all those senators who have contributed to this debate. Schedule 1 to the bill will amend the income tax law to ensure that no tax is payable on refunds of large-scale generation certificate shortfall charges. This measure will clarify the operation of the income tax law for energy providers and ensure that taxpayers who receive a refund of shortfall charges are not inadvertently disadvantaged. This will enable the market for these certificates to work as intended, meeting targets for clean energy while mi minimising cost impacts for consumers. Schedule 2 to the bill establishes a more effective enforcement regime to encourage greater compliance with the Franchising Code by amending the Competition and Consumer Act of 2010 to increase the maximum civil, penalty, civil pecuniary penalty available under this code to the greater of $10 million, three times the benefit obtained from the contravention of the code, or 10 per cent of annual turnover. The maximum civil penalties that can be applied to industry codes generally will also be lifted from 300 to 600 penalty units, or $133,200. Schedule 3 to the bill delivers on a government commitment to reduce costs and simplify reporting for affected superannuation funds by streamlining an administrative requirement for the calculation of exempt current pension income. And it does so by removing the redundant requirements for superannuation trustees to obtain an actuarial certificate when calculating its exempt current pension income, when all the fund members are fully in the retirement phase for the entire income year. Schedule 4 to the bill will strengthen the industry codes framework and provide legal certainty by clarifying that industry codes can confer powers and functions on third parties to the commercial relationship between industry participants. And finally, Schedule 5 to the bill goes to uh, improves the visibility of superannuation assets during family law proceedings. This schedule amends the Family Law Act of 1975 and also the Taxation Administration Act of 1953 to allow parties to family law proceedings to apply to family court registries to request information from the ATO, the Australian Tax Office, that will assist them to identify their former partner's superannuation interests. Parties will then be able to use this information provided by the ATO to seek up-to-date superannuation in information from their former partner's superannuation fund for use in these family law proceedings. These amendments will reduce time, cost and complexity for parties to seeking accurate superannuation information, supporting more separated couples to divide their property on a just and equitable basis. And I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Hume. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to taxation, industry codes and family law and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, uh, it is so ordered. Senator Patrick, are you seeking the call? Senator Patrick. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I am. Uh, I was just trying to make sure I had the right running sheet in front of me. Um, yes, I uh, seek leave of the chamber to uh, move uh, Amendment Three and Four on. Uh, sheet one four three five. Uh, you don't need leave, but they're the ones you're moving. Yep. Just uh, on yes, sir, I think three and four on one four three five. The... Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, Madam Chair, I just want the chamber to understand uh, what uh, what this amendment is about and why uh, why I think it's important from a principal perspective to uh, support it, and that is that. The first three schedules of this bill basically replicate the uh, simpler schedules within the TLAB number four bill. Now, the TLAB number four bill currently has attached to it my amendment that seeks to end a 25 year long temporary exemption for large proprietary grandfathered companies to not disclose or not submit financial reports to ASIC, creates a, a class of 
companies that are privileged, that are not treated in the same way in which uh, other, all other companies are treated. And it's something that has to be removed from our legislature. Now, uh, because that bill, yeah, because that, that amendment is attached to TLAB 4, the government has not brought it forward. They haven't brought it forward because they know that that amendment will get up. It's supported by Labor, it's supported by the Greens, it's supported by all of the prospects. And so what they've done here, everyone's just, just so everyone knows, is they've taken schedules out of that bill and attached it to this bill because the other schedules are quite important. Most people agree with it, as I do. So we shouldn't let the, uh, the government run uh, games around very serious matters. We shouldn't uh, allow them to do that. And that is the effect of the amendments that I'm proposing today to remove schedules one uh, and two and three uh, to this bill. Uh, we can, of course, uh, we can, of course, uh, have our say on those particular schedules if it were presented with the uh, the TLAB four bill. Thank you very much. Minister, uh, the government considers the measures are important and should not be omitted from the bill. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick. Yes, yeah. uh, schedules one and two stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, uh, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, thank you. Uh, is anyone seeking the call? Senator Seward. Thank you. Could I just indicate <coughs> the Greens' support for Senator Patrick's uh, motion, which means we would vote no? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. You want it recorded? Does the Labor Party want their vote recorded? We are opposed to Senator Patrick's yeah, thank amendment. Thank you. So we'll record those. Uh, it being 11.15, I report progress. Um, with the leave of the Senate, we could proceed to conclude that bill if there's no other matters. Um, do I need the... You'll need the chair back. If Senator Patrick wants to report his vote, I think okay. previous. Senator Patrick, you're seeking to record you would have wished to vote for your own motion? Uh, no, I, was, I just I was going to point out there are two other amendments oh, that I have to move. Oh, sorry, move on. My apologies, I wasn't aware of that. So we'll move on to the business. Thank you, Senator Patrick, for that heads up. I will call the clerk for petitions. Uh, Mr. President, a petition has been lodged in accordance with the note circulated to senators. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being no. We do have some, I think. Senator Rustin. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> I move the general. Okay. Oh, okay. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I present the 11th report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move the report be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that general business notice of motion number 1240 be considered during general business today. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Brockman. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the presentation of reports from the Select Committee on the Multi-Jurisdictional Management and Execution of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. I have run it. Sorry, can I just? I seek leave to make a short statement and perhaps ask for reconsideration of that position. Right. Leave I, is granted for a short statement. Is leave granted for Senator Brockman to make a brief statement? We can come back. To, yep. All right. Well, we'll I'll let you seek leave later to bring come back to it, Senator um, Brockman. I'll call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Mr. President, a postponement notification has been lodged in respect of businesses. Senate notice of motion number one for today postponed to the 18th of October 2021, and no committees have lodged extension notifications uh, today. I remind senators the question on that postponement may be put at the request of any senator. 
There being no such request, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll commence with business of the Senate matter number two, in the name of Senator Waters. Senator, Senator Seward, are you? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to move businesses. Business of the Senate matter number two in Senator Waters' name, referral to future of national energy electricity market. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I move to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government will be opposing this motion as there is nothing more. This is nothing more than an attempt to circumvent and undermine the collaborative work of the Commonwealth and all state and territory governments that have been undertaken through the Energy Security Board. The ESB's advice on the post-2025 market design is the culmination of two years' work and extensive consultation. They proposed reforms have been warmly welcomed, including by the CFMEU Mining and Energy Division and the Australian Workers' Union, as critical to securing Australia's manufacturing sector. The ESB estimates that these reforms could save consumers $1.3 billion. Running a parallel Senate inquiry into a major public consultation will, be un will undermine much-needed work to reform the NEM and demonstrate that the Greens will prioritise grandstanding on climate change over the national interest. The question is, motion, business of the Senate matter number two be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Senator Seward. Uh, could I have an indication about how Labor was intending to vote on that? Support. I'm, Support. I'm, um, uh, the ayes have it. Division required? Um, I'll call for a division even though we're in a unique situation. There aren't two voices on the basis that Senator Urquhart said that the Labor Party was supporting it. But that's, um, Senator Seward. President, I'm in the unfortunate position where we don't know where the crossbench stands, so we actually don't know um, and what like the state of the chamber to call is. Division, if Seward? we could get yeah. that indication, I may withdraw my requ okay. requirement Senator, for a division. Senator Rustin. Uh, in the interest of the chamber, um, can I put on the record that the, um, the government and One Nation both oppose this motion? Okay, so Senator, I'll come to you next, Senator Patrick. Senator Seward. Did you wish to say something, Senator Seward? In that case, I withdraw the request for a division, but I would like it noted uh, that the Greens supported, obviously, our own motion. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. I just want to confirm, is this the referral for the Select Committee? I, I'm just a donor. No, this is the reference out. to the Environment and Communications References Committee on the Future of the NEM. Business of the Senate matter number uh, okay. two. In that case, I'd like to indicate my support. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Labor's support for this motion Thank as well. You. So that the noes have it for the, for the record with those recordings. Uh, I'll now move to government business matter number one. Senator Rustin. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to consideration of disallowance motions be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rustin. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Record the Greens' opposition to this motion, please. So recorded. Um, I'll now go to the final matter, number 1241, in the name of Senator Steelejohn. Senator Seward. And on behalf of Senator Steelejohn, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1241 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. Young Australians have many reasons to be optimistic and hopeful for the future. The Australian Government's National Youth Policy Framework acknowledges the challenges faced by young people, particularly from the impacts of COVID-19, and outlines the Government's significant support and ongoing commitment to delivering practical measures to listen and to support young Australians. Senator Patrick, you were seeking the call. Senator Patrick. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I will uh, not be supporting this referral Are you on a leave similar to make a basis. Short statement, Senator Patrick. Yes, sorry. Yes, yep. leave yes, I am. For sorry, one Mr. minute. Thank you, Mr. President. I won't be supporting this referral uh, to a select committee for the same reason I haven't supported Senator Roberts or Senator Canavan. Uh, I refer again to page 485 of Odgers, where the Senate had resolved or. Uh, put a, a proposition forward that there should only be three select committees uh, at any one time. Uh, 
if this um, referral were to go to a uh, reference committee that has always stood up, that, that has already stood up, I would support it. Thank you. So the question is that motion number 1241 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division. Division required. Uh, you indicate. This is yep. oh, I'll, I'll let Senator Rustin indicate positions that she's aware of. Senator Thank you, Rustin. Mr. President. In the interest of chamber management, can I advise that the government, uh, One Nation, and Senator Patrick, who has already indicated, uh, are not supporting this motion? So, by my count, the noes have it. Um, would anyone like their position recorded, Senator Urquhart? Thank you. If you could record, record Labor's the, position the, as the op supporting. Opposition supported it. Senator Seawitt, you obviously. Obviously, we support our own motion. Thank you. Well, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I have received a letter requesting changes in the membership of committees. Senator Rustin. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Rustin. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Defence Legislation Amendment Discipline Reform Bill 2021 for concurrence. Senator Rustin. I move that this bill now proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Legislation Amendment Discipline Reform Bill 2021. Senator Rustin. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 18th of October 2021. I have received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the National Health Amendment decisions under the Continent's AIDS Payment Scheme Bill 2021 without amendment. I think we return to business and I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number two, Treasury Laws Amendment 2001 Measures Number 6 Bill 2021, resumption, uh, further consideration committee of the whole. Uh, yes, if Senator Brockman could temporarily join not being able to chair this section of business and I'll notify the Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Brockman. The committee is considering the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 measures number 6, Bill 2021. And the question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Patrick. Uh, yeah, Chair, I, I have to, um, I, I still have two amendments to move, so I would seek leave to move uh, Amendment 1 and 2 together on sheet 1435. Uh, Senator Patrick, I'm just seeking some clarification from the clerk. Could you just hold fire for a moment? Uh, Senator Patrick, I'm advised that uh, numbers one and two on sheet 1435 are consequential on three and four, which were not supported, therefore they fall away. So I'm happy, uh, yes, to, I'm happy for you to make a contribution, I, Senator Patrick, but there is not the possibility of moving those amendments. Sure, and I was, all I was going to say was um, uh, I've just uh, also read the running sheet uh, as well, and uh, so I uh, withdraw my intentions there, and I'll leave uh, the chamber to get on with this business. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Appreciate that. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Does anyone wish to record a position? I'm not seeing any hands up. We will move on. Uh, the question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. 
The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 6, Bill 2021, and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. The report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Oh, I, yes. Sorry, I, Minister. Move that the, I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Ah, Senator Patrick, you're seeking the call. Yeah, just very briefly, noting I'm, I'm paired in support of the bill, I just want to put on the record that I support it. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to taxation, industry codes and family law and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number three, paid parental leave amendment, COVID-19 work test bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Pratt, I'll give you a moment to Thank get you. into position, but you have the call once you are ready. Thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, at the outset, I'd like to move uh, Labor's second reading amendment, which notes that many of the families in need of this legislation would not need these changes Labor. if the Prime Minister had done his job on quarantine and vaccine rollout. We further note the government's delay in providing certainty about paid parental leave rules in relation to both JobKeeper and the COVID-19 disaster payment, and are calling in this second reading amendment to ensure that the government uh, ensure to families who rely on paid parental leave that they will not be left worse off. The amendments uh, in the bill before us today to the National Paid Parental Leave Scheme there are amendments to a scheme that Labor originally implemented and has always considered to be one of our core beliefs. We've always fought for the protection and strengthening of parental rights and the ability of Australians, people in Australia to be good parents. The purpose of the PPL scheme is to provide financial support to working primary carers of newborn and newly adopted children so they can take the time off work that they need to care for them while keeping connected to their workplace. There are two payments available, paid parental leave and dad and partner pay. And this, of course, encourages the health and development of birth mothers and their children and promote equ promotes equality between men and women. But we know, of course, that it's still women who account for 90 per cent of all primary carers leave. The paid parental leave scheme provides 18 weeks of payment at a rate based on the national minimum wage of $772.55 a week, which is about nearly $14,000. Parents who do not meet the paid parental leave work test may, as we know, of course, be eligible for the family tax benefit. But to be eligible for PPL, a person needs to work around one day a week, 330 hours in the 10 of the last 13 months. And they cannot have a break from work for more than 12 weeks. Last year, uh, in the context of COVID, this parliament, of course, changed the rules so periods on JobKeeper could be counted as work. And we created an exemption so that people could remain eligible if they passed an extended work test, with people needing to work 10 out of the last 20 months. The government's amendment came some seven months after the first lockdown in March 2020. And that slow response by the government, despite repeated calls by Labor and many community groups for support, created unnecessary anxiety for Australian families. It also, unfortunately, created a family tax benefit debt for those families who considered themselves to be ineligible over the seven-month period. The change to the work test ended when JobKeeper ended in March 2021. 
and it was clear to everyone uh, that the government it was clear to everyone but this government that the effects of the pandemic were going to last longer than March this year, but they still had no plan for families struggling. Melbourne's third lockdown occurred in February and the fourth started in May. Those families had no certainty about passing the government's work test. Under the proposed bill, it will make the period of time spent on the COVID disaster payment count towards PPL and the work scheme conditions. The same arrangement as we saw for JobKeeper last year. This time payments are made to individuals who live or work in a COVID-declared COVID-19 hotspot and are eligible for the COVID-19 disaster payment. We have also been advised that enabling rules will also ensure that parents relying on state government business support will thankfully also be eligible. And so today, without this amendment, which is hence the urgency of this bill, parents who cannot meet the work test because of lockdowns will lose access to paid parental leave. But again, unfortunately, as we have seen, the government has been so slow to act that the new provisions will be enacted from the 3rd of June this year because that's when the COVID-19 disaster payment was announced. And in this context, the government's confidence that they would be able to manage the COVID-19 pandemic in cutting off eligibility for PPL uh, once uh, if you were forced out of the workplace uh, after JobKeeper expired really showed they overrated their confidence to get on top of the pandemic and here we are with these necessary amendments to this bill, amendments that we argued at the time should have been remained, remained in the power of the government to have the flexibility that's now required. It is again another late response from a fumbling and out-of-touch government that hasn't been able to keep up with this pandemic. Three months for the government to again be shamed into offering support to working families in lockdowns across Australia. This slow, last-minute response has caused unnecessary havoc to Australian families and their financial planning. Is it any wonder that Australia's birth rate continues to decline? The government needs to be reaching out to all those Australian families who thought they weren't eligible for PPL because of the work test and to aid them in applying. For the many parents who claimed family tax benefit in the meantime because of their work test ineligibility, again, again, they are now likely to have incurred a Commonwealth debt. Australian families, many of them have been doing it very tough over the last 18 months. And the joy at a new child and the expecting of a new child can be deeply undermined when your household is suffering economic uncertainty. Not only have families been trying to keep working from home, they've had to raise the next generation of Australians with confusion and slow action from this Morrison government. The fundamental change to the way people have been working has caused one of the biggest shake-ups to our everyday lives in living memory. And I note these findings from the Australian Institute of Family Studies. From the very first lockdown, there was great uncertainty, anxiety and financial stress for families. The report found that because of this giant upheaval, parents have been struggling to manage. Seven in ten parents reported they were either actively or passively caring for children while they worked, and women are still five times more likely to take on the primary caring role and be caught in the juggling act between work and raising children. It is mainly women who are using the PPL scheme and thus more of a woman's issue, which makes it obvious why this government has seen it as so unimportant and ignored it for too long. The extra burden caused by the government's lack of planning and slow response to issues like the eligibility test for the PPL scheme was, Labor feels, completely unnecessary. 
and people who are not living in a Commonwealth declared hotspot but have been stood down or lost work hours because of COVID in other states are not eligible and their access for PPL may now be denied. These parents should not be missing out if the government had introduced, reintroduced the National JobKeeper program, they wouldn't be. In an effort to save face over poor handling of this pandemic, to pretend that everything's fine, the government has failed Australian families yet again. These families are still suffering and having to work under the same stresses, even if they are not in an arbitrary hotspot and they cannot be ignored by this lazy and out-of-touch government. Currently, there are work test exemptions to the work test for women working in dangerous jobs, such as jockeys and women with pregnancy-related illnesses. And there was no work test exemption for women who would otherwise meet the work test but for the impact of family violence, including for people dealing with the impact of family violence and escaping domestic violence. So yesterday in the House, Labor moved a detailed amendment urging the minister con to consider taking action to address this significant shortcoming in the scheme. It mirrored Labor's private members bill, the Fair Work Amendment 10 days paid domestic family and violence leave bill of 2020. And this is because Labor knows that keeping people safe from the impact of family violence is everyone's business and everyone must take responsibility and show leadership. Labor is still the front fighter in relation to fixing these issues. In, pressure to this, uh, in response to this pressure, I am pleased that the government has finally amended this bill to give the secretary the power to make rules to make someone exempt, something that we suggested needed to happen uh, because of the pandemic as well as uh, these kinds of uh, issues affecting women in a variety of circumstances. We are glad to see that people experiencing domestic violence will finally be able to be exempted, but it shouldn't have to come down to Labor moving an amendment for this government to have moved on this. Family and domestic violence is the lead leading cause of death, disability and illness among women aged between 15 and 44. Two out of every three women who experience domestic and family violence are, of course, in the workplace. So the workplace is a very important component of the government's family violence policy response. Fleeing family violence takes time, planning and effort and resources. It causes upheaval and it can be costly financially and mentally. And we know about the fear and anxiety of having to leave a violent relationship or abusive relationship. And I can't imagine doing that at a time when you're also pregnant and worried about how you will be able to afford uh, to have your baby and leave a relationship if you were, were to become un ineligible for the PPL that you were expecting. No one should have to choose between their livelihood and their safety. So after years for calling for this, we finally have a bill that can make a huge difference to the women escaping domestic violence um, or who are dealing with it, allowing this exemption to the work test and continued access to PPL. And I thank the government for moving on this. We're very glad to see these changes. We know we have to continue to hold this slow and effective government to account for the rights of families and women. A strong and supportive parental support in the public system is the key to a progressive and productive society. We will continue to fight for the rights of Australian families in this room and across the country. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Just checking the audio is working All good, today. Senator Waters. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I rise to speak on the Paid Parental Leave Amendment COVID-19 Work Test Bill of 2021. The Greens have always been strong for proponents of a just and equal paid parental leave scheme. A strong parental leave scheme allows for positive health, well-being and bonding between parents yeah. and children. It reduces the gender wage gap, it increases the number of women returning to the workforce and it supports long-term economic security for women. 
Uh, I foreshadow uh, that I'll be moving a second reading amendment on what's needed to ensure best practice uh, paid parental leave, uh, that being 26 weeks of paid leave with six weeks reserved for fathers and partners to encourage more equitable sharing of care. We need superannuation contributions to be paid on uh, parental leave. And we need to uh, remove income provisions that discriminate against families where the birth mother is the higher income earner, because we're not in the 1950s anymore, and that does happen these days. Uh, more equitable sharing of paid parental leave between parents helps strengthen the relationships with children, and research shows that it fosters a more equal division of caring responsibilities in the long term, which would be very welcome. Uh, yet, despite measures allowing dads and partners to take uh, parental leave, only one in 20 do so. By contrast, the experience in many Scandinavian countries demonstrates that dedicated use it or lose it provisions for both partners is the most effective way to encourage shared care, and the Greens support that approach. I note that workforce participation of mothers is considerably higher in countries that have both a strong paid parental leave scheme and available affordable childcare. We need free universal early childhood education in this country and we need it now. Uh, going to the provisions of this bill, we support the extension of the work test rules in light of the ongoing COVID pandemic um, and in light of the Morrison government's vaccine rollout failure. To be eligible for the paid parental leave scheme, a person has to demonstrate that they've worked 10 of the last 13 months prior to the birth or adoption of a child and at least 330 hours in that period. Being unable to meet that work test simply because you are unable to work because of the pandemic should not disqualify parents from accessing the paid parental leave scheme. Many families will have worked out how to make their budget stretch, especially in the current environment, uh, and to maximise their time off with their new baby. Losing the leave that they'd counted on being able to access because the pandemic has robbed them of hours or robbed them of their whole job would have a devastating impact on so many families, potentially leaving them nearly $15,000 worse off. Now, after the, the Greens raised this issue, the government moved to address it uh, during the first wave of the pandemic. Which, which we are grateful for. And this bill now extends that safeguard, given that we're still in this godforsaken pandemic because of the aforementioned failure to uh, build proper quarantine facilities or properly vaccinate uh, the population, including children and young people. Uh, back to this bill, I acknowledge uh, provision 36AA added by the government last night to recognise that other spe special circumstances should be taken into account where a parent can't meet the work test because life has intervened and unexpectedly prevented them from working. And I know that this could mean uh, and could include women needing to take time off because they're escaping family or domestic violence. Uh, it could mean someone who needs to take leave during their pregnancy to attend hospital with their spouse or child struggling with a serious illness. Or it could mean a parent who can't work because their workplace was destroyed during a bushfire. Uh, many of those special circumstances uh, could, could and have eventuated. This amendment recognises that a rigid application of the work test ignores those unexpected circumstances that can completely throw your plans through no fault of your own. So the amendment gives welcome flexibility uh, to take account of special circumstances uh, and uh, prevent families going into the birth of their child with the unexpected loss of parental leave on top of whatever other trauma has prevented them from meeting the work test. We support that amendment. Uh, I'll note that we'll also be supporting the amendments proposed by Senator Griff to fix the discriminatory impact of the parental leave income test where a birth or adoptive mother earns over the threshold amount. It's an issue that we've raised a number of times previously. And as I'm sure folk realise, that currently the paid parental leave is available where a birth mother's income is less than $150,000, irrespective of her partner's income. Uh, paid parental leave in, uh, entitlements can be transferred to a partner whose income is less than $150,000. Uh, but where a birth mother's uh, income exceeds 150000 neither she nor her partner is eligible for paid leave. So in practice, 
This means that where a mother earns, for example, 55,000 and her partner earns, say, 155,000, the family will be eligible. But where the tables are turned and if it's the mother that's earning the higher income of, say, 155 and the partner's earning 55, that family wouldn't be eligible for paid parental leave. As a family, the collective income is the same, but the options to navigate paid leave and shared care arrangements would be very different. It shouldn't be that way because, as I said, it is a modern world. Despite the fact that this government wants to keep us in the 1950s, we are not, in fact, in the 1950s anymore. Uh, the government had previously acknowledged uh, the disparity here with the income test and they had committed to finding a solution. But as is so often with this government, uh, there's been an announcement and then no follow through. So we commend Senator Griff uh, for bringing forward this amendment uh, once we get to the committee stage and flag that we will be supporting it. Um, so with that, um, uh, I note that I have foreshadowed that second reading amendment. I think there's an opposition one already before the chair, but I shall move that second reading when the time comes. Thanks, President. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr President. This bill amends the Paid Parental Leave Act 2010 to assist people who have been affected by the economic impacts of the pandemic so they can still be eligible under the Paid Parental Leave Scheme. The lockdowns and restrictions currently affecting many states have and are affecting the ability of many people to work. Some have been stood down or have seen large reductions in their work hours, which in turn can affect the ability of working parents to meet the work test requirements of the scheme. And I'm certainly happy to support a bill that seeks to address inequality and in accessing the scheme at a time of great hardship for many. However, we also know that the Australian Paid Parental Leave Scheme is far from best practice when compared to similar overseas jurisdictions, particularly Scandinavia and Canada. A great deal of inequality is embedded in the Act and this needs to be dealt with. One area of inequality is that PPL does not extend to foster parents and kinship carers. These carers may be asked to look after a new baby or a toddler at the drop of a hat, and they don't have nine months to plan financially or otherwise for this life-changing event. They, of course, know this possibility is there because they have signed up for this, but that doesn't ease the financial burden. We know from research that the first two years of life are developmentally very important for every child. They are the vital years during which a child forms secure or even insecure attachment behaviours, which go on to dictate how they approach all other relationships in their life. It is the foundation for their future emotional security. Paying foster parents and kinship carers PPL would help a primary carer to afford to take some time off um, to bond with a new child and their family, whether that placement is for a few years or even a permanent one. Now, opponents of this idea would point to the carer payment that foster parents receive. But this is a stipend that is not paid at even close to the level of PPL. And more importantly, this money is for the child's care. And keep in mind, the child is often traumatised and has high needs. This money is not designed to sustain a family if a working foster parent elects to do the right thing and take leave from home. A number of top tier firms in Australia have acknowledged this inequity by including foster carers in their paid parental leave that they offer their employees. And it's time the federal paid parental leave scheme also ends its discrimination against this group of parents. To that end, Senator Seawatt will be moving a second reading amendment on this on my behalf. Another area the government has failed to correct is inherent discrimination which penalises breadwinner mums and stay-at-home dads. The eligibility for the government's 18-week parental leave pay is tied to the mother's income except in the case of adoption. This means if the mother earns more than $150,000, the family cannot qualify for forward, um, parental leave pay, even if her partner earns under the cap or even if they earn nothing at all. This family unit gets nothing. They are financially punished. But where the mother earns less than 150000 she can access the parental leave payment regardless of how much her partner earns. He could be earning a million dollars. Now, we all have to agree this is manifestly unfair. 
This is not a debate about the cap. This is not another class war. But failure to correct the anomaly embeds discrimination and sexism in the paid parental leave system. High earning women are penalised for being high earning, as if this was something unusual. Surely the same threshold should apply to all parents, male or female. I would hope that most of us here would agree that the view of mothers as the only primary carer is outdated. And this is a rule that penalises breadwinner mums and stay-at-home dads. It is a legacy of a scheme designed 11 years ago when the notion of stay-at-home fathers was very much an afterthought. It makes absolutely no sense to stick with a policy that penalises family units that consist of stay-at-home fathers and breadwinner mums. It needs to change now and is why I've proposed an amendment that does away with this out-of-date component of the scheme. It is the same amendment I moved to the uh, Paid Parental Leave Amendment Flexible Measures Bill in June last year, which was supported by everyone in this place except for the government and One Nation, who voted against it because of some vague assurances by a government of some something of some kind coming down the line. I call on the government and One Nation today to support my amendment in here, in this place, and the other place. Senator Ruff, oops, Modern sorry. parents don't define themselves as primary or secondary carers, and neither should the legislation that supports and regulates their family life. By supporting this amendment, the Senate will bring the PPL scheme into the modern era. The amendment circulated in my name is framed as a request because it amends section 54 of the Act expanding the parameters of who can make a claim for paid parental leave. It has been fully costed by the PBO last year, and the cost is relatively minor, an estimated $27.3 million over the forward years. These costings were again provided to government, the opposition, the Greens and the crossbench, with plenty of time to consider them. And I hope that this chamber can unanimously support my amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. In summation, this bill introduces amendments aimed at supporting working parents who have had their work affected by COVID-19 lockdowns across Australia to continue to access payments under the Paid Parental Leave Scheme. The bill helps to ensure that more parents, particularly women, can be supported to take time off work after the birth of their child through the demonstrated attachment to the workforce. I thank senators for their contributions and acknowledge the intent behind many of the amendments that have been moved. Uh, the government will not be supporting the amendments, uh, and I commend this bill to the Senate. So the first question is that the second meeting, reading amendment moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Seawitt. Can I indicate the Greens' support for that amendment? Senator Pratt. We will support our own amendment, and I'll just place on the record that we support the other second reading amendments now too. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Um, Senator um, Seawitt, are you in a position to move the foreshadowed amendment? Yes. Oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. I'll call you first. Sorry, Senator Seawitt. I didn't see Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I just want to record my support for that uh, second reader and for the other second readers as well. No worries, Senator Seawitt. Thank you. I move um, Central Alliance amendments on, amendment on sheet one four two five. Yep. So the question is that the second reading amendment. Um, Moved by Senator Seward on behalf of Senator Griff and Centre Alliance on sheet 1425 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Seward. Could you record the grand support for that amendment, please? And I've already got the recorded support of Senator Patrick and Senator uh, Pratt on behalf of the Labor Party. And Senator Griff, I'll take it you would like your support for your own amendment recorded. Yes, absolutely, and I also support the other so, um, The other last too. matter, Senator Seward, could you move the foreshadowed amendment by Senator Waters? Yes. Um, I move a second reader amendment foreshadowed by Senator Waters uh, on sheet 1439. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Senator Seward, you support? Uh, we support our amendment. Yep, I've got the Labor Party's position recorded. Senator Griff? Were you seeking the uh, yes, I support. 
Yes, and I, I've got, I support the. And uh, I've got Senator Patrick's to, uh, support already recorded. So the question is now that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Paper Rental Leave Act 2010 and for related purposes. Now, the chair is about to change. Oh, oh thank you. So is it the wish of the committee that the bill will be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Griff, you are seeking the call? Uh, I Yes, Mr. Acting Deputy. Uh, would you like me to move my amendment to 1423 at this point? It's, it is a request, but yes, please go ahead, Senator Griff. Okay. Look, I move my um, request 1423 revised. I have in my speech outlined the inherent equality in the current PPL scheme, where there is a bias against family units that consist of stay-at-home fathers and breadwinner mothers. Now. This amendment will bring the PPL scheme into the modern era, as I have uh, previously spoken about, and uh, I would hope that the Senate at this particular point uh, will support it. Sorry, was, it, was that the end of your contribution, Senator Griff? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, the audio is, is not great. Uh, is anyone else seeking the call? Or I will put the request for amendment. Minister, are you seeking the call? No. I will put the request for amendment. So Chair. the question is that the. Ah, sorry, Senator Patrick. Thank you. I just wanted to indicate that uh, this is a good amendment and uh, I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Senator Patrick. We'll just check the screen one last time. I believe that is it. So the question is that a request for an amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. Senator Pratt. Our support for the amendment. Senator Seawitt. The Greens uh, support for this amendment on the record. So we're noting Labor's support, the Greens support uh, and Senator Patrick's support. Okay, I'm um, uh, obviously Senator Griff supports and no other indications. So that amendment is lost. So the question is, I'm not, not seeing any other contributions. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. The question is now that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered paid parental leave amendment COVID-19 work test bill 2021 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Is the bill now be read a third time? The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again say no. The ayes have it. Clough. A bill for an act to amend the Paid Parental Leave Act 2010 and for related purposes. Min uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. And I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation today. If there is no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Minister. I move the motion as circulated. The, uh, the question is that the motion as circulated be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Government business ordered the day number four, National Health Amendment COVID-19 Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the National Health Amendment COVID-19 Bill 2021. This bill amends the National Health Act 1953 to facilitate the purchasing of COVID-19 vaccines inclusive of, board of boosters and necessary consumables and COVID-19 treatments. Labor supports this bill as it will ensure funds are always available for the purchase of COVID-19 vaccines, including boosters, treatments and related consumables. At present, funds are only available through appropriation bills, which are not frequent or flexible enough during the pandemic. When new purchase agreements with suppliers are negotiated, 
At present, the department has to meet upfront payments within existing resources while waiting for the next appropriation bills to receive royal assent. This can take more than six months, making it difficult for the department to meet all of its existing financial commitments. The bill confers a spending power on the Minister for Health to enter into arrangements and make payments in relation to securing COVID-19 vaccines and related goods and services such as boosters, necessary consumables and COVID-19 treatments. This power will be time limited to 30 June 2022. This bill is a sensible change which will enable the Australian government to better manage the purchasing of additional vaccines and other supplies. But it does not absolve the Morrison government for the fundamental failure that has been their vaccine program. Mr Morrison had two jobs this year, a speedy, effective rollout of the vaccine and quarantine. He has failed both. The vaccine rollout has been shambolic. Mr Morrison said that Australia was at the front of the queue, but when it became clear we were at the back of the queue, Mr Morrison changed his mind and said, this isn't a race. He is wrong. It is a race, and Australians are paying the price for his failures. Mr Morrison said that Australia was at the front of the queue for the vaccine, but as 30 June 2021 approached, Australia's rollout was ranked as the worst in the OECD and 113th in the world. We have one of the slowest rollouts in the developed world. Countries like the US, Japan and the United Kingdom were making Pfizer deals back in July 2020. Australia didn't secure a Pfizer deal until the end of 2020, putting us at the back of the queue. Mr Morrison promised that four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March 2021. But by the end of March, there were only 600,000 doses administered, some 15 per cent of Mr Morrison's target. Mr Morrison then promised that all aged care residents and workers would be vaccinated by Easter 2021. Shockingly, only 45,000 aged care residents were fully vaccinated by April 10. Mr Morrison later abandoned plans to provide vaccines directly to aged care workers, and on 30 June only one third of staff in aged care homes were fully vaccinated. Mr Morrison appeared on multiple media outlets on July 9 amid reports that Mr Morrison had struck a new deal to bring additional Pfizer into Australia. But Pfizer then contradicted Mr Morrison. The total number of 40 million doses we are contracted to deliver to Australia over 2021 has not changed, is what Pfizer said. They went on to say, we continue to work closely with the government to support their rollout program. Mr Morrison never once picked up the phone to the Pfizer chairman to get more Pfizer for Australia. In contrast, Israel's Prime Minister rang the Pfizer chairman more than 30 times. Mr Morrison has missed every target that he has set, and now the Liberals and Nationals have dropped the idea of vaccine targets altogether, and instead Australia has horizons. The thing about a horizon is that you never actually meet it. That's the problem we've had under this government. Scott Morrison continues to say our children will not be counted as part of the national plan. The Prime Minister needs to stop playing word games with Australia's parents. He needs to explain why Australia is so far behind many other countries in protecting our 12 to 15 year olds. At the very least, Australia's parents deserve a separate commitment about when their 12 to 15 year old children will be fully vaccinated and what target Mr Morrison has for their vaccination rates. Lockdowns that are having a devastating impact on Australians, their families and communities, their businesses and their mental health keep going on as a result of Mr Morrison's failures. And the outbreak these lockdowns are fighting is itself a result of the Morrison government's failures in providing a safe, dedicated national quarantine system. This Prime Minister not only doesn't hold a hose, he simply doesn't do his job. I understand there are amendments being proposed by other parties. This bill, which will make the administration of vaccine contracts easier, is a welcome one, and Labor supports it for that reason without amendment. But this small action, this late in the game, cannot and will not absolve the responsibility of the Prime Minister for his vaccine and quarantine failures. It is well and truly past time for the Prime Minister to get on with it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to the debate on the National Health Amendment COVID-19 Bill 2021. 
Um, this bill makes administrative changes that enable the government to make payments for COVID vaccines, treatments and consumables out of, consolidated out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund. This will ensure the government does not need to rely on the passage of appropriation bills to pay for COVID treatments. Importantly, this bill includes a sunset clause of 30th of June 2022. In other words, it is not um, exactly a blank cheque. Um, the Greens, I will note the Greens will be supporting uh, this bill. We need, because we believe we do need to be ready to invest in new technologies, vaccines and boosters as they become available. Boosters will be an essential part of our strategy to combat COVID, uh, COVID going forward. And the UK, uh, note the UK is set to start its um, further booster program this month. I will note, of course, that um, the issues around boosters done, does bring into question the issue of global equity, as there's many um, people in lower GDP, GDP countries who have not had the vaccine yet. Some countries have hardly had any access to vaccines. Um, that needs to be addressed. Well, this bill gives the government flexibility to flexibly purchase COVID vaccines going forward. It doesn't help the serious and fundamental issues with the current rollout. I am seriously concerned about that rollout, as I've articulated in this place, particularly um, at, it, for First Nations communities who are um, supposed to be priorities, and yet they are suffering from the lowest vaccine uh, rates. We are also serious, con seriously concerned that the government continues to talk about 70 to 80 per cent targets um, out outlined in the so-called national plan. However, this does not include children above the age of 12. And we believe this is a significant failure, given that 70 per cent means just 56 per cent of um, the population is uh, covered, uh, is vaccinated, and that has potential significant cons consequences for our community. Premier Belagiklian uh, yesterday um, said that once New South Wales reached 70 per cent vaccination rates, people would be able to go out, um, get food, drinks, and to events. Please do not forget that this means only 56 per cent of the entire population is covered. This is of deep concern. We should not be starting to lift our uh, vaccination rates, uh, lifting um, restrictions, before we make sure that those at risk in our community are vaccinated and we have specific targets for them. So we need to include in our national targets vaccinations for children, above, children and young people above the age of 12 to 15 and not just use the above 16-year-old um, rate. ATAGI is now approved Pfizer for this age group, so we need to be vaccinating those people, those young people, those children and including them in the targets. I would like to note at the moment that I, I move my second reading amendment that have circulated in the chamber, which calls on the government to immediately include young children and young people above the age of 12 in the national vaccination targets and to set specific vaccination targets for at-risk communities. We cannot open up where before we ensure that those at-risk communities, First Nations peoples, older people above the age of 60, above the age of 70 and disabled people are also have targets and are met. Because we know that opening up, if we haven't included ensured that we meet certain targets for those groups on the advice of the experts in this area, that they are at serious risk, which is why they are included in the 1A and 1B category in the first place. The government has failed to ensure protection of First Nations communities um, in western New South Wales. We are obviously seeing the outbreak now, but it is essential that we get all First Nations communities uh, enabled to have a vaccine. This is so important because we know they are. We know from experience overseas that at-risk groups are at the forefront of the COVID crisis and being impacted by it. I am sick of the government saying we're going to 70 and 80 per cent and just relying on one model and not looking at the fine print, but also not looking at the other models. To just uh, finish off, the Greens will be supporting this legislation. We think it is really important that the government has the resources to be able to 
pay for additional vaccines, as I said, the consumables and the item and boosters and the things that are needed to address COVID-19. But along with that must go commitment to targets that will protect our community, will protect young people, will protect at-risk communities. That's why I'm moving a second read, our second reader amendment. Minister. Mr. President, De uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, can I thank all members in the chamber for their contribution on this debate? The bill will support our national plan to transition Australia's COVID-19 response by ensuring the government can continue to purchase COVID-19 vaccines, including boosters, COVID-19 treatments, and relatable consumables. Not only will these vaccines and treatments provide protection for Australians, reducing the risk of severe disease and hospitalisation from COVID-19, they will help steer our nation towards the next phases of transition out of this pandemic. I commend the bill to the Senate. So the question before the chair is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. I think the no's have it. So recorded. I'm not seeing anyone else indicating. The question, therefore, is that. Uh, oh no, amendments have been circulated. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes. Now, getting slightly ahead of myself, uh, an amendment has been circulated. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Is anyone seeking the call? Yes, Chair. Can you oh, hear me? Senator Patrick, you have the call. Senator Roberts. Sorry, Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move um, an amendment standing in my name, uh, sheet 1422. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Did you wish to speak to that amendment? No, I don't. It's self-explanatory. Thank you. All right. There being no further contributions, I will put that amendment. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Roberts on sheet 1422 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Noes have it. Uh, the question is that the bill stand as printed. There's that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill now be reported. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the National Health Amendment COVID-19 Bill 2021 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister? I move the bill now be read a third time. Oh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes. A number five. National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Bill 2021. Second reading debate. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. At the outset of these remarks, I will move Labor's second reading amendment on behalf of the opposition. I won't read the amendment because the issues are well outlined in the remarks I will now make. It has been a decade, almost a decade, since the Labor government under Julia Gillard announced the Royal Commission into the institutional responses to child sexual abuse. The whole point of this Royal Commission was to listen to people who had been abused and then betrayed, silenced and ignored. The scheme 
in response to the findings of the Royal Commission that was ultimately rolled out by this government did not fully realise the recommendations of the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission estimated 60,000 survivors would be eligible for redress. As of the 26th of March, the scheme has received some 10,000 applications. And the slow rate of these applications indicates that the scheme is difficult to navigate, inadequate and hard to find. And, uh, those findings have certainly been reinforced uh, on the Joint Redress Committee in speaking to survivors. They have spoken of the difficulty of preparing and making an application. For one survivor, it took some 17 months to be able to put it in. A Senate estimates hearing last year revealed that the average time for processing was between 12 and 13 months and that the scheme has been plagued by delays, a lack of resources, low quality in support and the geographic spread of those support services. I have been particularly concerned, as has the Redress Committee, about the barriers it throws up for First Nations people, people from cold backgrounds and people with a disability. Earlier this year, Labor moved a comprehensive suite of amendments to overhaul the scheme and get it back on track to end delays and ensure that survivors didn't miss out. The government then refused those amendments on the basis that the second anniversary review was yet to report. And that report has now been completed months ago. It found things largely consistent with what we moved to amend the legislation last time. Things like not enough staff or IT resources to provide for survivors, continued delays, uh, inability to deliver survivors. And so while today we don't want to stand in the way of these amendments, they fall well short of what survivors have asked and what Labor proposed. Indeed, they fall short of what the review itself highlighted that Minister Rushton said at the time that she would respond to. We have institutions still not joining the scheme and they are shielding their assets or becoming defunct. While we welcome the government's power to revoke the charity status of such institutions and its pledges to name and shame them, this measure does not go far enough. It does not deliver the kind of justice that victims deserve, survivors deserve. The government needs to be seeking financial contributions from these institutions through a levy or through the tax system. And where institutions are genuinely unable to pay or are defunct, the government needs to act as funder of last resort. We know the government's considering this, but what we need and we seek from the government is an ironclad guarantee to provide certainty for survivors. For years we've called for an early payment scheme to ensure the elderly or unwell do not miss out on redress, and we are glad the government has finally come to the table on this. And that's reflected in the bill today. But I'm saddened that it has taken too long, and in that time we've had survivors die without compensation. If the government had acted sooner, as it should have, fewer people would have died waiting for this step to justice. Survivors have also criticised the caps within the scheme, indexation of prior payments, the deduction of unrelated prior payments, including stolen generations payments, that some of our First Nations people have suffered both as stolen generations and as survivors of institutional child sex abuse. It is a shame that it has been constructed in this way when we should seek every opportunity to repair and not to discount this damage. Instead, we have stolen generations payments being deducted from survivors of redress, as if endorsing that one system is a symptom of the other. Surviving one of these experiences means 
you don't deserve justice in the other? Is that really the way this should be constructed? We hear that these barriers and delays are forcing survivors to give up or seek justice outside the scheme through more difficult, costly and lengthy civil claims. These are the things the scheme was designed to avoid. The bill will reduce the time frame over which prior payments are indexed before being deducted from a redress payment. It will do this by ceasing indexation when an application for redress is made, not at the time when the application is finalised. And I have to say, in Labor's view, this is simply not good enough. We are once again calling for the indexation of prior payments to cease completely, as well as to ensure that unrelated payments are not deducted. We're calling on the government to lift the cap on payments from 150 to 200,000. The government should provide a guarantee, a guarantee that a review of an offer of redress will not result in the offer being reduced. These are the things that survivors have been calling for, and that is what the Royal Commission recommended. And I'm also disappointed to say the bill does not address major shortcomings in the assessment matrix. The government's assessment matrix sets low and arbitrary payments for the impact of abuse based on the kind of that abuse, not on the scale of its impact on a survivor's life. Labor agrees with survivors and arguments that the term penetrative should be removed in acknowledgement that trauma is not only caused by penetrative abuse and that some victims have been unable to properly disclose the, the physical nature of their abuse in the application matrix. The bill also fails to provide the ongoing psychological support that survivors have called for again and again that the Royal Commission recommended. So, sadly, the redress scheme under this government falls short of the original recommendations of the Royal Commission, and the improvements in the legislation before us today fall short of properly getting redress back on track and of delivering real redress for survivors. Redress that is timely, redress that does not re-traumatise, and redress that does not and should not leave survivors missing out. Senator Pratt, did you move your second reading amendment? I'm just checking. You did. Good. Thank you. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Bill 2021 second reading debate and indicating that we um, will be supporting uh, this important legislation. We see this as a down payment on the government's um, the amendments that the government needs to make and the changes the government needs to make uh, to the redress bill. Changes that, I'll say again, I've said it here before, that when we were in this chamber debating the bill in the first place, we articulated and I articulated that the redress bill did not at the time uh, meet, or it didn't then and it doesn't now, doesn't fit the bill, <laughs> to, as, <laughs> to turn a phrase, that it didn't go far enough and that there were significant problems with it. And because it was a minute to midnight getting this legislation through, those changes couldn't be made. And here we are all these years later having to make these amendments. As I said, the, we see these amendments as down, down payments, uh, the, first in, the first step towards implementing the second anniversary review, the Robin Crack Review, which uh, contained many, many important amendments that uh, the community and survivors and, and care leavers have been calling for for a long time. A lot of the problems with the bill were evident even before the scheme started. I am actually pleased that, that, we are, that there are moves to make these first round of amendments so some of these important changes can be made. First off, um, the advance payments are particularly important for those uh, particularly um, ageing and ill uh, survivors. I think 
we um, support advance payments. We think they're a very good idea and, in fact, have been supporting them for a long time. The issues around indexation. This is a major bone of contention for the scheme. It has been ever since the scheme started. I remember standing in the seat over there, I think it was, uh, saying that indexation and trying to move amendments to fix indexation um, because it is simply not fair. Survivors have been complaining and raising their concerns about this. Now, while this is a small step in the right direction, it does not address the concerns of survivors. It does not go far enough, and I'm disappointed that we are still having that debate here. Extending review and acceptance periods is also a point that has been raised uh, many times, and, and in particular in the Joint uh, Committee on the Redress Scheme. Uh, as has the removal of statutory declaration requirements for applications it has been raised many times, as has the payment um, of instalments has been um, raised uh, many, many times, in fact. So we are supporting those amendments. But there are many things that still need to be addressed. And one of those, and as the minister knows, because I've raised it repeatedly, and she has acknowledged, and I'll, I will acknowledge that. Um, Minister Rustin has acknowledged that there um, and made some changes on um, funders of last resort. Now, this again was a major issue when the bill came, when the first, when the scheme started, and the, when we were debating the first bill. It was blatantly obvious that the funder of last resort provisions would not work in the bill, and as we see, uh, that has proven to be the case. We need to make sure that people who were in institutions that are defunct, that no longer function, are able to get redress payment. And it is my belief that, in fact, governments should, if the, if the um, application is, is uh, processed by the department and found to be uh, that redress is due, government should pay that and then, and then argue with the institution. They're the backstop. Government, state and federal should be the backstop in terms of funders of last resort. Um, I, I don't want to let institutions off by any stretch of the imagination. Institutions should pay their due for the damage they have caused to generations of survivors and care leavers. So that is, uh, that is an area that, that the Greens will continue to follow. I would also like to just touch very briefly on the issue of Fairbridge. Uh, we had another hearing of the, the uh, Standing Committee on the Redress Scheme uh, not that long ago where uh, we heard some uh, conflicting and concerning evidence around how the new pr the process is intended to work for uh, those people that went to Fairbridge. Uh, I think we need to continue to be pursuing this issue because I'm not convinced that this issue has been uh, resolved. There involves the Princess Trust Group and Fairbridge Restored and whether there's going to be a separate scheme or not. There is conflicting understandings of survivors uh, about uh, the Fairbridge matter, and it needs to be resolved as a matter of urgency. Uh, Fairbridge operated homes uh, in a number of places across Australia, but particularly in um, Western Australia, in the southwest of Western Australia, and I uh, deeply concerned to ensure that survivors get due, their due redress and not this not be drawn out uh, any further. The Greens will be supporting uh, this bill, but there is more work to be done. This is a down payment on addressing the issues that came up during the uh, Cruck inquiry. And I'd also like to congratulate uh, Ms Cruck for the work that she did in the second anniversary review. I, it brought out uh, a lot of the, or the issues that so many people have had with this scheme and that need to be addressed. So, Having said that, we will be supporting this bill, but we'll be keeping a very close eye on the next stage of amendments.
Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, well, can I thank senators for their contribution on this really, really important bill? Um, I suppose I am um, somewhat disappointed at the contributions uh, particularly made by the Labor Party and, to some extent, Senator Seward, because they know that this is a, uh, a, a scheme that is voluntarily contributed to uh, and also requires the agreement of states and territories for any changes to, uh, to the Act and uh, for to and, and to do otherwise would be in breach of our intergovernmental agreement with the, the states and territories. Um, this bill reflects the initial action of the government. We have managed to get agreement for five um, amendments in order to progress um, five of the recommendations of the two-year review. Um, Senator Seward, in relation to um, Funder of Last Resort, the government has already publicly stated that it supports Funder of Last Resort arrangements to cover defunct institutions where there is no government responsibility uh, and existing institutions that do not have the financial capacity to be able to join the scheme. We made that position very, very clear in our interim response to the two-year review uh, and have reported that in the media as well. Uh, we have also received funding allocations through the budget measures to make sure that we have the funding for the federal government's um, contribution, uh, and we await the states and territories to come back and confirm to us that they also agree to do this, uh, but they clearly had budget processes that they needed to be undertaken within their individual states and territories. Um, and I'd just also like to say to the chamber, um, the government um, has been very clear uh, about its overwhelming support uh, for many of the recommendations of the Crook Review, but we also are very mindful of the voluntary nature of the scheme, and we are very, very concerned to make sure that we keep everybody who has agreed to participate in this scheme um, in the scheme, because that is the best way that the government can assure that survivors who put their, their names forward and apply to the scheme for redress are able to receive the redress that absolutely every one of them deserves. We remain committed to making sure that this scheme is survivor-focused and everything that we do is in the best interest of ensuring that survivors are at the absolute forefront of everything that we do. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the second reading amendment uh, moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. The question. Our support. And uh, Senator Seward? Similarly, the Greens would like to record their support for the second reader amendment. I am not seeing any other indications, so I shall move on to the second reading. The question is that the second reading be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. There being no amendments. Oh, Clark, sorry. A bill for an act to amend the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? There being not, I'll call on the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 6, Courts and Tribunals Legislation Amendment 2021 Measures No. 1 Bill 2021. Senator Patrick, I believe you are seeking the call in the second reading debate. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased to speak today on the Courts and Tribunals Legislation Amendment 2021 Measures No. 1 Bill 2021. My particular focus is on the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Most citizens pay little attention to, a, to matters relating to the AAT until they're confronted with an administrative decision they feel is incorrect. The AAT is a place Australians go to to address the administrative wrongs in the federal government and bureaucracy. It's a process uh, which should be fair, just, economical, informal and quick. And it's a process that should not be tainted by political bias and, favor and favouritism. Ordinary Australians seeking redress for uh, alleged administrative failures don't want to turn up to find that the matter will be heard by someone 
who is only sitting on the tribunal because they were a former staffer or politician or a friend of a government minister. And yet that's precisely what we are increasingly having. In a remarkable abuse of power to make appointments to the AAT, coalition government attorney generals have appointed some 80 members and senior members to the AAT over the past seven years who have direct liberal or national party affiliations, a large number of them with no legal qualifications. The coalition government has, uh, uh, has gifted these appointments to pay between $193,000 and $496,000 per annum to former Liberal candidates, donors, staffers and former MPs. Coalition AAT appointments include James Lambie, Chief of Staff to former Attorney General George Brandis, Anne Brandon Parker, Bar Baker, sorry, um, a former Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Here's just a few more for you. Gary Humphreys, a former Liberal uh, Senator. Robert Cameron, a Victorian Liberal State Electoral Council Chairman. Paul Gawson, a former Queensland Liberal Attorney General. Michael Cook, a former advisor to Tony Abbott. Uh, Dennis Dragovic, Victorian Liberal State candidate. Anne Duffield, a former Liberal Chief of Staff to Scott Morrison. Richard Ellis, a former Chief of Staff to Western Australian Liberal Premier Colin Barnett. Matthew Groom, former Liberal Party member for Denison. James Lambie, former Chief of Staff to the Attorney General of uh, George Brandis, as I mentioned before. Uh, Donald Morris, former Senior Advisor to Senator Rebets. Um, uh, Andrew Nicolick, former Liberal MP for the seat of Bass. Justin Owen, New South Wales Liberal Party office holder. Belinda Poller, former Chief of Staff to former uh, Senator Matthias Cormann and a staffer to former Treasurer jo Joe Hockey. Senator Chris uh, uh, Puplet, former Liberal Senator for New South Wales. Theo uh, Tavarales, Liberal Party donor. Uh, Rachel we uh, Westaway, former Liberal candidate for New South Wales Upper House. Antoinette Younes, former advisor to Senator Cash. Dominic Catter, a Queensland LNP advisor. Grant Chapman, a former Liberal Party uh, MP for Kingston, Senator and President of the South Australian Liberal Party. Uh, Rodrigo Lopez, former legal advisor to former uh, Victorian Liberal Premier Ted uh, Bailu. Bill Stefanik, a former Liberal leader in the ACT Legislative Assembly. Ian Berry, former LNP member for, for Ipswich. Simon Burford, former advisor to former attorney Daryl uh, Robert Williams, a senior advisor to Prime Minister John Howard. Uh, Helena uh, Claringbold, former staffer to Prime Minister Tony Abbott. David uh, Grayshaw, former Liberal Party staffer. Brendan Darcy, former staffer to federal Liberal MP and Minister Karen Andrews. Uh, Phoebe uh, Dunn, former senior advisor to former attorney da Darrell Williams. Uh, Peter Emerton, former Liberal staffer. Shane Evans, former Liberal staffer. Joseph Fr uh, Francis, former Liberal member for, w for the WA seat of Jandicott. William Frost, former senior advisor to, to Attorney General Christian Porter. Stephen Griffith, former SA Liberal member for the seat of Goida. George H Halwood, uh, a South Australian Liberal branch president. Uh, David McCubbock, a former federal Liberal ministerial staffer. Nicholas McGowan, former Liberal candidate uh, for the seat of Jagger. Jag uh, Karen McNamara, former Liberal member for Dobell. Justin Mayer, former advisor to former Victorian uh, Liberal Premier Dennis Napthine, Liberal Party donor. Helen Mor Morland, Another former advisor to Tony Abbott. I can I can just read on and read on and read on. Okay, I've got two more pages of names here that I could read on, which are Liberal Party uh, uh, staffers and uh, um, former members of Parliament. The pattern is is very clear. None of these are, are, uh, not all of these appointments are unworthy. I might stress. However, many lack legal qualifications or indeed the significant experience of public administration. 
All too often, their only experience is politics. Some are particularly objectionable. The former Speaker of the West Australian Parliament, Michael Sutherland, has received a full-time AAT appointment for, for a five-year term. He uh, caused controversially uh, for calling, uh, sorry, he, he called for re refugee activists and environmentalists, uh, and we called them a bunch of cockroaches during an unsuccessful bid to be elected to the Senate in 2007, yet uh, he will now go on to hear or is hearing matters related to both environmental matters, matters and refugee applications. Another recent appointee uh, to the AAT with no legal qualification is former National Liberal Party federal member Jane Prentice. All in all, this long drum roll of coalition political appointees amounts to a gross, a gross abuse of power and process with serious effects. The AAT has been turned into a patronage bucket for a government that sees no problem whatsoever in handing out jobs as rewards to political mates. This wave of political appointments unquestionably undermines public trust and confidence in the AAT. Section 7 of the AAT Act provides for appointments of members that, in the opinion of the Governor-General, have special knowledge uh, or skills relevant to the duties of a senior member or member. That special knowledge shouldn't be the phone number of the Attorney General, whose advice the Governor General must follow. In a 2018 statutory review, review of the AAT conducted by former High Court Justice Ian Callanan, ACQC, Justice Callanan recomm uh, recommended men amending Section 7, stating, and I quote, there is, in my opinion, no necessity to appoint professionals other than lawyers to the AAT, except perhaps for accountants to, ta to the Taxation and Commercial Division. My own experience in the AAT, which is extensive, strongly supports that recommendation. While the AAT is not a court, legal knowledge, training and experience is essential for rigorous review of government decisions and to ensure the integrity of the process. So I'll be moving an amendment uh, to modify Section 7 of the AAT Act in accordance with Justice Callanan's recommendation. I would hope that there will be support from the Labor opposition. After all, Labor has made a big deal about these political appointments, though in August 2019 the opposition refused to support a Senate motion moved by myself calling on the government to alter Section 7. Unfortunately, I understand that the Labor shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus has, a directly, uh, has directed that Labor will oppose my proposed amendment. Labor says that legal or accounting qualifications won't stop all political appointments. Well, that's true. But most of the mates appointees of the Liberal Party are not former legal practitioners, and so the amendment that requires um, that a person to have a legal practitioner's uh, qualification for at least five years would clearly go a long way to stopping this appointment corruption. The amendment will radically narrow the field and ensure that appointments have a baseline of professional qualification and training highly relevant to the work of the AAT, which, one should emphasise, can be subject to review by higher courts. That would go a long way to restoring public confidence in the integrity, impartiality and the competence of the AAT. All too often, Labor looks to see what the Liberals are doing and saying how terrible, but when it comes to actually voting, they say, they say now's not the time, trust us, we'll fix it when we're in government. That's not a proper process, uh, or, or sorry, response to a, an abuse that we see happening right now. As much as Mr Dreyfus might be uh, taking uh, a, a positive view about the Labor Party being elected into government at the, lex, at the next election, that's not guaranteed. We saw that play out last time around. Labor, you cannot sit there and say, I'm going to fix this problem in government, because there's no guarantee that you will be there. Support my amendment, which does help fix the problem, and when you get into government, you can fix it even more. Don't just ignore a fix, particularly one recommended by a High Court Justice. Now, the Liberals have reigned uh, significantly more than Labor, 
And and so even if you were to get in next time and you, know, you don't make the sorts of changes being talked about here, we run the risk of the next time the Liberal Party are in again, they'll start the abuse again. Don't, and don't think there aren't folk on the Labor side who already uh, have an eye to Labor's appointments in the event that they win government at the next election. With victory, it seems, will come the spoils of victory. And uh, they'll want ma to maximise flexibility to find their mates some comfortable spots. This is Labor again, pretending they care, pretending they want to stop the stacking, but not actually willing to stand up and do something. In this case, the public and the parliament would be better served by sticking with the recommendations from a distinguished former High Court Justice, Ian Cullinan, rather than a man lost in the quagmire of politics. Too often, Labor talks the talk, but refuses to walk the walk. What a pity they can't bring themselves to act and help stop the rot in the Australian government. Thank you. Minister. Deputy President, in the interest of time, I will commend the bill to the Senate. I think that's fine. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to courts and tribunals and for related purposes. As amendments have been circulated, we will now enter the committee stage. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection. So ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Patrick is seeking the call. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, I might need some help with this, just I don't have a running sheet in front of me. Um, I, I uh, move. Uh, oh. uh, sheet, uh, you're seeking to move amendments one and two on sheet 1418, Senator Patrick? That's exactly what I'm trying to do, uh, Mr Acting, Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Please. Do you wish to speak to those amendments? Just very briefly. Look, I spoke to this in the second reading. Uh, this amendment... Uh, actually, I'll uh, just make sure I've got this one right. Um, we just confirm this is the one to do with uh, question of law. Struggling here with uh, technology, Chair. I don't. So. It's about appointments, according to the running sheet, if that helps. Ah, OK. So, yes, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, so this, this amendment is, is the one that I've talked to in my second reading speech. It is time to stop the rot, stop uh, appointments of people uh, who are political mates of attorney generals. And uh, uh, this, whilst this is not a complete remedy, it goes a long way. And I urge the, the uh, chamber to, su to support it. The question is... Th Senator Watt. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. This is um, 1418, isn't it? 1418. Yeah, I do have something to say on this one, if that's OK. Um, Labor does not support this amendment. Senator Patrick has argued that this amendment would ban political appointments, but that is simply not the case. It would simply limit the Liberals to appointing mates who have law degrees. Indeed, many of the Liberal mates the government has appointed to the tribunal have been lawyers. Uh, there are many examples of this, uh, including uh, William Frost, who is now paid uh, $250,000 of taxpayers' money each year. He went straight from Mr Porter's office to his plum new job on the tribunal. William Fro Frost is a lawyer. For all we know, he may be a very good lawyer, and he may even be a highly competent tribunal member. I note Senator Seselja assures us he's a very good lawyer, so now I'm wondering. Uh, but um, his appointment, along with the appointment of so many other mates of Christian Porter and other ministers of this government, gives rise to an understandable perception in the community that the tribunal is not independent of government, that, is not fair, or that it is not fair, that it is not impartial. Senator Patrick's amendment would not address that problem. Uh, it is a significant amendment, but not for the reasons Senator Patrick suggests. The AAT is not a court. It's a merits review tribunal. The role of a tribunal member is to stand in the shoes of the original decision maker, such as a minister or a senior public servant. Ministers and senior public servants are not required to be lawyers or certified accountants. So why should all tribunal members, people who are required to stand in the shoes of the original decision maker, have to be lawyers? Now there is an, a legitimate and important debate that we could have about whether the AAT should be more like a court in terms of who sits on it. Perhaps the tribunal should, as Senator Patrick suggests, be made up of only lawyers 
or perhaps the parliament should say that 90 per cent of tribunal lawyer, members must be lawyers, or that certain divisions of the AAT should only be made up of lawyers, whereas other divisions could have greater diversity. These are legitimate questions, but they are weighty ones, and just to ask these questions is to illustrate that Senator Patrick's amendment has significant implications for the tribunal, which extend well beyond the problem of political appointments. Labor has been consistent in calling out the government for its brazen stacking of the AAT and will continue to do so. Uh, over the last eight years, about 80 Liberal mates have been appointed to the tribunal, many of them lawyers. It's a shameful record and it's done great damage to the tribunal and the standing of the tribunal in the community. Any suggestion that Labor did it too is completely false. In fact, over a six-year period, only two people with Labor connections were appointed to the tribunal when Labor was last in government, and both were highly qualified and uncontroversial uh, appointments which enjoyed bipartisan support. As it happens, they were also both lawyers. One was Duncan Kerr SC, a fantastic appointment warmly welcomed by the then Shadow Attorney General George Brandis. The other is now an Associate Professor of Law, Linda Kirk, another appointment supported by the Liberals. Labor has always maintained that membership of a political party is not a disqualification for appointment to the tribunal, but under the Liberals it has become the main qualification, and the tribunal has been turned into a taxpayer-funded gravy train for Liberal mates as a result. Eighty Liberal mates in secure jobs, collectively taking home many millions of taxpayer dollars each year, it's a disgrace. There is nothing in Section 7 or anywhere else in the AAT Act that requires the Liberals to stack the tribunal and the amendment proposed by Senator Patrick would not stop them from stacking the tribunal with more of their mates. The best way to stop political appointments is not the, to the AAT is not this amendment. It is to vote the Liberals out at the next election. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you. Uh, could you please record the Greens' support for this amendment? So recorded, and Senator Patrick obviously is supporting his own amendment. Is someone seeking the call to move an, another amendment? Uh, Senator Patrick, sorry. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting President. I do thank the clerks for very quickly emailing me the running sheet. That, uh, that's greatly appreciated. Um, so I uh, would seek to move um, uh, my amendment on sheet one. Oh, sorry, m m amendment one on sheet fourteen nineteen. Do you wish to speak to that amendment, Senator and, Patrick? Yeah, just very very briefly. This is a very technical amendment, but again, it's a, a recommendation that flows from Justice Callanan, uh, esteemed High Court Justice, who suggested. And there has been a lot of uh, a, a judicial debate over this question, and that is whether or not uh, the tribunal uh, can be appealed on a question of law or, preferably, as my amendment seeks to do, on an, uh, on an error of law. And uh, that doesn't, might not seem very uh, different for people who are not lawyers, but as someone who has uh, had to deal with these sorts of things, uh, it, it does make a, a fairly big difference. Uh, I will make, at this point in time, comment that uh, in relation to my AAT matter, the, the National Cabinet appears as though, I, I, I'll know later tonight, that the government is not appealing that. They're seeking to trample over Justice White's ruling by way of legislation. But uh, I'll leave that as a comment. I uh, commend uh, my amendment to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Watt. Thanks, Mr. De uh, Acting Deputy President. Labor does not support these amendments. Senator Patrick's amendments would implement Measure 23 of former High Court Justice Ian Callanan's review of the AAT, which says amend Section 44 of the AAT Act to provide for appeals from decisions of the AAT for error of law in lieu of a question of law. Mr. Callanan offers only a very brief explanation for this recommendation. He writes, and I quote, the identification of a discrete question of law can be problematic. Fact and law are sometimes inextricably linked. For clarity, appeals should be for errors of law rather than on a question of law. With all due respect to Mr Callanan, his report does not identify an actual problem with the existing language in section 44 of the AAT Act. He merely asserts that it is unclear. 
While we are open to considering this amendment in the future following a proper consultation process, we do not think it has been sufficiently explained or justified by Mr Cullinan, nor was this recommendation considered by the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee in relation to this bill. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. Senator Seawitt. Do you record the grain support for this amendment? Yes, and of Thank course, you. Senator Patrick uh, moved the amendment. Uh, Minister. A table and an addendum to the explanatory memorandum relating to this bill and the addendum responds to concerns raised by the scrutiny of bills committee. Thank you, Minister. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'd just like to deal with amendment number four, 1403, please, which I know is slightly different to the order. Please go ahead. Uh, in its current form, the bill would confer the same protections and immunities on immigration assessment authority reviewers as are currently conferred on High Court judges and members of the AAT. In Labor's view, this proposal is misconceived. It is wrong, and this amendment would remove that aspect of the bill. Reviewers of the Immigration Assessment Authority should not be treated the same way as judges or AAT members for the simple reason that they are not required to act like judges or AAT members. For example, unlike AAT members, reviewers of the Immigration Assessment Authority do not have to take an oath of office, do not have to have special skills or knowledge, do not have terms fixed in advance, and are not statutorily required to disclose conflicts of interest. Unlike AAT members, Immigration Assessment Authority reviewers are also not required to afford procedural fairness to applicants. I understand the government will be supporting this amendment. On behalf of the Shadow Attorney General, I'd like to thank the Attorney General and her office for her constructive engagement and for agreeing to remove this aspect of the bill. I commend this amendment to the Senate. The question is that item 64 on schedule. Sorry, this is 1403, Senator Watt. Just 1403, yes. The question is that item 64 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, it being, is it one o'clock? Not quite. We've still got a minute. Senator Watt. I'll squeeze out every last second. Uh, as I noted in my second reading speech, Labor opposes the proposal to change the Federal Court Act. Federal Court of Australia Act 1976 to allow the Federal Court in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction to provide short-form reasons rather than detailed judgments where a decision dismissing an appeal does not raise any questions of general principle. As Labor senators of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee noted in their report, that aspect of the bill has been criticised by the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre, the Joseph I. Justice Office and the Law Institute of Victoria on the basis that it will disadvantage unrepresented applicants, including those seeking review of refugee decisions. We share those concerns and I'm moving this amendment to remove that aspect of the bill. I understand the government will be supporting this amendment and again I thank the Attorney General for listening to our concerns. I commend this amendment to the Senate. So the question before the chair, in fact, it being one o'clock, the time for the debate has expired. So the question now is that we. Um, the question is that items. No, we've done item 64. Items 101 and 102 of the schedule one stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. The question now is, um, oh, Senator, no, the question, uh, so I move. Uh, the question now is that the remaining amendments on sheet 1403 and 1404 revised, circulated by the opposition, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that item 45 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. I believe that is everything. So the question is that the bill as amended. The question is that the committee reports progress pursuant to order. Those of that opinion say aye. 
against say no. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to courts and tribunals and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Charter of the United Nations Amendment Bill 2021. The question is that the second reading amendment circulated by the opposition be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Senator Seawitt. Do you um, record the support from the Greens of, for the ALP second reader amendment? Thank you. Senator Watt, the Labor, o o opposition mm -hmm. Labor support for that second reading amendment as well. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Charter of the United Nations Act 1945 and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Charter of the United Nations Act 1945 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 7, Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. <laughs> Labor supports this bill and will also be supporting the amendments circulated by the government. The Independent National Security Monitor was established by the Rudd government in early 2010 under the Independent National Security Monitor Act 2010. Labor created the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor to review and report on the operation and effectiveness of Australia's national security and counter-terrorism laws. Since then, excuse me, the Monitor has produced a number of significant reports recommending improvements to a range of counter-terrorism and national security laws. The Monitor helps to maintain the confidence of the Australian people in our security and intelligence agencies by ensuring that our laws are effective, fit for purpose and contain appropriate safeguards for protecting the rights of individuals. The position is modelled on a similar institution in the United Kingdom, which has operated successfully for two decades. Shamefully and foolishly, the current Liberal National Government sought to abolish the Monitor completely in 2014. And then, when Labor's opposition and a public backlash forced the government to abandon that plan, the government sought to achieve the same objective by leaving the position vacant for over eight months. Indeed, prior to the introduction of this bill, the only bill this government has ever introduced with the words Independent National Security Legislation Monitor in the title was the bill to abolish the position. Labor welcomes the fact that the government appears to have developed at least some appreciation for the important role that the monitor plays. The current Liberal, Liberal National Government's uh, initial strident opposition to, and then eventual embrace of, the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor followed a familiar pattern. When the Hawke Government introduced legislation in 1986 to establish the first parliamentary committee to oversee Australia's intelligence services, the then deputy leader of the Liberal Party expressed outrage. He declared that the then Labor government's modest proposal for parliamentary oversight gave one, quote, very grave doubt about whether they are loyal to this country. I'm not making that up. The Liberal Party essentially accused of the Hawke government the, the Liberal Party essentially accused the Hawke government of treason for establishing modest parliamentary oversight of Australia's security agencies. How times change. The Parliamentary Committee, established by the Hawke government in 1986, is now called the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and those opposite now claim to support the work of that committee, rarely missing an opportunity to laud its important work, even as, in more recent times, the Morrison government ignores many of its recommendations. When the Hawke government introduced legislation, also in 1986, to establish the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, the Liberals expressed what the then Shadow Attorney-General John Spender described as real reservations. 
while the then Liberal opposition did not oppose the establishment of the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security outright, they did move amendments to significantly water down the role of the Inspector General. For example, the Liberals expressed horror at the thought of the Inspector General having the power to investigate acts or practices of an intelligence agency that are or may be inconsistent with human rights. Indeed, the then Shadow Attorney General described such a power as rationally inexplicable and moved amendments to remove it from the Inspector General. Thankfully, those amendments failed. Now, here we are, three and a half decades later, and those opposite now claim to support the work of the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security. And it is now very common to hear Liberal members of parliament, including ministers, cite the broad nature of the Inspector General's powers approvingly arguing that because of the breadth and nature of those powers, Australians can have confidence that our intelligence agencies are acting appropriately and consistently with human rights. How times change. Like the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor is now an important and valued component of Australia's national security architecture, and Australia is better for it. Against that background, let me turn to the bill itself. The bill would amend the International National Security Monitor Act to expressly empower the monitor to report on own motion inquiries and statutory reviews at any time and in, in standalone reports. Currently, there is no express provision allowing the monitor to prepare and give to the Attorney General a report on own motion inquiries or statutory reviews sooner than or separately to the annual report. The bill would also, would also expressly empower the monitor to report on a referral from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security at any time, either in the monitor's annual report or in a standalone report. While the Act currently allows the committee to refer an inquiry to the monitor, it is silent on reporting on a referral from the Intelligence and Security Committee. And finally, the bill would provide a framework for the engagement of staff, including contractors, to assist the monitor in the performance of his or her functions or the exercise of his or her powers. Under the Independent National Security Monitor Act, the monitor is protected from any legal action in relation to acts or omissions done in good faith and in the performance of his or her functions. As part of the proposed framework for the engagement of staff, the bill would extend these protections to staff of the monitor. The Monitor has sought these amendments for some time, particularly the amendments to clarify how and when reports may be provided to the Attorney-General. In his report of the comprehensive review of the legal framework of the national intelligence community, former ASIO Director-General Dennis Richardson also recommended the Inter Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act be amended to provide that the Monitor may prepare and give to the Attorney-General a report on any matter relating to the performance of the monitor's functions at any time. While Labor largely supports the bill in its original form, the Shadow Attorney-General contacted the Attorney-General several weeks ago, suggesting further amendments to the Independent National Security Monitor Act. To her credit, the Attorney-General engaged constructively with Labor on those suggestions and ultimately agreed to many of the amendments sought by the Shadow Attorney-General, either in whole or in part. Moreover, while two of Labor's suggestions were rejected by the government, in both cases the Attorney-General agreed to workable compromises. I'd like to thank the Attorney-General for working with the opposition to improve the bill in the national interest. In addition to making some minor technical changes to the Independent National Security Monitor Act, the amendments agreed between the government and Labor would do the following. First, the tabling requirements for reports by the Independent Monitor will be amended so that reports must be tabled within the earlier of 30 calendar days or 15 sitting days of receipt by the Attorney-General. This will ensure that reports by the Monitor will be made public much sooner than is currently the case. Second, Australian public servants and potential employees can only be made available to the Independent Monitor with the Monitor's agreement, and that agreement can be revoked at any time. It is important that the monitor is independent and is seen to be independent of the government. That is the principle that this amendment is designed to uphold. Thirdly, the Independent National Security Monitor Act will be amended 
to enable the monitor to be appointed on a full-time basis. Labor will be supporting this bill and the amendments circulated by the government. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Patrick, remotely. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll just speak very no, briefly on this. I do uh, support this bill. The role of the Senator independent Patrick. monitor is extremely Senator Patrick, uh, important. Senator Patrick, can't hear you. You might have to log ah, out. Okay. Can't hear you. Okay. Um, we might go to Senator Van then. Thank you, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy President. The Morrison government's commitment to ensuring the safety and security of all Australians has been clearly demonstrated in the past fortnight with the range of legislative measures that have been placed before us and has been through this place. In the years since 2001, Australia's national security framework has had to undertake a number of robust transformations to evolve with the rapidly changing and complex security environment. As events over the, the past couple of weeks in Afghanistan have, have shown us, and with the, uh, the, the initiation of that action within Afghanistan, uh, with the starting point being the terrorist attacks in, in 2001, of which the, um, the uh, the anniversary um, of which is coming up next week, uh, which is a, you know, takes me back to, the, to that time when I was actually living in America, in the United States, during the September 11 attacks. And it was a, a horrific time for both that nation and, and uh, nations that share um, friendships with the US, which has, uh, yesterday or day before, was the 70th anniversary of the um, the, the ANZUS Treaty between uh, the US and Australia. I think it's timely that we you know, stop and reflect on the changing times of security, security of our nation and that of all nations uh, at this time. But in the years since 2001, Australia's national security framework has had to undertake a number of robust transformations to evolve with the rapidly changing and complex security environment. There have been significant advances made since 2001 to create greater interoperability uh, between our various agencies and to ensure that we approach our national security framework with a holistic and all-encompassing approach. There is no doubt that the security of our nation is this government and this parliament's highest priority. Our robust national security and counterterrorism framework needs to ensure that our agencies have the powers they need to prevent terrorist attacks and combat those who seek to do us harm. And as we know from various events and through grey zone tactics over recent years, those attacks aren't stopping. They uh, may not have been re of recent times of, uh, of religious extremism, you know, bombing parts of Australia or other horrific acts of, of terrorism, but there has been an enormous amount of cyber activity that's targeted Australia and Australians. And so our agencies need to be able to protect ourselves against all those that seek to do us harm. The independent national security legislation monitor plays a vital role in Australia's overarching national security framework. The independent national security, uh, national security legislation monitor is responsible for regularly assessing Australia's national security and counter-terrorism laws to ensure that they remain appropriate to the current threat environment, no matter how evolving that threat environment can be and also responsible for that the objective of protecting national security is balanced against upholding the rights and freedoms of individuals. This bill amends the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act of 2010 to allow the monitor to report on, uh, on its own inquiries in standalone reports uh, to clarify the reporting arrangements for the monitor following the statutory reviews 
or referrals from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and to provide a framework for the engagement of staff to assist the monitor. The bill implements recommendations made by the former monitor and by the 2019 comprehensive review of the legal framework of the national intelligence community, which I am pleased to say the government has accepted. The amendments will assist the monitor in the performance of their role and, as a result, will help ensure Australia's counterterrorism and national security legislation remains proportionate and consistent with Australia's national obligations. A key function of the uh, monitor is to review the Commonwealth counterterrorism and national security laws, uh, sorry, national security legislation, and to report on the outcomes of those reviews. The monitor can conduct its own motion reviews on specific matters and must conduct specific statutory reviews and reviews on matters referred by the Attorney General or the Prime Minister. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, the PJSIS, may also refer matters to the monitor, and the monitor may decide to take up the referral as its own motion review. This bill would amend the um, monitor the, um, uh, the in, uh, Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act to enable the monitor to report on its own inquiries and standalone reports separate to the monitor's annual reports. And this will help clarify the review and reporting arrangements for statutory reviews and own motion reviews and reviews conducted after a PJCIS referral. This responds to recommendations made by the former monitor, Dr James Renwick, uh, CSCSC, and by the 2019 Comprehensive Review of the Legal Framework of the National Intelligence Community. Uh, as I said before, these amendments um, also help to address um, the engagement of staff to assist the monitor. The monitor is a part-time statutory appointment when the position was established in 2010, it was envisaged that the monitor would only undertake one review a year. Since then, the role has evolved, including through an increased number of statutory reviews of various legislation. The monitor is now supported by three permanent employees of the Attorney General's Department, whose services have been made available to assist the monitor, as well as legal uh, representatives who are engaged in the relation of to specific reviews. This bill would formalise arrangements by amending the um, Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act to include provisions for the engagement of staff, including contractors, to assist the monitor with the performance of functions and exercise of powers. The bill provides current and former staff of the monitor with appropriate protections for any acts or omissions done by that person in good faith during the course of assisting the monitor in the performance of its functions or exercise of its powers. These protections are similar to arrangements for the staff of other statutory oversight office holders, such as the Com Commonwealth Ombudsman, uh, the Integrity Commissioner and the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security. Now, these are, this is a, a, an act, and I commend it to the Senate, but we need to look at why our agencies um, need this. Um, since September 2014, our Australia's law enforcement agencies have disrupted 18 major terrorist attack plots. 128 people have been charged as a result of 59 counterterrorism-related operations around Australia. 52 terrorist offenders are currently behind bars for committing Commonwealth, a, a Commonwealth terrorism offence. That's an enormous number, and that's an enormous number of Australians that could have been put in harm's way without the great work of our law enforcement agencies. So to help boost those security agencies, we've passed 23 tranches of national security legislation. These are helping our intelligence and law enforcement agencies to investigate, monitor, arrest and prosecute extremists. The government has boosted funding for our law enforcement, intelligence and security agencies by over $2 billion since 2014. Recent legislation passed by the parliament means that a person who is a dual national 
can cease to be an Australian citizen if they act in a way that is inconsistent with their allegiance to Australia. This in includes engaging in terrorism-related conduct, fighting for a declared terrorist organisation outside of Australia, or being sentenced to at least three years for specified terrorism offences. Twenty people, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, twenty people have lost their Australian citizenship through terrorism-related actions. So, when we're passing these laws, such as the one that's before us right now, you know, we are countering not only uh, terrorism but the radicalisation that can drive this. And since 2013-14. The Morrison government has allocated more than $61 million to countering violent extremism programs, including more than $13 million for intervention programs. Now, this takes in all forms of violent extremism, not just religious violent extremism. There is no place in Australia for people who decide to come here and do harm to Australians. And we have increased the minister's power to cancel visas for non-citizens convicted of a serious crime. And this has resulted in a 12-fold increase uh, in visa cancellations. Between December 14 and November 2020, the govern government cancelled or refused visas of over 8,500 dangerous criminals. That's, again, that's 8,500 dangerous criminals. This includes 209 for murder, 404 for rape or sexual assault, 684 for, for the most heinous of crimes, child sex uh, crimes, 468 for armed robbery and 1,461 for drug offences. Um, so, as we talked before and as I'm on the Senate Select Committee, as well as um, tackling our national security, we also have to look at how we tackle foreign interference. And we have strengthened Australia's capacity to defend against foreign interference. Legislation, which passed in 2018, criminalises covert and deceptive activities of foreign actors, requires people to register if they engage in lobbying on behalf of a foreign principal, and creates a register of critical infrastructure assets. The recently passed Australian Foreign Relations Bill gives the Australian government the power to veto agreements with foreign countries struck by state and local governments, as well as universities. And I was very pleased to, to see that the Victorian, my home state, Victorian uh, Belt and Road Initiative um, agreement between the, the uh, People's um, Republic of China and the, the Victorian Andrew State Government was struck down. Um, with that, I commend this bill to the Senate. Van. I understand Senator Patrick's technical issues have been fixed. We'll go to Senator Patrick now. Yes, thank you very much. I have done a reboot, so hopefully you can hear me now. We can. Um, the, uh, and I, I thank you for in, your uh, indulgence, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, I, I'm not going to say very much on, on this other than that uh, I absolutely support the role of uh, the independent monitor. It's a really crucial role. It's a role that's been filled by a number of eminent uh, uh, QCs, SCs. So we've had Brett, uh, Brett Walker, uh, the Honourable uh, Roger Giles, James Renwick, who has uh, recently uh, moved on from the position, and of course uh, Mr Grant Donaldson, uh, SC, who is, who is the incumbent at the present moment. Um, uh, th these amendments uh, or, or this bill follows recommendations from uh, Mr Renwick in relation to uh, reporting, some constraints around reporting. What surprises me, however, is that the government appears uh, uh, as though it's not going to support my, um, uh, my amendments. I hope that's not the case, but um, uh, the amendments that I will seek to move uh, during the committee stage, uh, and I won't, I won't talk then, I'll, I'll talk now, um, uh, basically, place a requirement on the government to respond to any report that's got a recommendation. If it's an annual report with a recommendation or a special report or a statutory report that has a recommendation, then it requires the Attorney General to respond to that uh, within 12 months and to lay on the table uh, a, that response 
and uh, provides provision for having an unclassified version if that were to be considered necessary. So it seems a pretty, um, uh, a pretty uh, obvious thing that ought to happen. A, re a report is written, recommendations are made, then they're considered and not left uh, open for a number of years. And, and what this uh, flows from is, re is exactly that problem that many of uh, the reports that have, and recommendations that have been made by the independent monitor have largely been ignored or not addressed by uh, by governments. Now, you know, if a the independent monitor makes a recommendation, the government doesn't like it, that's fine. Uh, they can respond accordingly, saying what's wrong with it, uh, and uh, everyone can have a look at that and criticise it or congratulate the government for coming to whatever conclusion it might have. But uh, uh, simply not responding to it is is not sufficient. I mean. Uh, it, it's just a basic uh, principle, and I hope that when we get to uh, the Committee of the Whole uh, that I will see people supporting that particular amendment. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Abetz, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this bill is an important piece of legislation that the Parliament is quite right to consider uh, at this time on the 70th anniversary of our alliance with the United States, a few days away from the 20th commemoration of 9-11, it is appropriate for us to reconsider the independent national security legislation monitor uh, legislation, which was passed some 11 years ago. The role of the monitor is to see whether our legislative framework remains appropriate for the current threat environment and whether we are achieving the objective of national security, protecting our national security, whilst also, and this is very important for myself, upholding the rights and freedoms of individuals. And that is the balancing act that is uh, so important. When this legislation first started some 11 years ago, uh, the monitor was a part-time position uh, there was no real staff, staffing support, and there was uh, only a requirement for an annual report to the Parliament. This legislation suggests that the monitor should be able, of their own volition, to hold inquiries, also take referrals from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, on which I have the privilege of serving, as well as from the Attorney-General very important developments as we continue to evolve and adapt ourselves to the ever-changing security environment. The first task of government at all times is to ensure the security of our nation, of our borders and the internal protection uh, within the borders of our peoples. And this is just part of the overall framework which is just so vitally important. I note the time, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, and uh, I understand I will uh, soon be required to conclude. That's right, and uh, you are undoubtedly it's telling me that now, PM. and I seek leave to continue my remarks. You will be in continuation. So at one, it's now 1.30, so I'll now proceed to two-minute statements, and Senator Shikani's on the line remotely. Thank you very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. As another week comes and goes, so continues the symbolic rollout of the government's re-announced agriculture visa. There have been more backflips by this government on an ag visa than we saw at the recent Olympics. First promised in 2018, only the prospect of an impeding election was enough to stir the sleepy nationals from their slumber and threaten to blow up the coalition unless the Prime Minister finally made good on his promise to Australian farmers some years ago. But like most things with this government, they are big on announcements, but short on details. With little fanfare and no consultation, there are concerns that the ag visa could undermine Pacific Island worker schemes as the Commonwealth tries to handball their failures on quarantine to the states. Even the government's own National Agricultural Labor Advisory Committee rejects calls for a dedicated ag visa, acknowledging the industry's over-reliance on cheap migrant labor is bad for productivity and unsustainable. What we've got is a media, re a media release from the Nationals, 
boastfully proclaiming that the visa will be in place no later than 30 September this year, with the full implementation of this visa complete within three years. One is left to wonder what is the difference between the terms in place and full implementation. In another media release with the Nationals, the Foreign Affairs Minister stated, full conditions will be developed and implemented over the next three years as the visa is operationalised. I just don't seem to understand what this term is used for and whether it is a term that is commonly used in pubs right around Australia where farmers are still struggling with labour shortages that they meet. The impression I do get is that the coalition have very little idea how this ag visa is going to work and that they're going to spend the next three years making it up on the run while Australians pay the price for their mistakes. Thank you. Senator Canavan. The Queensland Labor Party is disgracefully using Queensland children as blackmail to justify their heartless restrictions imposed on Queenslanders. Yesterday in the Queensland Parliament, Anastasia Palaszczuk, when asked about the ongoing Queensland border closure, said that until I get every, every child vaccinated, we will stand firm and we will stand strong. I and millions of other Queensland parents have news for the Queensland Labor Party. It is not your job to get our kids vaccinated. That is a parent's decision and it will remain a parent's decision. It is contemptible for the Labor Party to try and use children to justify their hypocritical approach to border restrictions. As the Queensland Government's Chief Health Officer Jeanette Young just said a few months ago, I don't want an 18-year-old in Queensland dying from a clotting illness who, if they get COVID, probably wouldn't die. Dr Young is just relying on the advice from the Queensland Health website, which says the good news is that the vast majority of children with a Delta variant continue to experience mild infection. Severe infection in children requiring intensive care unit admission is surprisingly uncommon. Today, the Premier has unbelievably called for more modelling on the impact of COVID on children. What has she been doing for 18 months? If this was so important, why hasn't that been done? In truth, the Doherty modelling had looked at, has looked at the rollout for children, and it says, based on these minimal impacts, it is anticipated that the inclusion of 12 to 15-year-olds in the vaccine rollout as an early priority group would not materially change the expected overall health outcomes. One wonders whether the Premier has read the Doherty plan. Today, we learn in the Curia Mail that a young three-year-old child of Memphis has spent eight weeks separated from his mum because of the Premier's heartless approach. Memphis has been crying on the phone to his mum, wanting to return home. Memphis has been denied entry despite 100 NRL families and officials being allowed in. Enough is enough. Anastasia Palaszczuk is fast becoming the Karen of the coronavirus pandemic for her heartless approach. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Waters, remotely. Thank you. Next week marks 1,000 days since the Morrison government promised to deliver a National Integrity Commission and two years since my bill to actually establish one passed this Senate. While my bill sits gathering dust in the House, Australians are still waiting for the government to live up to its promise. And meanwhile, every poll shows that public confidence in government and democracy just keeps declining. The PM points to existing bodies like the ANAO to say that we've already got a strong integrity framework, but that ignores that in the past 1,000 days, the ANAO has released nine detailed reports highlighting rotting, scandals, conflicts of interest, mismanagement and potential illegality. But the government just rolls on like nothing has happened. The PM says that his statement of ministerial standards demands the highest level of integrity amongst his ministers. But of the 23 current members of the Morrison-Joyce cabinet, 12 ministers, more than half the cabinet, have been implicated in integrity scandals. Between them, they've clocked up at least 20 scandals. Sports rots one and two, commuter car parks, community safety grants, Leffington Triangle, water buybacks, Grassland Gate, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation grant, apartment purchases on work trips, visas for au pairs, Paladin, Adani water approvals after donations, media tip-offs about AFP raids, wetland boundary changes lobbying for a donor, doctoring Sydney Council documents, 21 million to donors to frack the Bidaloo Basin, Shine Energies grant, tenders to an IT company owned by a minister's dad, exorbitant internet bills and trade deals with the Chinese government and a liberal donor company which the minister had shares in. These are just the ones we know about and they don't even include the workplace harassment scandals. If this is the highest level of integrity Australians can expect from cabinet ministers, the case for an ICAC could not be clearer. It's no wonder the Prime Minister doesn't want one. A strong independent integrity commission would leave half the cabinet table empty. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Brown. 
Fourth, I placed on notice questions to Minister Reynolds concerning, Australia's, uh, concerning the government's claim that they would be employing an additional 200 Centrelink staff in Tasmania. This morning I received a partial response. As it turns out, and sadly unsurprisingly, the Morrison Liberal government will not be recru recru recruiting a further 200 Australian public service staff to work for Centrelink in Tasmania. Instead, the minister has confirmed in writing, and I quote, in this instance, staff were engaged through Hayes Recruitment, a labour hire company. No explanation as to why. The minister simply said, and I quote, the agency enters into contracts with labour hire providers through competitive procurement um, processes and in accordance with the Commonwealth procurement rules. End quote. Asked what the paying conditions will be for these labour hire employees and how that compares to the paying conditions of Services Australia employees, the minister said, and I quote, the engagement terms of individual staff is a matter for the labour hire providers and their staff in accordance with relevant Australian laws. End quote. So we all know what that is what is going on here. This is part of the further hollowing out and outsourcing of the Australian public service. Only this year the government had signalled its intention to reverse course when it came to outsourcing in the public sector by lifting the APS cap. Yet here we are, only a few months from that budget announcement, and we find out that desperately needed additional Centrelink employees will be put on insecure labour hire contracts with wages and conditions that we know will not be um, comparable with the APS staff that they will be sharing desks with. Now, the government claims that labour hire is used primarily for short-term work or specialised roles, but we know this simply isn't true. If they were serious about supporting Australian regions with properly resourced public service, they would reverse course and ensure you, these Senator 200 Graham, positions were recruited. Senator Roberts remotely. Thank you. I recently spoke on mining exports, keeping the Australian economy out of a depression. Today I'm addressing the other good news story, agriculture. In the last 12 months, wheat prices are up 33 per cent, corn up 57 per cent, canola 72 per cent, sugar 65 per cent, and the one the Greens hate the most, cotton, 45 per cent. It's not politicians keeping Australia out of a depression, it's farmers' hard work and resilience. Drought and cold from the current solar minimum are reducing crop yields worldwide. And at the same time, our drought in many places has ended. Prime Minister Morrison and Treasurer Frydenberg are taking credit for a strong economy that's none of their doing. For years, this parliament has been making life as hard as possible for farmers and irrigators. In 2019, One Nation asked this parliament to provide a measly 200 gigalitres of water from the Hume Dam to keep our farmers going through the drought. Labor and the Greens, the Liberals and their sellout sidekicks and nationals teamed up to vote down our motion. As a result, the, win the basin winter crop in 2019 failed. So here we are in 2021. The Murray-Darling Basin from Queensland to South Australia is currently at a high 80 per cent of water storage capacity. Hume and Dartmouth hold 5,700 gigalitres. The water the politicians said wouldn't be there because of climate change. It is there. This parliament fails again. For weeks now, up to 20 gigalitres a day of water that should have gone to farmers is being sent out to sea at the Murray mouth. With Lake Victoria's storage full and Menindee filling quickly, flooding in the lower basin is a real possibility. And still farmers along the Murray and Murrumbidgee are receiving only 30 per cent water allocation. At these crop prices, is this parliament mad? Give, waters, give farmers their water and let them grow food and feed fibre to feed and clothe the world. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. It's time now to allow every Senator Australian Robert, to lift themselves up through expired. our own initiative. Senator Van. Thank you. This week we've heard from the Labor Party, those opposite, that the Prime Minister only has two jobs, the vaccine rollout and quarantine, and that he's failed at these. What a facile statement, Madam Acting Deputy President. Firstly, as early as November last year, the Morrison government had already ordered 135 million doses of four different vaccines. While history showed they had some problems, no government has the benefit of hindsight. Nearly two million doses are being administered a week now. The rollout has been greatly enhanced by deals done with Poland and Singapore. And I'll remind those opposite that it was at the request of state and territories that they manage quarantine. Just to highlight some of the other jobs that the Prime Minister has done just in these past weeks. We oversaw and worked with our coalition partners on, on getting people out of Afghanistan. 
the additional support for thousands of childcare providers impacted by extended COVID lockdowns was announced. Australia's emissions are now down 20.8 per cent on 2005 levels, which puts us at roughly 74 per cent of our way towards our Paris target. Extra assistance for job seekers across the country, reforms to the leadership structure of the elite SAS regiment were made, more medications were acted to the PBS, super funds are held to account um, uh, with the uh, annual performance test, you know, uh, million dollar grants to Australian defence exporters, disaster assistance for northern New South Wales towns, ministerial trade talks between Australia and India. And I should add that uh, during the COVID affected June quarter, the economy still grew by 0.7 per cent. You'd have to be completely delusional to believe that Prime Minister only has two jobs. If Labor really believe this, this ridiculous line then just goes to show how fit they, unfit they are to govern and that they never belong on these Thank benches. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Griff remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Next Thursday is International FASD Day, which seeks to raise awareness of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. FASD is a devastating condition where in utero exposure to alcohol causes irreversible lifelong brain damage. Sadly, our awareness and understanding of FASD is still limited. Much more needs to be done. That is why two years ago, I initiated a Senate inquiry into FASD. Now that inquiry reported in March this year and made 32 recommendations. Recommendations which are powerful and necessary. A response from government is now well and truly overdue. I worry we will see a repeat of the 2012 House inquiry into FASD. Now that inquiry made important recommendations, but these were never fully acted upon. We cannot afford to wait for another report in another decade. We need government to step up and do what is right, and we need them to do it urgently. In the absence of government action, it has been left to parents, researchers and health professionals to do the work. They are the people providing care, support and assistance. They are the people advocating for better understanding, better education and better resources. And they are the people who know the cost of inaction. They see it every day. We need to do better by them. We owe it to them to ensure the government acts on FASD. Government should start with a response to the Senate inquiry followed by prompt implementation of its recommendations. And they should keep acting until we make a real difference to the lives of those Australians suffering from this horrible, invisible epidemic. Thank you. Senator McAllister. No, the next one I have is Senator Lambie. I'm not sure if she's on the line. So we'll keep moving. Senator Betts was the next one. Yes, Madam Senator Acting Abetz. Deputy President. The love of a mother goes a long way, but sometimes it just won't go far enough. And that is the case with the Jackson family in Tasmania. Jaden is a teenager deeply loved by his mother and father. Jaden has cerebral palsy, autism, is blind and cannot speak. To compound these issues, Jaden's father recently had a stroke. Jaden's mother, Lisa, is doing everything she possibly can to give her son the best in life. In her relentless search for specialist assistance, Lisa found a school for the blind in Queensland with all the necessary additional support services on hand, such as occupational therapy, speech therapy, and a hydro pool. The Narbathong School in Queensland seems exactly what is needed for Jaden to be given the best opportunity in life. Jaden has an NDIS plan. Under the plan, removal costs to relocate the client and his family closer to essential specialist facilities are regrettably not covered, and there seems to be no flexibility in the system to allow for such funding. In principle, I can understand the need to avoid cost blowouts in this taxpayer-funded scheme. But the difficulty with a one-size-fits-all approach is that worthy, needy cases are denied that which is required. 
Any scheme needs tight stewardship to protect the taxpayers' money and to ensure the limited funds are appropriately targeted. Within those strict parameters, which I fully endorse, there can be, and indeed needs to be, room for flexibility to cater to the Jadens of this world. I thank the Senate. Thank you. Senator Patrick Grimotley. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Morrison government has just introduced into parliament a proposed law that seeks to overturn federal court Justice White's recent judgment that national cabinet is not a real cabinet. I have to say that the prime minister is a sore loser. He was beaten fair and square in the administrative appeals tribunal. But having been found to have acted outside and contrary to law, Mr. Morrison now wants to change the law. He wants to stifle public scrutiny of his National Cabinet. The COAG Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 seeks to exempt National Cabinet and its committees from the transparency provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. The bill seeks to empower ministers to prevent the disclosure of National Cabinet records in AAT hearings. National Cabinet secrets are to be hidden in the deepest and darkest vaults of the National Archives for 20 to 30 years. This says a lot about the Prime Minister's priorities. He's con he has conspicuously failed to legislate a National Anti-Corruption Commission, but he's made time to try and nail down the shutters on the government's decision-making. I repeat, he's found time uh, to shut down uh, transparency, hasn't bothered at all to introduce an ICAC bill. The PM hates scrutiny. He's allergic to transparency. If the National Cabinet amendments in this bill pass through the Parliament, responsible Cabinet government will be subverted. Key decisions will be able to be taken in secrecy without those involved, the Prime Minister and Chief Ministers, being properly accountable to their respective parliaments. I'll be standing up against this assault on government, transparency and accountability, and I urge Senator others to Patrick. do so. Senator Lyons. Deputy President, on Wednesday, just yesterday, in her contribution to the second reading debate on the Sexual Discrimination Fair Work Amendment Bill, Senator Hanson <coughs> chose to single out Miss Brittany Higgins in the most disgraceful way. I'm not going to repeat the offensive remarks made by Senator Hanson, but they reach a new low bar even for Senator Hanson. What is shameful is the continued silence of women in this place who hold positions of power in the government to offer no rebuttal to the offensive comments made by the senator. Senator Cash is the highest lawmaker in the land, Senator Rustin as manager of government business, Senator Payne as minister for women have made no comments. They are all cabinet ministers. Their silence continues a safe haven for those who wish to make the kind of comments made by the senator and assists perpetrators avoid detection or in being held accountable for their actions. Further, and perhaps more importantly, it leaves victims feeling confused and unsupported. Australian women know the Prime Minister won't hold his own male ministers to a higher level of behaviour and indeed seems capable of understanding the issues. However, I would expect better from these women senators. Sexual har harassment thrives in a culture of silence. Now, of course, the government was at pains to point out in relation to Ms Higgins how it was supportive after the fact. But what's plain to see is that actions speak louder than words, and it was their actions which let, which let Ms Higgins and all of us down. The high aim of the current view into this place will come to nothing unless each and every one of us work to eradicate the culture of silence. I will be silent no longer. It is time to put the interests of women ahead of the pursuit of power or winning a vote. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I wish to speak today about threats to the magnificent part of WA that is the Kimberley, one that is very close to my heart. Black Mountain Oil and, ga and gas subsidiary Barnett Resources, Texas-based frackers, want to frack the heart of the Kimberley. 
Black Mountain has plans to frack 12 wells up to 50 times using 40 million litres of water per well and a cocktail of chemicals. They want to drill to a depth of two to four kilometres below the ground. They want to bulldoze 109 hectares of native vegetation and bushland to create access tracks, build accommodation camps and fracking operation sites, including toxic waste storage, wastewater storage ponds and flaring pits. The fracking is proposed over seven years, but if they get a foothold, they could be fracking thousands of wells for decades to come. The current plan is to drill and frack 20 wells, but this is just the beginning. Black Mountain have said they want to produce 900 terajoules of gas. To do this would require thousands of wells on land surrounding uh, Mount Hardman and Mount Wayne, and Mount Wayne Creek and Creeks, which flow into the magnificent Maradu-Warra River, the Fitzroy River. This is a terrible decision that Premier McGowan has made for the Kimberley. While First Nations peoples and farmers have veto rights over fracking, what we know is that as soon as a Liberal government gets in, that they, will, they will empower open slather and rights will be binned. We have experience of that in the past. I commend the work that environs Kimberley, who are working closely with First Nations peoples, uh, the work that they are doing to highlight the dangers of this <coughs> fracking and to oppose it. We say no fracking in the Kimberley. Thank you, Senator Seward. Uh, my next list is Senator Henderson. I can see she's online, but I'm not sure if she's there. If not, I will go to Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I wish to speak about an issue of importance for all South Australians, the health of the Murray-Darling Basin. Every South Australian knows how vital a healthy Murray-Darling Basin system is. It's vital for our economy, for the thousands of family farms, orchards, vineyards that give South Australia a global reputation for quality produce and drive tourism to our regions. It's vital to our food supply with the Murray-Darling Basin making up a huge proportion of our nation's food supply. And of course, and most importantly, it's vital for the environment. The Murray-Darling Basin is home to 46 species of native fish and 16 internationally recognised and protected wetlands. We know that the Murray-Darling Basin system is facing significant environmental challenges, most particularly the effects of climate change. And yet the Liberal National Coalition are playing games with the lifeblood of South Australia. They are hopelessly beholden to the eastern states on this issue when he became Nationals leader, once again, we saw Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce's first action was to try and tear down the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. The Nationals moved against their own coalition partner in the chamber, trying to effectively blow up the plan and deny the system the agreed upon 450 gigalitres of water. South Australians cannot trust the coalition on the Murray-Darling Basin. Only Labor can be trusted to deliver the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and to stand up for South Australia. Thank you. I understand Senator Henderson has joined us now, so we'll re resume, return to Senator Henderson. And thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to raise serious concerns about the Victorian government's decision to prohibit Victorians from returning home under the guise of public health orders. For weeks now, hundreds of Victorians, perhaps even thousands, have been trapped into state, declined a permit to travel over the border and back to their homes. Whether they have been interstate to visit family, take a holiday or even attend school, what sort of country are we living in which denies Victorians the right to return home? They are all prepared to follow all testing and home quarantining requirements. Since raising the case of Dennis and Katrina Lay from Geelong, I've received many more complaints from Victorians trapped in caravan parks or other temporary accommodation. Victorians who have made multiple applications for permits, which are continually denied. Dennis and Katrina are fully vaccinated. They're stuck in Albury in a caravan park. Each have had five negative COVID tests and they've been refused a permit to drive straight to their home in Geelong, where they would quarantine for 14 days, driving non-stop with, with no stops at all. 
uh, and of course being a, a risk to absolutely no one. Grant and Diana Truen from Lara have been stuck in Hastings Point in northern New South Wales for a month and Diana is really suffering. Ian Simons from the Yarra Valley can't get home. I've also been contacted by Glenn Reischick of Bendigo, whose wife is stuck in Armandale, New South Wales. Glenn writes his wife's emotional state is worsening by the day and his local state Labor member, Jacinta Allen, refuses to assist. Of course, it's just as bad for Victorian school children who attend boarding school interstate. One student from Yanko Agricultural High School has been told he won't get a second border crossing exemption. And so his schooling is now completely in jeopardy. I say to Premier Daniel Andrews, this is not good enough. Please let Victorians come home. Senator Pratt, I have on my list. Sorry, Senator Watt. Wait, the Leader of the Opposition announced that Labor in government is committed to funding working women's centres in every state and territory. As we reflect on this government's very shameful and limp response to the Respect at Work uh, report and the Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins' recommendations, it is worth this place remembering that every day frontline workers dealing with sexual harassment claims around the country need somewhere to go. Working women's centres have historically provided free confidential assistance and advice about these kinds of matters, including about sexual harassment, wage theft and discrimination. Essential for all women and all workers to be able to address these confronting workplace issues. But the Morrison government's response has been to almost entirely slash all funding to working women's centres, disregarding the essential role they play in finding support and justice for these working women. Each centre requires about $700,000 a year to run, but the Morrison government in its most recent budget set aside only $200,000 for Queensland and the Northern Territory centres combined. Sadly, this leaves South Australia as the last independent service, and this is not good enough. The government's Inadequate response to the Sex Discrimination and Commissioner Jen Kate Jenkins' Respect at Work report should have included funding for working women's centres. These are critical and it is a problem that Labor is prepared to fix. Labor will properly fund working women's centres in Australia and properly protect working women in our country. Senator Dean Smith. Very much, Mr. President. When we think of Africa, we think of colour, we think of majestic landscapes, we think of energy and generosity. And this weekend, the West Australian African community will celebrate the vibrant diaspora that they have in Western Australia at their gala awards night. I'm disappointed. I won't be able to attend. I thank them for the invitation, and I wish them all the very, very best of a night of celebration, colour, energy, and enthusiasm. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. It is my solemn duty to report Jeez. to the chamber yet another terrible week for the once proud National Party. They are the unhappy campers of Australian politics. For years we've endured the musical chairs of the National Party leadership and we thought it had finally been resolved, but this week they've shown they are still at it, this time over inland rail. This week we've seen day after day of leaks and hit jobs on each other by the National Party, starting with the weekend Australian where we saw a leaked text message from David Littleproud, the deputy leader of the National Party, to his leader, Barnaby Joyce, um, saying that the Milmerin guys you spoke to on Friday would have preferred you either told them on Friday this or told them before a public statement from you. It's gone on as the week has gone on. Uh, they hate each other. Order, they can't Senator focus on White, Australia. It, we it are sick of it. PM. Get over it. So and one might guess that it is also the last day of a sitting session. Questions without notice, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. When Western Sydney woman Rolla Rad's fever got worse and her fingers and toes became swollen and started to turn blue, she called an ambulance to her home in Auburn. As she arrived at the local hospital, she found out she was positive for COVID-19. With 14 other ambulances already queuing, Rolla was sent to a makeshift tent. She was in the ambulance and the tent for a total of eight hours. Minister, is the New South Wales hospital system coping with the current COVID case levels? 
obvious. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Keneally, for her question. Uh, Mr. President, clearly uh, some elements of the New South Wales system, uh, health system are suffering stress right now. Clearly, Mr. President. Uh, but can I say to people in New South Wales and to people in Australia generally that the Australian government has been preparing to support the Australian public health system since the beginning of the pandemic, Mr. President. Mr. President. So we began preparing in February 2020 to support the Australian health system, Mr. President, uh, and we will continue to develop that program. Ms. Senator, Senator Keneally, I would rather take advice from the, Victor the New South Wales government, the New South Wales health system, than than uh, someone who led the Australian Labor Party to one of the worst electoral feats, defeats in New South Wales history, Mr. President. Uh, and so Order. I will take my advice from those people who are running the uh, who are running the health system there now, and our health officials here, Mr. President. So we have worked, Mr. President, to increase ICU capacity nationally from 2,000 to 7,000. 500 ventilated beds national, nationwide. We've invested over $30 billion, Mr. President, in COVID health measures, Mr. President, and we continue to work with the New South Wales government, Mr. President, in support of the system. We've invested over $6 billion, Mr. President, in direct COVID support to state hospitals. One of the reasons, Mr. President, we put in place the private hospitals guarantee was to support the public health system to ensure that there was capacity across the country in the case of COVID, Mr. President. And we continue to work with the states cooperatively in respect of ensuring the capacity of the public health system. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Australian Medical Association President Dr Omar Khorshid warns, and I quote, to look after the people with COVID, we're going to compromise the care of everybody else. We are confident that we will be able to measure excess death down the track because of the impact of COVID on our broader health system. How many excess non-COVID deaths are expected as a result of higher case numbers? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and as I've already acknowledged, Mr. President, the COVID-19 global pandemic is having an impact on the health system here in Australia. Uh, it did that in Victoria last year, uh, and we invoked the private hospitals guarantee so that private hospitals could ho support the public health system in Victoria, Mr. Order. President. Uh, we will take the measures appropriate in conjunction with the New South Wales government to support the uh, public health system in order. New South Senator Wales, just Colbeck, as we did in Senator Victoria. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. Conscious of the time there, and we aren't even getting close to an answer to the actual question. Uh, how many? So, relevance. How many excess non-COVID deaths are expected as a result of higher case numbers? Okay, and I take that point. Which let you restate the last part of that question. There was a substantial quotation from someone before that that talked about the stress on the hospital system. I'll summarise it that way. And I'm listening carefully to the minister, but I think he's addressing that part of the question. But I'll let you remind him of your part of the question or that part of it, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I again acknowledge that there is stress on the system and that COVID-19 will continue to put stress on the system. But what we're doing, Mr. President, is to work with the states uh, to ensure that there is capacity to support people with COVID, uh, to the extent that the private hospital guarantee ensures over 30,000 hospital beds additionally nationally, the sector's 105,000 strong workforce is available, available to support Order, the public Senator health system Colbeck. to Senator manage Keneally, COVID. A final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Australian Medical Association has today declared, and I quote, a vaccination rate higher than 80 per cent of the adult population is likely to be required to avoid repeated lockdowns, giving the existing constraints on hospital capacity and staffing. Can the Morrison government guarantee that existing constraints on hospital capacity and staffing will be resolved to ensure that Australia can open up safely? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the national plan based on modelling done by the Doherty Institute, 
is not just about opening the economy at 70 per cent or at 80 per cent. It is about a careful, safe opening of the economy uh, so that we can ensure that the hospital system doesn't get overwhelmed, Mr. President. Uh, that's the pro well, Sen Senator, if the AMA doesn't wants to be modellers, then they should go and be modellers. Uh, we, we worked with the Doherty Institute, we worked with the Doherty Institute Mr. President, on my left. to do some modelling that Senator the basis Polly. of which was supporting the health order. system Senator and the— what? On a point of order? Thanks, Mr. President. Again, relevance. This is a really important question about whether the government can guarantee that our hospitals well, will Senator cope. Watt, That's Senator the Watt, question. Senator Watt, no, the, the, there was an extensive quotation again, and by talking about what he is with respect to what the minister described as the national plan, he is actually being directly relevant um, to the question. Senator Colbeck. Senator Watts' ears must be painted on, uh, Mr. President, because I directly addressed the question when I said the Doherty modelling is based on safely, uh, progressively opening the economy to ensure there isn't undue pressure on the hospital system, Mr. President. That's the point of the process, Mr. President. I will go to the AMA for health advice. I'll go to Doherty for modelling advice. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the minister update the Senate on the implementation of the national plan agreed by national cabinet, including in relation to regional communities, and how the national plan will enable critical agricultural workers to get to work so farmers can harvest their crops? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Brockman, a proud regional Western Australian, very, very keen to support the agriculture community in your home state in particular. Well, our government's committed to supporting our farmers get through the global pandemic, getting the workers and skilled workforce they need to not just get the crop off, milk the cows, shear the sheep, and actually continue the global food tasks, not just here domestically. Uh, but to our export markets around the world. This is a $66 billion industry that we want to see continue to grow to $100 billion. And through the global pandemic, we've implemented a raft of measures as a government, providing visa extensions, relaxing the 40 hours a fortnight work limitation for student visa holders. We've established an agricultural workers' code uh, with specific states. We've established the Australian agriculture visa, uh, and we've also reopened the Pacific labour mobility programs. But we have to recognise that these measures alone will not provide the workforce that Australian agriculture needs uh, for the task ahead of it. We need to follow the national plan so that lockdowns at a local, domestic, state and international level become a thing of the past. Now, as you know, Senator Brockman, you've got a great grain-growing state over there in WA. Uh, and the impact of domestic and international border closures is having a significant uh, impact on your grain growers to get the harvest off uh, that I think is taking place just in the northern wheat belt in over four weeks. And then you've got about six weeks that if we don't get these workers either from the east coast states or from internationally, because we do know uh, that there's a global workforce supply chain when it comes to grain harvesting, Canada, Ukraine, uh, right through the US, and then they end up down with us, uh, because these are quite specialist uh, roles. I would ask that your Premier actually supports Western Australian grain growers by staffing Order. the Bladen Village Senator facility McKenzie, and allow time those for the workers. Answer has expired. Senator Brockman, a supplementary thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister Mackenzie, for that answer. I know Order. how engaged you are with agriculture right across Australia. A supplementary question. How will the national plan assist not only the agricultural industry but also other essential workforces across regional Australia? Senator Mackenzie. Well, as you know, uh, Senator Brockman, through you, Mr President, state and territory chief ministers and premiers have agreed with the Prime Minister to a national plan that will see freedom of movement of people, lockdowns end when it's safe to do so, following the very, very best medical evidence and advice. And it is very, very concerning that there are leaders in this country and chief Order. medical officers uh, perpetuating this Order myth of zero cases and an elimination Order. strategy is the way out of a global pandemic. Well, I would ask them to pick up a year eight science textbook, because that is actually not achievable and to actually have a plan mapped out using the very best science and health data 
uh, to make sure that agriculture and regional communities can have the workforces they need to not just grow great clean green product but to actually Order. support the mining industry and the manufacturing industry uh, is a crime, an absolute crime. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Brockman, a final Thank supplementary you, question. Thank you, Mr President. What are the risks Australia faces if the outcomes under the national plan are not achieved, and how would this impact regional communities and the livelihoods of people who live and work there? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Senator Brockman, you know that uh, we've got a shortage of workers right throughout regional Australia. Um, the, job, the job ads go on and on, and it's not just fruit pickers we need. It is actually sustainable, high-paid careers out in rural and regional Australia. Uh, so we need workforce, not just from capital cities, not just uh, from other states, but Order. internationally. And there is only one way out of this global pandemic to give regional and rural Australia the workforce that they need, the access to global markets that they need to grow and prosper, and that is through the national plan. States and your home state, I'm sorry to say, Senator Brockman, has a very, very poor vaccination rate. We have to, as leaders, as leaders in our country. Order. Well, I'll take the interjections. I'll take the interjections from Senator Pratt. Five Order, Senator billion McKenzie. dollar surplus. Time Fix your own hospitals. The answer has expired. Senator Mario Smith. Order. Senator Mario Smith is asking a question remotely, so I need to be able to hear it. My question is to the minister representing the minister for health, Senator Colbeck. This week, a major incident alert was issued for two South Australian hospitals struggling to cope with pressure on emergency departments. And emergency doctors at the Women's and Children's Hospital warned urgent action was needed before the system fails completely. The SA Salaried Medical Officers Association has said, and I quote, can you imagine now if we had COVID in this environment? It's just mind blowing what we won't be able to do if COVID comes into South Australia. Can the Morrison-Joyce government guarantee that hospitals in South Australia will be properly resourced to cope with the increased demand of going into the next phases of the national plan with high case numbers? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Smith for her question. Um, Mr President, funding contributions from the Commonwealth for public hospitals in all states and territories has grown substantially since we came to government in 2012-13, from $13.3 billion Order. to $25.5 billion in 1920, a growth of Mr. President, 92 per cent, 92 per cent growth since we came to government. And as I've indicated earlier today in the chamber, preparation to support the public health system through COVID commenced in February of last year. We have already invested over $6 billion in support to state hospitals for COVID. Six, over $6 billion, Mr President. We've established telehealth and GP respiratory clinics to ease pressure on hospitals and state workforces. We've created the Private Hospitals Partnership called the hospitals, private hospitals viability guarantee, Mr. President. And that provides a 100 per cent contribution from the Commonwealth to support that measure. It provides for the integration of private hospitals with state and territory health systems to ensure over 30,000 additional health beds and the sector's 105,000 strong skilled workforce is available alongside the public health system to support it in the event of COVID outbreak, Mr. President, and we continue to evolve and work on all of the issues that we need to do to support the public health system. And of course, as I've said, the Doherty modelling and the national plan is about m mitigating uh, cases and controlling a safe opening to support the health Order, system in the Senator Australian Colbeck. community. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. AMA President Dr Omar Khorshid wrote to Mr Morrison warning, and I quote, if we throw open the doors to COVID, we risk seeing our public hospitals collapse. Is the President of the Australian Medical Association correct? Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. The issue in that statement is if we throw open the doors, and that's not the plan, Mr. President. That is not the plan. It's all very well. You need to make up your mind, Senator, whether you support the plan or not, because I tell you, on this side, there's serious questions as to whether Labor actually Order. support the plan or not. Order. Do Labor support the plan? Do Labor Order. support the plan? You've got the Premier of Queensland who clearly doesn't support the plan. He's more interested in fighting the federal election than supporting Australians through COVID, Mr. President. A three-year-old child can't go and see their, their mum and dad because of the approach that Order. the Labor Party is taking in Queensland, Mr. Senators President. It is outrageous, right. Mr. President. NRL players can Order. go. NRL players and their wives can go. A three-year-old child can't go to Queensland to see their parents, Mr. President. It is completely outrageous what is being proposed. So Labor need to make up their mind. Do they support the national plan Order. or not? Order. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Dr Khorshid has also warned, and I quote, too often we hear tragic stories of late stage cancer diagnosis, emergency treatment delayed and sadly avoidable deaths, all resulting from an overworked system. This is only going to get worse with COVID. Can the minister guarantee no Australian will suffer a late stage cancer diagnosis, emergency treatment delay or avoidable death as a result of increasing demand from COVID? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I've said a number of times, the process that we're going through is to carefully open the economy using the national plan in the stage process, so that we can also protect the public health system. And we've put other measures in place also to support the public health system as that process continues. I've also acknowledged, Mr. President, I have also acknowledged that COVID-19 will place stress on the health system, and that is going to have an effect across the health system. For Labor to pretend that it's not is dishonest. It is dishonest, which is, which is, a, which is a bit of a trait, Mr President, Order. because they dishonestly pretend that effects may or may not happen if they were in charge, when in fact they would, Mr President. We are dealing with a global pandemic here, Mr President, and there will be effects. Unfortunately, there will be effects. We have a plan to deal with it. Labor have no plan, and we're not sure if they actually support the plan that we have. Senator, order, order. It is likely to be Senator Seward's last question. So, Senator Seward. Yes, Mr. President. So I'm expecting a really good answer. <laughs> my question to you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. Hundreds of thousands of people are living below the poverty line through lockdown in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. Last year, your government recognised that people on income support needed additional assistance during lockdowns. Most people on income support are not getting additional support during the current lockdowns. Why not? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I say, um, Senator Seward, it's a tremendous, uh, um, a tremendous honour to be actually receiving your last question. Uh, you have been an extraordinary member of this parliament, um, and, uh, and I thank you very much for your question and your continued interest in, uh, in advocating on behalf of some of our more vulnerable members of the Australian community. Uh, well, Senator Seward, um, last year, as you would be aware, when Australia went into lockdown, um, when the pandemic first hit, we were in a, a very, very vastly different situation than we currently are. We had no certainty at all around what was about to happen, and the government acted very, very quickly to throw a blanket over the whole of Australia in the hope that we could give Australians confidence to get through what was a very, very dark time for our country. This year, we have unfortunately seen uh, a second round of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 impact parts of our country. So what we have sought to do is to be particularly targeted in our response to people in lockdown areas who have been impacted by a loss of hours uh, as a result of pandemic lockdowns. 
Uh, the first measure was to make sure that anybody who had lost ours was immediately able to have access to the COVID-19 disaster payment that's administered through emergency uh, services through Senator McKenzie's department. Um, subsequent to the initial um, allocation of the COVID-19 disaster payment to people who were working and had lost ours, we also extended it to those people who were on uh, income payments who also had lost work, recognising that those people, uh, we did not want those people to actually be going out and seeking to work because we needed to try and contain the virus in the states uh, that were in lockdown. Um, but in addition to that, we have also maintained um, you know, support across the whole of the community. But Senator uh, Seward, as you would know, and having listened to the numerous answers that have been provided in this place by Senator Colbeck, vaccinations Order. are the way we can get Senator our country Rushton. safe Senator again. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Through you, Mr President. Um, Minister, most people on income support in lockdown are not receiving any additional payments and are living below the poverty line. Do you acknowledge that this, this puts them at greater risk during the pandemic, particularly if they have to go out to find work because they are living below the poverty line? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, of course, Senator Seward, you and I have had many discussions in relation to um, the, um, the payments that are received by Australians who require the support of the Australian welfare system. Um, and, in, and constantly in discussion around uh, the issue of the measurement of poverty. What I would say is the Australian welfare system is a very comprehensive and targeted system that seeks to provide support to individuals that reflects their particular circumstances and their particular needs. And that is why we do not just talk about the Australian welfare system as their pri the primary payment that is received by a recipient, but about all of the other things that are provided obviously with families, family tax, a tax benefit, those people that are renting, obviously rental assistance. But we also have a universal system of health care and education and many non-cash transfer payments so that we can make sure that our non-contributory, non-time-limited welfare system targets people and the needs of the individual. Senator C with a final supplementary question. How can you be safe and stay at home if you have to go out to scrape some money together because you are living below the poverty line. Does not the fact that people are living below the poverty line mean they are at greater risk? You didn't answer that the first time. I'll ask it again. Senator Rustin. Uh, look, thank you very much, Senator Seward. Um, the government remains absolutely committed to supporting all Australians, whether that be under normal times, under our normal um, welfare system, or whether that be under the extraordinary times that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, we recognise um, that um, supporting Australians needs to be targeted, as I mentioned to you before. I mean, we will continue to disagree in relation to the definition of poverty and how it applies to Australia's welfare system. But the one thing that we do need to, uh, I would like to, to reinforce is that Australia's welfare system is non-contributory. You do not have to have worked and paid into the scheme to be able to get access to it. You do not need uh, you, for, it was there for as long as you need. It is not time limited like other schemes around the world. But we also need to make sure that our welfare system, whilst being fair to the people that it needs to support, we also need to be fair to the people who pay for it, the taxpayer. We try and balance those two things to support people, but make sure that it's sustainable into the future. Order, Senator Polly. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. How many days is it since the Morrison-Joyce government failed to meet its own Easter target for vaccinating, and I, and I emphasise, all <coughs> aged care workers? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and uh, Senator Polly, through her question, continues the dishonesty of the Labor Party in prosecuting uh, the discussion around this particular matter, order. Mr President. I have Senator, Senator Colbeck. I have Senator Polly on a point of order. Uh, it is relevance. The question was very specific. It was how many days since the Morrison-Joyce okay, government Senator, set its Senator own Polly, I, I, target Senator Polly, date. Um, I do take points of order on, on direct relevance. Um, I called the minister to order, I think, at 12 seconds and 13 seconds. So I am going to listen to his answer. You have made your point of— Yes, Senator Polly? 
I just re uh, would draw your attention to the word of accusation that I've been dishonest. I thought was unparliamentary, and I draw your attention uh, to it. The way I heard it, the way if I could if I could rule, the way I heard it, and if I'm incorrect, I will ask Senator Colbeck to withdraw. He referred to the Labor Party with that term. Um, well, I, I didn't hear that. Um, I will rely upon the minister, if he did say it, to withdraw it. If not, I'll check the Hansard, but I was listening quite carefully when I heard the term. If I'm wrong, I apologise in advance. Can I urge senators again—this happened another time in debate—if um, we avoid the use of terms, uh, then we avoid getting into unparliamentary language, and if we avoid interjections, we also stay more relevant to questions. Senator Colbeck to continue. Mr. President, and Labor being dishonest not only in their in their points of order, Mr. President, but they are being dis, they, but they are being dishonest in their representation of the issue, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, we did we did uh, set ourselves an objective with respect to vaccination of the aged care workforce, but we received advice from the health professionals that we not vaccinate residents and workforce at the same time, Mr President. I've, I've, I've put that information on the table yep. so many times in this chamber. I know that Labor are living in the past, Mr President. I know that they're only interested in fighting us and not helping us fight the virus. But, Mr President, we received health advice not to vaccinate residents and staff at the same time. Order. We, we, and we took that advice, Mr President. We then through the HPPC and through National Cabinet, set a target date of the 17th of September for all aged care workers to have received a first dose. Order, We're Senator on track Watt. to meet that target, Mr. President. We will continue to work to that objective. I had a webinar with, that was open to every aged care provider and their infection control lead this morning to talk to them about the target and the processes that we're going to, the advice that we could assist them with. And, and the channels that were available to them to get their workforce vaccinated. <coughs> this is an important measure, Mr. President. Uh, we continue to work on it. Uh, we are determined to meet our objective, and we continue to work cooperatively with the sector and the unions, I might add, in that course, Mr. President. Uh, so we continue to work to support people in, in the aged care sector in Australia. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Morrison conceded this week that there were still challenges in the aged care vaccine rollout. Was Mr Morrison referring to the approximately 60,000 aged care workers who remain unvaccinated with the September 17 deadline just weeks away? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, a further example of the Labor Party living in the past. Uh, very, very old data, Mr. President. Uh, we, and, and we continue to publish the data, Mr. President. It's available on the website. We've actually put on, we've actually put on the website every single aged care facility in this country, Mr. President. Every single aged care in this facility in this country, so people can have a look and see what their vaccination rate is. That's transparency, Mr. President. That's working with the sector to understand what's going on. And that's why, Mr President, I spent time this morning with, uh, on a webinar open to every aged care provider in Australia and their infection control lead to work them through any issues they might have in achieving their objective and our objective, Mr President. Their objective. It's not right, Senator. It's not right, Senator. Your numbers Order. are wrong. You're living in the past, Order. Senator. Mr. President, and we will continue to work, Mr. President, with the sector cooperatively to ensure that we get there. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, with approximately 60,000 aged care workers still unvaccinated, will the minister today guarantee that the Morrison Joyce government will meet the September 17th target? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, Senator Polly's numbers are wrong. Uh, Mr. President, uh, and, and as I've indicated a number of times, we are determined to meet our objective, uh, and we know that the aged care sector and the unions, Mr. President, are happy to work with us. Well, if that's what the, if that's the answer you want, ask the question, Senator. You can't even get your questions Order. right. It's just Order. absurd, Mr. President, what the Labor Party are tossing up here at the moment, Order. Mr. President. That, so we continue to work with 
We continue to work, Mr. President, with the sector to get the, um, the workers vaccinated. And as of this morning, 83.4% uh, of the aged care sector have had a first dose. 62% have Senator, had a sec Senator second dose, Mr. Colbert, President. I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Mr. President, on relevance, the question is very clearly whether the minister will guarantee that the government will meet its target. And while I'm on my feet, I might also ask if you could just review the transcript uh, in relation to the dishonesty point I will. earlier. I'm very happy to, and if I'm wrong, I said, I, as I said, I apologise in advance. Um, can I say, with respect to the point of order, that was the second part of the question. I, I can't instruct the minister to use a word or not, but the first part of the question contained an assertion about a number and a statistic that the minister is challenging. And he is entitled to do that in, in, and be directly relevant to a question. Uh, he's not entitled to stray from the topic, but he is allowed to challenge it. Senator Colbeck. Well, Order. If we don't have interjections, there's so no Mr. need President, to respond to Senator them. Thank Keneally you, Senator Colbeck. That I didn't give any data, and I've just said, Mr. President, that 83.4 per cent of the aged care workforce have had a first date, first vaccination. It's not a number. 62 per cent. 62 per cent have had a second dose, Mr. President. Order, Senator Colbeck. Mr. Perhaps Senator Polly on a point of order. The minister is still <coughs> avoiding their main question. Was are you going Sen to Senator guarantee Polly, that those Senator Polly, aged care workers, 60,000? I have repeatedly said that points of order must start with a standing order, rather than simply accusing someone of not answering a preferred part of the question in a preferred manner. Senator Colbeck, do you wish to continue? Thank you, Mr. President. And we will continue to work with the aged care sector with the objective of, in, of vaccinating the entire Order, workforce. Senator by the Colbeck, of time for the answer has expired. Remotely, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Senator, my question references independent professional truckies who protested Monday morning in Queensland. Can the Attorney General inform the Senate of the legal protections afforded Australians under our constitution, legislation? common law or international conventions that protect the right of everyday Australians to engage in peaceful protest in a public place. Order. Se the order. Senator Watt. The Attorney General. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Roberts for the question. And Senator Roberts, in relation to the actual legal provisions, I don't have them with me, so I will need to revert are uh, to you in relation to that. But in terms of the right to peacefully protest in this country, uh, it is a right that we do hold dearly. And certainly as a society Order. and as a government, uh, it is something uh, that when people do protest, and we've seen protests around Australia, uh, in particular during COVID-19, uh, that they do adhere to the law Senator at Watt. all time and certainly respect the rights of others in relation to what they are protesting on. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. After the truckies made their excellent point that Senator Hanson and I support, Senator Hanson did ask the truckies to consider allowing horses on trucks in the blockaded traffic to be freed and allowing everyday Australians to go about their day without hindrance. Attorney General, do you agree that the Australian people would be looking to parliaments to defend civil, civil liberties exercised in a fair manner, not to trash them? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, uh, Senator Roberts, at all times, uh, when people are protesting, and it doesn't matter what the issue is in relation to a protest, they should always protest in accordance with the law. They should respect the laws of the land, and at all times, they should respect the rights of others. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you. I note that previous protests against COVID measures around our nation were deemed illegal and prosecuted. Yet the Black Lives Matter protests were approved under COVID restrictions. Both series of protests were in violation of similar COVID restrictions. The only difference between those two protests was the subject matter. Attorney General, should politicians be allowed to use public order, order measures to hide from public criticism? Um, the, the minister said they couldn't hear the question because of in, um, noise during a remote question. So I'm going to ask Senator Roberts to ask it again. Um, which I know wastes the time of the chamber, but the minister couldn't hear it, so I asked for silence. Senator Roberts, can you repeat your question? Certainly, Mr. President. I note that previous protests against COVID measures around our nation were deemed illegal and prosecuted, yet the Black Lives Matter protests were approved under COVID restrictions. Both series of protests were in violation of similar COVID restrictions. The only difference between these two protests was the subject matter. 
Attorney General, should politicians be allowed to use public order measures to hide from public criticism? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Robert, again, Commonwealth, state and territory governments, uh, the one thing we are all united in is keeping Australians safe during COVID-19. Uh, and the Australian government has at all times sought to take measures that combat the virus, but as I said previously, at the same time respecting people's rights and their freedoms. You would also know that states and territories themselves have taken measures under their own laws in respect of COVID-19. And as you have articulated, this is predominantly done under state and territory public health and emergency management legislation. Uh, again, at all times, though, you know, the Commonwealth will work with state and territory governments through the National Cabinet to ensure that Australia's COVID-19 response is one that is measured and is one that is appropriate. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Uh, Minister, with the National Summit on Women's Safety starting on Monday and roundtables starting today, can you explain how the summit will support our government's goal to reduce violence against women and children? Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. Um, well, the National Summit on Women's Safety is an absolute critical step in the development of the next national plan, not just to reduce violence against women and their children, but to end it once and for all. And the plan must be an ambitious blueprint to wipe out the scourge that is domestic violence on our national landscape. The first plan uh, began in 2010, and since then we have developed a, a much larger body of evidence and a better understanding about the ways domestic violence is perpetrated. Our understanding of violence against women has changed since the first plan came into effect, and that is what we seek to understand through these roundtables. We know that uh, domestic, family and sexual violence is pervasive, and it takes many different forms. Uh, today and tomorrow, the roundtables will consider all of those different forms of violence, things such as coercive control, technology-facilitated abuse and the impact of violence that it has in the home on children. Participants uh, in the roundtables include survivors, frontline service workers and people who deal with domestic, family and sexual violence every single day in their line of work. So, together with the Minister for Women, a number of my colleagues, members in this place, members in the other place, from all parties in, these, uh, in, in this uh, parliament, um, have been observing these roundtables so that we can hear directly, firsthand, from people, often survivors of these different types of, of domestic, family and sexual violence, so that we can make sure, as we develop the next national plan to end violence against women and their children, that we have got the voices of people who have survived this abuse firmly embedded into our decision-making. But importantly, the summit also gives the opportunity for all Australians to have their say and to be involved um, by um, the live streaming, because we want to have a public debate to end this scourge Order. on our society. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Uh, and Minister, you spoke about the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. Uh, can you please explain to us how this next national plan will consider the needs of our diverse community in Australia? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, family, domestic and sexual violence is a scourge that's across the entire Australian landscape. And we know that it doesn't matter where you live, how old you are, where you've come from, whether you're a first Australian or a new Australian, your socioeconomic status, you can be affected by family domestic and sexual violence. We also recognise that some women are more likely to experience violence than others, uh, and some have greater barriers to accessing critical support services. This morning we began a series of roundtables um, that will form part of that consultation, hearing this morning from representatives from the LGBTIQIA community, as well as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. We also had a roundtable to interact uh, on issues around perpetrators and making sure that we've got early intervention programs so that we can get in early and stop the violence. Um, the discussion is well underway, and I'd really like to acknowledge the huge number of people that are participating in their roundtables, some of them under very traumatic Senator situations. Davey, a final supplementary question. 
Uh, thank you, Minister. And how will the National Summit on Women's Safety address this really important issue of sexual violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, we um, have included sexual violence in the plan this time for the first time because we absolutely believe and are committed to reducing sexual violence and harassment in Australia to ensure women and girls of all ages can be safe at work, safe at home, safe when they're studying, safe when they're online. And preventing and responding to sexual violence will be a key discussion at the National Summit with expert panellists, including this year's Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, Women's Safety New South Wales CEO Hayley Foster and the University of New South Wales Associate Professor Dr Michael Salter. The panel will inform the plan and ensure sexual violence is absolutely at the forefront of ending violence against women once and for all. This work builds on the $29 million to, prevent, uh, to develop new primary prevention initiatives to address sexual violence, which will now allow targeting resources uh, to campuses of universities and build on our very successful Stop It at the Start campaign. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Environment Minister. It has been revealed under FOI today that the Morrison government directed independent science agency Ames to, report, to release a report into the health of the Great Barrier Reef before the report was complete. This, of course, was to be used for political lobbying ahead of the UNESCO vote on the danger of the reef. Will the minister tell the parliament who gave the direction for this early release? Was it the environment minister or her office, or did the direction come from the top and it was the prime minister and his office that was interfering with the scientific report? Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Hanson Young, for your question. And I apologise for getting your name incorrect earlier. Um, but can I uh, just scratch my head and say, first of all, that I'm not entirely sure what the outrage is about, because it seems that the Greens and the ABC are in quite a lather, not because the, the report was withheld, not because it was altered, but because it was in fact released. This is bewildering. So we released it, and we released it a week after its key findings were already published, already published in an op-ed by Ames themselves. So hold the front page on that one. The Minister for the Environment welcomes that report from the Australian Institute of Marine Science that shows that after a series of severe and widespread disturbances over the last decade, coral cover has actually increased across all regions. Now, these results are an outstanding demonstration of how the reef can actually recover following disturbances if given enough time to make that recovery. These reports have been released annually since 2016, so they should come as no surprise. In 2016, after that mass bleaching event, and they, are they are the most comprehensive record of reef condition that's available for the Great Barrier Reef. Now, as much as these results are good news in the short term, they don't change the need for our ongoing, highly regarded reef management and strong global action on climate change to improve the outlook of the reef in the long term. So this program is part of the Australian government's $3 billion commitment to protecting the reef and support the work of reef communities, reef managers and marine scientists, traditional owners and, of course, the thousands of Australians who depend on the reef economy. Australia is world-leading in our coral reef science and management, and we readily share our findings and our expertise at a global level. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, isn't it true, Minister, that the reason the Environment Minister was so desperate to get this report out before it was finished and spent so much time and money lobbying the UN members was because they are, the government was desperate to cover up how poorly you have taken climate action? You are embarrassed about your poor performance. Order. Senator Hanson Young. Well, I can't hear over Senator Sazelja, well, even though he's got a mask Se on. Senator, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hanson Young, have you concluded your question? I've concluded my question. Senator Hume. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I reject both the premise of Senator Hanson Young's question and the undergraduate tone with which it was, di it was directed. Did the government direct an independent science agency to release a report early? Is that seriously what you are suggesting? The AIMS chief science executive, Paul Hardesty himself, has already made it clear that any suggestion that this port report was rushed is entirely incorrect. The technical report was already finished. The document only needed to be prepared for publication, which required it to be formatted and laid out for publication. But the key findings of that report had already been finalised and, in fact, published, published and publicised in an op-ed by the CEO of Ames on the 12th of July. That was before the government requested the report's release to provide to the World Heritage Committee. I am afraid, Senator Hanson Young, you are poorly mistaken. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. UN head Antonio Guterres has declared the IPCC report a code red for climate, and he's urged countries to do more to reduce both car carbon pollution and protect biodiversity in the fight against the climate collapse. When will this government take seriously the emergency we are facing of the collapse of the climate and the biodiversity crisis? When will you have proper targets for 2030 ahead of the end of year Order, top Senator conference? Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hume. <laughs> Order. <laughs> Senator Hume. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. And I want to reiterate the fact that the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage Great Barrier Reef, and we make no apologies for that, or for defending our reputation as the best marine park managers in the world. We are benchmarked against global standards, and Australia's management of the reef is recognised as a leading example and is considered by many to be the gold standard for large-scale marine protected area management, according to a UNESCO report. And that fact is in fact acknowledged by many, including the World Heritage Centre itself. In its draft decision on the reef presented to this year's World Heritage Committee meeting, it said that the state party, referring to Australia, for the, it, it commended the state party, Australia, for the strong and continued efforts to create the conditions for the implementation of the Reef 2050 long-term sustainability plan, and that included through unprecedented financial commitments. This is the centrepiece of Australia's reef protection efforts, Order. this 2050 plan jointly defended by the Queensland government. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. As a result of vaccine supply shortages, the New South Wales government has been forced to extend the gap between the first and second doses of Pfizer vaccines to eight weeks. What impact will this change, resulting from a shortage of vaccine supplies, have on the time frame of reaching the 70 and 80 per cent targets? And did the New South Wales government advise the Morrison-Joyce government of this change before it was announced? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can I say I reject the premise of the question that there is a vaccine shortage? Mr President, uh, there are significant volumes of vaccines available to Australians. In fact, if someone wants to go out and get they say that they say they support the vaccine rollout program. Okay. They say Order. they say that they support Order. both vaccines, but the scoffing from across the chamber de, de belies, belies that, Mr. President, and they're only focused on Pfizer uh, and they're not Order. concerned about AstraZeneca, which is uh, done a large proportion of the work, Mr. President, in the system, Mr. President, uh, and, and noting that they have actually shortened the time frame for doses between of, of the AstraZeneca vaccine, Mr. President, to pr promote the vaccine rollout, Mr. President, uh, and we've supported New South Wales in respect of their vaccine rollout by putting 50 per cent of the additional vaccines that we got from Poland, 500 plus thousand doses, into New South Wales to support the rollout. We distributed the rest of that across the vaccine rollout to the states on a per capita basis, Mr. President. So we have and we will continue to support states in respect of the vaccination program, Mr. President. And today, Mr. President, today, Mr. President, we have passed 20 million doses. A significant effort, Mr. President. 
The Labor Party should be celebrating that. Mr. Order, President. Senator they Colbeck. No, no Senator Watt on a point of order. Thanks, Mr. President. Again on relevance, uh, we would like this minister to answer questions such as what impact well, the change no, the there's government. No, there's no such as, Senator Watt. Well, the, okay. Um, specifically, the question is what impact. That the was, change announced by the New South was, Wales government uh, will have on Senator Cash. And that was one of the questions. Oh, sorry, Senator Cash. Thank you. And on the point of order in relation to relevance, the minister was directly relevant. The first response he made was, I reject the premise of the question. Um, firstly, Senator Watt, order. Senator, Sen Senator Watt, if I could rule. Um, that was one question among several asked. Um, to address, uh, or there were, with a preface, and a, um, a minister cannot simply reject the premise of a question and say everything they want. They still must remain directly relevant to the material in the question. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister. Um, as I heard him, he was talking about vaccine supply. Um, it's not a place for a general address on the vaccine rollout program, but if he's talking about matters raised in the question, I believe he's directly relevant. I can't instruct him how to answer it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And we will continue to support New South Wales and other states with respect to the vaccine rollout. Mr President, in fact, um, to date, as I've indicated, 20 million 28,084 doses of vaccine across the country have been administered, Mr President. Uh, and of course, both vaccines, not just Pfizer, Mr President, both vaccines are playing an important part in the rollout. So, yes, Mr. President, there are different, day, different time periods in different states between doses. Victoria has extended their doses out to six weeks rather than three weeks for Pfizer. Order, uh, Senator Colbeck. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Will the New South Wales government's decision to extend the gap for Pfizer vaccines from three weeks to eight weeks force those who have already booked their appointments to wait longer? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. If someone has a booking for a vaccination, Mr. President, I would urge them to keep it. And I would urge anyone who wants to take up a vaccine, Mr. President, to make a booking to take up a vaccination, Mr. President. There is ample supply of AstraZeneca available right now. Right now, in fact, Mr. President. Order. Senator, there are, I, I've got, I had Senator O'Neill on her feet first. Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Yes, and it's with regard to relevance. The question was pretty straight and it did not refer to AstraZeneca. It's a particular question about the rollout of Pfizer, the three to eight week delay, and I urge you to bring the minister actually to the question in hand. Um, it, it was a relatively specific question. Was the word Pfizer mentioned in the question, in this, in this supplementary? Okay, my notes, sorry, I didn't have that. I try and scribble as quickly as I can. Um, in, this is a specific question. I'm going to ask the minister to specifically address the issues in the question, but again, I cannot instruct a minister the terms in which to answer a question, the terminology to be used, or the content of the answer. So this question goes to the, um, the extension, in my view, of the time period for the vaccine. Um, I, I, and I take it I didn't have Pfizer, but I take your word for it, Senator O'Neill, and it goes to um, whether or not people will have to wait longer, or whether or, uh, or any other arrangements relative to both of those the minute that, I, that are directly relevant. Senator Cash, are you seeking the call? Thank you. And on the point of order in relation to relevance, uh, Mr. President, you are right. The question was in relation to the New South Wales government's decision to extend um, bookings in relation to Pfizer, and will people have to wait longer yeah. for a vaccination? The minister is directly referring Look, okay. to yep. directly referring to whether or not people have to wait longer. We're not, Senator Keneally, we're not going to get into whether there are two words in it because I heard the interjection there. I'll take your submission. Thank wait. you, Mr. President. I do appreciate that. The question was actually, would it force those who've already booked their appointments to wait longer? It didn't go to whether people should book or not book. It went to directly the question of people who've already got appointments booked for I, Pfizer. I, I, I appreciate it did not go to. It's not the place for a general discussion of whether someone should book for a vaccine. But at the same time, a tightly worded question and answer can still be directly relevant by addressing the issues raised in the question, even if it is not addressed in the terms the opposition would like. That is what the motions to take note are for afterwards. So I call Senator Colbeck, taking all that into account, to continue. 
Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, I would urge anyone who's got a, a vaccine appointment to keep that appointment. One, anyone who doesn't have one to make one, Mr. President. The Labor Party want to make this all about Pfizer, but the vaccine rollout is not just about Pfizer, Mr. President. There are two vaccines Order. currently in our vaccination program, and Mr. President, and there are ample supplies of AstraZeneca available right now. To date, Mr. President, we have we have received 32.7 million doses of vaccine, 14.5 million order. doses Senator of Colbeck, Pfizer, Mr. President. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Relevance. This is nowhere near the question that Labor has asked. Um, well, I ask you to bring respect, the minister back I to the question. I do not think that to be directly relevant to an answer, a brand or manufactured version of a vaccine is going to meet. Is I can apply that as a strict test. If the minister is the minister is directly addressing the issues in the question, there is an opportunity to take note. On my right, I think order. I think, with respect, the submission that I instruct the minister to speak about one brand of vaccine is actually going beyond direct relevance and actually seeking, to direct, seeking me to direct him how to answer a question. Senator Keneally. And thank you, Mr President. I appreciate the point you're making, but this goes to a decision in the New South Wales government that is directly relevant to just one brand of the vaccine. We didn't have an option to ask about other brands. The New South Wales government and, made this decision. And there's a chance to debate the and merits of an answer. it is a simple question uh, that, if people uh, that, will have actually, to wait. No, there is an opportunity to debate the merits of how a minister answers a question. Direct relevance does not go to using the very words raised in a question, or in this case, the brand. Um, if he's you have an opportunity to debate that afterwards. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And the Labor Party directly, directly contribute to vaccine hesitancy by, by their dismissal of AstraZeneca, Mr President. We have two vaccines in our vaccination program. Order, Pfizer Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Every... Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Um, Thank you, Mr. President, and I'm sure it will disappoint, disappoint New South Wales men and women who couldn't get Pfizer that answer. It's just terrible. Despite the 107 tragic deaths in the current Delta outbreak, 957 people in hospital and 160 in the ICU, the Morrison Joyce government is forcing people in New South Wales to wait an additional five weeks to be fully protected from COVID. Does the Morrison Joyce government take responsibility for failing vaccine supply, or does Mr Morrison maintain that ultimately everything's a state matter? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. And, and, and despite all their protestations, Mr. President, clearly the Labor Party continue to attempt to undermine the confidence of the Australian community in vaccines, particularly AstraZeneca. And it's not the first time Senator O'Neill has done that this week with her scoffing across order. the chamber when, with order. the mention of Senator AstraZeneca. Senator Colbeck, I have Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Senator O'Neill. To assist the minister, I just want him to know that I got oh, AstraZeneca. I do support um, the, the rollout, but Senator I want Pfizer for people who need seat. it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. There are 32.7 million doses of vaccine that have been made available in the Australian community since the beginning of the vaccine rollout. 14.5 million doses of Pfizer, 18.2 million do doses of AstraZeneca. I thank every, of the, every one of the people who have taken up the 20 million doses that have currently been put into arms. I urge every Australian to take up the opportunity to take, up, to, to take a vaccine of whatever variety is available to them, Mr President, because that is what is going to make us safe against the COVID-19 virus. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to Australia's passionate Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on the wonderful achievements of our Australian para-athletes at the Tokyo Paralympics? The minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar for his question. Australia, Mr. President, sent a team of 179 athletes and 168 support staff to the Tokyo Paralympics. They have represented our nation with distinction, uh, as we've seen with pride, and their performances on the world's greatest stage have brought immense joy to many Australians over recent weeks. In what's been a very challenging time, Mr. President. Australia's para-athletes put in significant effort in preparing for the Olympics, just like their Olympic counterparts. 
The Commonwealth Government is currently the major funding source for Paralympic sports. In the five years leading to the Tokyo Paralympics, the Government has provided $88.8 million for para-athlete high-performance programs. The Government recognises, however, that there is a disparity in these um, in payments available to uh, Australian medal-winning athletes compared in the Paralympics compared to the medal-winning athletes in the Olympic Games. Medal incentives are currently paid by the Australian Olympic Committee to Olympic medal-winning athletes. The governing body of Parasports Australia, Paralympics Australia, does not have the financial capacity to do the same for Paralympic medal-winning athletes, Mr President. And that is why I am absolutely delighted to advise the Chamber that the government has decided to make available funding to Paralympics Australia, which would allow it to make payments to medal winning athletes at the Tokyo Paralympics, equivalent to the payments Mr. President, made to, by the AOC to medal winning athletes at the Tokyo Olympics. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. How have Australians reacted to the performances of our para-athletes in Tokyo, including in relation to the wonderful Queenslander Grant Scooter Patterson, who, after winning a medal, said, and I quote, I'm living proof that if you follow your dreams long enough, they might come true? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Senator Scar, there have been some absolutely wonderful stories um, out of the Paralympics, and I'm sure over the coming days there will be many more to come. Uh, Australia's medal tally to date is 13 gold, 23 silver and 24 bronze, a total of 60 medals thus far, and I'm sure there will be more over the next few days. Importantly, our team has competed with the pride that you've expressed and represented our nation uh, with so much pride and capacity. Chef de Mission Kate McLaughlin put it perfectly when she said earlier this week, the culture of the Australian Paralympic team is shining through at a time when it's been severely tested. I couldn't be prouder of the way that everyone has risen to the occasion. Mr President, can I echo her comments? And I'm sure the rest of Australia would do exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Senator Scar, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the Liberal National Government assisting our para-athletes to achieve their goals, including as we look ahead to the 2032 Games in my home state of Queensland? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I'm excited to say that Australians are taking the to the Paralympics like never before. Host broadcasters, seven, uh, uh, Channel 7's comprehensive coverage has been met with absolutely record ratings. The coverage has reached uh, 2.39 million viewers a day nationally, which is quite extraordinary. And to hear the goalball girls say that they were proud to see their sport on free-to-air television Say, is saying something. Can I thank Channel 7 for its ongoing commitment to the Paralympics? In terms of social media, Australians have also engaged with our para-athletes like never before. Paralympics Australia has reported record levels of social media engagement and presented some truly inspiring stories about our para-athletes. Their journey to Tokyo, Mr President, their, their, their journey beyond and their journey towards Brisbane 2032. Senator Cash. Mr President, I now ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Now, order. I've got Senator Birmingham who uh, is requesting the call. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, Mr President. Mr President, I just wish to, uh, to give uh, Senate and parliamentarians, and in particular uh, parliamentary staff, a very brief update in relation to the implementation of recommendations as they uh, relate and flow from the report of Ms Stephanie Foster, PSM, uh, of parliamentary workplaces and, in particular, the response to serious incidents. Uh, I understand that uh, presiding officers, yourself, Mr President, uh, and the Speaker, uh, are working through the process of making a determination, which will be settled shortly, that would confer upon the Parliamentary Services Commissioner additional functions necessary to give effect to an independent parliamentary workplace complaints mechanism for members of Parliament. Uh, and in most importantly, members of parliament staff operating under the MOPS Act. Uh, this would provide a mechanism to provide support to staff and parliamentarians in relation to serious incidents and other work health and safety matters, matters and also to provide a mechanism for the reviewing and making of recommendations in relation to complaints about serious incidents involving MOPS Act employees and parliamentarians. 
Mr President, I want to thank you and the Speaker and for your work and cooperation in this important determination. It forms part of a range of actions that will be supported by the Parliament and resolutions to be put to the Parliament at our next sitting that will help to ensure these processes uh, are transparent, independent, uh, private where necessary, but also provide full accountability measures as recommended by Ms Foster. Uh, this has been a very cooperative process across the parliament. I want to acknowledge uh, the role of the opposition in a bipartisan way in working through the construct of these arrangements and the role indeed of minor parties and crossbenchers, all of whom have been constructive as well. Uh, these actions are in addition uh, to the work being undertaken by uh, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins in her independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces, and I continue to encourage uh, all members of parliament, all staff, former members of parliament and former staff to engage in that, as well as the establishment of the independent confidential trauma-informed support line for staff and parliamentarians, 1800 APH SPT, uh, and urge and encourage all to engage in that when necessary and reach out there, as well as the imminent rollout of workplace health and safety training also recommended by Ms Foster uh, that the government will be providing and making available to all staff and parliamentarians. Once again, Mr President, thanks to the presiding officers and the opposition uh, parliamentarians across the board uh, for their work and cooperation in the successful implementation of these matters. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. I thank senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Colbeck to questions asked by Senator Keneally and Senator Marielle Smith. Well, what we saw today during question time, if anyone had any doubt of how out of depth the Minister uh, for um, Aged Care representing the Minister for Health is in this chamber. It was on full display today. The arrogance of this minister and this government not to heed the warnings of the Australian Medical Association. Who best is able to look out for health professionals, to look at the crisis that our hospitals will be facing if indeed we are open to restrict uh, releasing the restrictions that we've had thus far and ensuring that we're keeping Australians safe by having lockdowns and being careful with how we go about managing the rollout of the vaccine, then it was clearly on display today. We have every reason to question this minister, but he has such a glass jaw. He hates to be questioned. This entire government hates to have any scrutiny. Now, we on this side will always, always hold the ministers of the Crown responsible for their actions. This is a minister who fails on every occasion to answer very direct questions. Now, the questions today went to what's happening in New South Wales in particular, but what we know will happen right across this country. If the uh, variant of Delta gets out of hand beyond the borders of New South Wales, then there is a crisis like we have never seen before in this country will hit our hospitals. That is the reality. That's the warning from the Australian Medical Association. I would be taking their advice. I, as a minister, would not be suggesting that if the AMA want to uh, talk about modelling, then they should get into that business. I mean, the arrogance, the absolute arrogance. I've never heard anything like it before, which just goes again to the basis of the issue from the very start of this pandemic. This Prime Minister, this Minister for Health, have been unable to have any forward thinking. They learnt nothing from what was happening globally. I mean, like it just didn't fall out of the sky here in Australia, this pandemic. They had plenty of opportunity to put plans in place, but they failed to do that. They failed to provide 
enough vaccines so that now what we're seeing is the crisis in New South Wales is getting worse potentially because now they want to extend the time for rolling out Pfizer vaccine. Now, it's all very well for the minister to try and deflect and talk about the AZ. Well, I've got to tell you, on this side of the chamber, a lot of us have had it. We've had both vaccines. Happy to have that. And to come into this chamber, the audacity of this fail minister to suggest that we are not doing what we should be doing as citizens and as elected members of the Senate and the other place to encourage Australians to get vaccinated is just outrageous. That's desperation from a minister who is out of his depth. It's, it is unbelievable. You know, the Prime Minister first off said, we are all in this together. And then he turned when things had been exposed that he has failed in his job and his responsibility of Prime Minister of this country to want to now lay the blame elsewhere. First off, he wanted to blame all the states for all the lockdowns. Now, every day we have seen, for the last month at least, those on the other side come into this chamber and try and create this illusion that they're the only people that are out there caring for people and making sure that they're vaccinated. Well, that is clearly untrue, and it is quite dishonest. It is quite dishonest. There is nobody in this chamber at all, except for one exception who sits on that side of the chamber that has been raising issues around whether or not people should be vaccinated. It is the government's own backbench, its own backbench that has been out there putting out misinformation about vaccinations in this country. Not anyone on this side of the chamber, because we are responsible, because we will always hold this government to account. And for those on that side to come in here and trying to shift the blame, well, the Australian people have no faith whatsoever in Mr Morrison to roll out a vaccination to keep Australians healthy Thank and you, safe. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Madam, Davey. Madam Acting Deputy President. No, it's Senator Davey. Thank Madam you. Madam Deputy President, I seek the call next, please. Uh, I've got Senator uh, Davey on the list, and that's who I've called Senator Roberts. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Oh, Madam Deputy President, sorry. Um, I, I just find it incredible. Labor coming here, and today the experts Labor want us to listen to is the AMA. Previously, previously, they want us to listen to other experts. Continually, we get told, listen to the experts, listen to the experts. Well, we have been listening to the experts. We have been listening to the experts since day one. We've listened to ATAGI about the vaccinations. We've listened to the AHPCC about the strength of lockdowns and what we should do. We've listened to the chief medical officers and we've listened to the Doherty Institute, who are experts at modelling and looking at when would be an appropriate time to start focusing on the future. But apparently we've now got to ignore all of them and only listen to the AMA. Well, what a ridiculous concept, Madam Deputy President. Because if we ignored everyone else and only focused on one sector of experts, we would find ourselves uh, in, a, in a much worse position. What we do know is that, as a government, by listening to the expert advice, we have been adaptable. We have managed to pivot our approach. And yes, we have accepted as a government the early stages of the vaccine rollout did not go to plan, and uh, we could have done better, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. No one could have foreseen the change in advice for the AstraZeneca. No one could have foreseen that. And uh, you, you may laugh, Senator Keneally, but had you had a crystal ball, I would have been impressed, because no country in the world foresaw that change in advice. And we were not the only country that changed the advice on how and what uh, levels to provide the AstraZeneca without 
without talking to your GP. Even Atagi always said, if you are confident and comfortable and have spoken to your GP, you can still take AstraZeneca. But that was, that was conveniently ignored by the media. It was conveniently ignored by Labor. And the Prime Minister reminded people that they could sit down with their GP, have the conversation, and if they were comfortable, they could take the AstraZeneca. And so many people across Australia have done that because they're not feasting on fear that is being spread, the vaccine hesitancy that is being spread by people. And I am very grateful to the millions of Australians who have now had over 19 million doses of vaccine, of both AstraZeneca and Pfizer, the two vaccines that are available. We are now getting over 330,000 doses a day into people's arms. It is now taking us less than four days to get a million doses into people's arms. And we are doing that while listening to the advice. We are doing that with our eyes firmly set on the advice of the Doherty Institute. That advice that tells us that we need to look to the future and that when we get to 80 per cent vaccination rates across Australia, we will be in a position to move forward. And I, I'm, I want to bring to Labor's attention, I mean, this is now being acknowledged by your own side. Senator Kimberly Kitching said, and I quote, I think we are getting to the end of the lockdown era partly because we are doing so well on vaccinations, because Senator Kitching recognises that vaccinations are our road out. Gone are the days of COVID zero. That is not going to happen. Premier Daniel Andrews accepts that that is not going to happen. Senator Kitching accepts that is not going to happen. We need to get these vaccinations out the door. We need to get to 80 per cent so that we can progress on our national pathway post-COVID, because this disease, unfortunately, is with us. Thank you, Senator Davey. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask these questions in the Senate today because the public hospital system in my home state of South Australia is struggling to cope. This week, we had a major incident alert issued for two South Australian hospitals struggling to cope with pressure on their emergency departments. We've had emergency doctors at the Women's and Children's Hospital who have warned that urgent action was needed before the system fails completely. Everyone in South Australia knows that ramping is at crisis point. We have had record levels of ramping in my state. Every South Australian is aware of that because they are deeply anxious about what's going to happen if they ever need to call an ambulance. And we have had code wipes declared. It is fair to say our system in South Australia is already struggling. So what on earth happens with a further COVID outbreak? What on earth happens when our system is already under pressure? And what happens in the next steps of the national plan in my state of South Australia when we're already seeing these significant issues in our hospital system? I want to be absolutely clear. No one wants to be locked down in South Australia again, and no one wants to see the existing lockdowns across our country go a moment longer than they need to. We have been urging the government to do the policy work required so we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. To get the vaccination rollout on track, speedy and effective, that's what we wanted to see and they bungled it. To fix quarantine because hotels are built for tourists, not for quarantine. These were the things they needed to focus on to avoid the sorts of things we're seeing and on these two things, the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have deeply failed. So it is not enough. It is not enough 
for the minister in his answers today to just ignore me, actually to spend his time shouting at senators across the chamber. I'm here on remote. I can't even hear the conversation going on. I want an answer to my question, minister. I want an answer to my question, not to hear you engaging in nonsense with other senators in the chamber. And it's not enough to just say there will be effects. There will be effects. Yeah, that's the point. That's the point. So how are you going to handle them? What are you going to do in my state of South Australia? People are worried in my state. They are anxious because of the state of the health system already. And we do not have a widespread spread outbreak of COVID in my state at the moment. We do not. And the health system is already struggling. So what happens if we do? To the Federal Health Minister, what are you doing to ensure South Australians can be kept safe? And it's not enough to make this about Labor, and it's certainly completely unacceptable to suggest any of us are engaging in vaccine hesitancy. I'm getting my jab this week. I can't wait. I cannot wait to be vaccinated because I want to keep my family and my community safe. And I know my colleagues feel the same. Actually, the only people peddling vaccine hesitancy in this place have come from your own backbench. So maybe grab a mirror out, take a good look at them and get them into line instead of coming in here and accusing us of engaging in vaccine hesitancy. It is absolutely nonsense. There are real issues in the healthcare system in my state, real issues in our hospital system, real issues with ramping. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? This isn't about trying to undermine a plan. It's not about trying to undermine a policy response. No one wants to do that. No one wants this to go a minute longer than it needs to. No one wants the restrictions in my state. No one wants lockdowns. But we do want answers. We want answers from the federal government who is so responsible for what's going on here. He's so responsible for how we're going to see a path through this. And you didn't give me answers today. You didn't give us answers. And that means you didn't give South Australians answers. You didn't answer their anxieties. And you need to. People are worried because you've bungled vaccines, you've bungled quarantine, and they're worried you're going to bungle what comes next in my state of South Australia. It is absolutely unacceptable. And I hope next time I ask a question, you have the decency to answer me properly. Thank you, Senator Smith. Your time has expired, Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Excuse President. Excuse me, Madam Deputy President. Uh, yes, Senator Could I Robinson. seek the call later, please? Uh, yes, there's an opportunity uh, after the next speaker following um, Senator Scar. Senator Scar, please go on. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think my friend and colleague Senator Smith from South Australia is being somewhat unfair uh, to the minister in suggesting that the minister did not answer the question which Senator Smith put to the minister. I was listening very carefully, and Senator Colbeck did, in fact, answer the question. And I'll just reiterate a few of the points which Senator Colbeck made in terms of responding to the question from Senator Smith. First, Senator Colbeck referred to the record funding which the federal government has provided to the public health system across this country since the coalition government was elected. And that's, that's on the record. That's on the record. The federal government has provided record funding to the public health system across each and every state in Australia, and it's disingenuous to imply otherwise. And just to underscore that, the Australian government is continuing its record investment in public hospitals, including funding under the 2020-25 National Health Reform Agreement and the National Partnership on COVID-19 Response, with total investment of $135.4 billion over five years. Let me just reiterate that number, $135.4 billion. There is no doubt that there is an issue in many of our public hospitals across Australia. There's an issue certainly in my home state of Queensland in terms of ambulance ramping, but I think it's a bit disingenuous to throw bricks at the federal government in that respect because the federal government does not run public hospitals. In, under our federation system. Those public hospitals are run by the states. And in my home state of Queensland, all the objective evidence is to the effect that the, our public health system is not being run at an optimal level. And I believe one of the reasons for that 
is that the Labor Party in my home state of Queensland doesn't leverage off enough the opportunity, the opportunity for our private sector and our public sector to work together to meet things like waiting times and uh, some of the issues relating to issues like ambulance ramping. And it's a real issue in my home state of Queensland. And it is a concern, a great concern, that what is going to happen as we move through the next phase of dealing with this COVID pandemic. I've got friends who have been long-term paramedics uh, working in the Queensland Ambulance Service, and they tell me that they've never seen morale so low. They've never seen morale so low in the Queensland Ambulance Service service as it is under the current state Labor government. So there are real issues that need to be addressed. But Senator Colbeck did address those issues when he answered the question from Senator Smith. <laughs> Senator Colbeck, as well as referring to the national funding provided by the coalition government to our states in terms of public hospital services, also referred to the additional $6 billion in funding to support state and, health, state and territory health systems respond to COVID-19 outbreaks. So that funding has been there from the federal government, but the federal government doesn't run our public health system. Uh, those hospitals are actually run by our state governments. Second point uh, I'd like to make in terms of this contribution was, again, I think uh, Senator Polly was quite unfair to Senator Colbeck in terms of uh, his answer to her questions in relation to aged care and the rollout of the vaccine across our aged care services. And again, I want to reiterate these figures. These are important figures. The vaccination rate of workers in our aged care sectors continues to increase. It continues to increase. As at 31 <laughs> August, 82.9 per cent of aged care workers have now received one dose of the vaccine. Over 82 per cent, 82.9 per cent, have received at least uh, one dose. And over 61 per cent have received two doses. Over 61 per cent have received two doses. So the vaccination program is going well in terms of making sure our aged care workers are fully vaccinated. And I think also, and, and Minister Colbeck made this point as well, also it has to be recognised that the medical advice, the medical advice changed earlier this year, and the program had to pivot so that we weren't vaccinating aged care residents and aged care workers at the same time. Senator Scar, I'm just going to remind you that the taking note questions were moved by um, Senator Polly, but they were indeed um, questions asked by Senator Keneally and Senator Marielle Smith. Sure. Uh, the vaccination rollout. Well, curious. Senator Polly should move someone else's questions, but that's. Uh, uh, I'll, take that. Scar, I'll take that. On, uh, I'll, take that uh, I'll take this that. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. This is what happens at most take notes. I'll take. I'll take that on board. I think it's very disingenuous for Senator Keneally to have referred to the hospital ramping as if that oh, was thank something. Thank you, Senator Scar. Thank your you. time has expired. I'm now going to go to Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Pre uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator Colbeck's answers to these questions show that he just isn't up to it. He was smug. He was complacent. He was unaware or uninterested in key details. There was no sense of urgency, just a sense of entitlement. He was evasive. Uh, he was tricky about the politics. Now, you may be able to hear that there is an occasional small construction site outside of uh, level 22 of the building that I'm in, <laughs> and they've just, they've just recommenced uh, drilling. So hopefully they stop for the next uh, three and a half minutes uh, or whatever it is. Um, the, the, prob the, underlying problem, the underlying problem here, uh, Madam Deputy President, is that the Prime Minister made a bet that a four or six month delay in vaccine delivery wouldn't matter very much. It's been the most disastrous public policy failure in Australian history. The worst gamble uh, with the worst consequences. Now, it's not clear why the Prime Minister has failed so bad, whether it was his complacency whether he was influenced by the maddies on his back bench, the ultra-right conspiracy theorists, whether it was his own hostility to public health uh, and active government, or whether he just thought that somehow market forces might resolve the problem for him. 
You see, when, when Australians are in times of crisis, uh, in times of conflict or pandemic, natural disasters, flood or fire, or economic shock, they look to their Prime Minister. And what have they seen throughout the three years of this Prime Minister's term, whether it's been the bushfires, when he was trying to pretend that he wasn't on holidays in Hawaii, the blame shifting, the hyper-politicisation, the big press conferences and announcements with no delivery, the lectures, the bullying, the uh, conflict with his political opponents. They've seen all these things, but they've seen nothing of substance. And this Prime Minister only hopes that there'll still be people in the press gallery who are prepared to run his lines for him. Australia had a golden opportunity, our geographical isolation, our strong public health system, uh, the fact that we don't have, that we've got, you know, uh, uh, over 100 years of democratic governance. Who would have thought at the beginning of last year that the world would have been able to move so quickly to develop multiple vaccines uh, for the coronavirus? Uh, that what we, what we required was a government that was able to take the steps, keeping low to no COVID infections, delivering vaccines up to the 70 and 80 and 90 per cent that is required to keep the community safe and have, then have a safe staged opening up. Well, this Prime Minister has bungled that opportunity. He has squandered the opportunity that Australia has had. And as a consequence, uh, ordinary people are now paying the price. Long term, long term uh, problems for ordinary people. Nearly 1,300 cases in New South Wales today. Over 1,000 cases every day. Significant parts of the New South Wales population not vaccinated. Uh, significant vulnerable parts, particularly in regional Australia, not vaccinated. Our hospitals under pressure. Pressure on our ICU capability and endless lockdowns that the Prime Minister wants to blame on the state governments, rather than taking responsibility for the underlying reason for these lockdowns, which is, of course, the Prime Minister's failure to execute an effective vaccine strategy, the Prime Minister's failure to deliver vaccines for Australians to secure vaccine supply. Now, the, the people opposite, senators opposite, may choose to go on with the puerile politics of trying to defend this Prime Minister's abject failure. But we ought to be focused squarely upon it. Uh, we ought to fix it. This, this Minister, Senator Colbeck, this government, this Prime Minister are accountable for that failure and it's having enormously negative consequences, particularly in my home Thank state you, of Senator New South. Senator Ayres, your time has expired. Um, I believe Senator Roberts is seeking the call. Uh, Senator Sen Stewart. Deputy President, um, I was going to seek the call. Uh, yes, I to appreciate take, that. Sort of questions and in response to Sarah, have, Sen Senator Hanson Young. Um, you seeking the call, Senator Wish Wilson and uh, Senator Roberts, and you're both on remote. And I would have to say, uh, on balance, um, mostly this question goes to the Greens, and so. Uh, there's no other way to call it. I'm calling it for Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, but President. Uh, just a moment, um, Senator Roberts. Um, Senator Seawitz. And I was on my feet straight away to seek leave for Senator Wish Wilson, yep. but there's no one seeking leave for Senator Roberts, and that's my understanding the process that has to occur. Uh, no, it's not the process. It's um, senators seek leave in whatever way they can, and I've determined to give it to Senator Roberts. So I'm going to call Senator Roberts. If we have time. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I reference the Attorney General Senator Cash's response to my question on freedom to protest under the body of Australian law. Senator Cash fluffed on about what is in fact a basic element of our democracy. What she seems to have forgotten is that there is an overarching principle here. The right to freedom is a basic inalienable right that our body of law has been formed around. Our laws reflect our Christian heritage and should always do so. 
Our governing document, our national constitution, for instance, is, in its preamble references God. Without being presumptuous, and while I'm not a biblical scholar or a churchgoer, perhaps I should have asked myself earlier than this a fundamental question. What would God do? It turns out that the Bible is quite clear on the issue of freedom. From Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In this epistle, Paul was urging the new churches he had founded in Galatia to stand against those who were trying to subvert the freedom Christianity had given. Paul's epistle to the faithful in Galatia could have been written today. The battle for freedom and darkness exists now, as it did 2,000 years ago. We spent 2,000 years writing a body of law to implement Christian principles, including the right to freedom. These freedoms were first enshrined in the Magna Carta, Libertatum, literally the, quote, great charter of freedoms, that the head of the church at the time, the Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote in 1215. Our Attorney General has demonstrated not only a lack of understanding of man's laws, she has failed to demonstrate an understanding of God's laws. Being sworn in on the Bible is clearly no guarantee of believing a word of it. While eminent biblical scholars advise that the Bible is properly understood in context, how could the Attorney General not have looked this up at any time in the five months the Senator has occupied her role? Five months of widespread and sustained media and social media conversations around the right to protest and the Attorney General, the highest law officer in the land, was missing in action. Were well, you not curious about what the law actually said? Let me help out about that in the time remaining. The Magna Carta was written in response to King John exercising his powers using the principle of V et Volantis, which translates as force and will. The making of decisions that were above the law and then using force to create compliance. Much like parliaments around Australia are doing right now. Lord Denning described the Magna Carta as, quote, the greatest constitutional document of all times, the foundation of the freedom of the individual against the arbitrary authority of the despot. I looked through the Magna Carta and I couldn't see the COVID exemption that allows governments to destroy human rights and do whatever they want if they can get the population scared enough to accept it. Because, of course, there is no exemption afforded power, mad governments and unelected bureaucrats. In 1948, before the UN turned into the problem, not the solution, the United Nations Charter on Human Rights declared in 1948 a few things on freedom of protest that parliaments around Australia are conveniently ignoring. Article 19, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference. Article 20, everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. Article 21, everyone has a right to participate in the government of their country. This is what protesters are doing, participating in governance, exercising their right to free speech and to free association. That's the very definition of a protest. These are rights that Article 30 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights protects. It binds governments from breaching the declaration. It would appear that the Prime Minister and the Premiers are seeking to wind back our freedom, our right to freedom, to that which existed prior to the year 1215, to give themselves the powers that King John used force to exercise. Would the Attorney General like to take another run at explaining why parliaments in Australia are not in breach of the very principles that define our legal system, the Bible and the Magna Carta, reinforced by the much more recent United Nations Charter on Human Rights? And I wonder what Monica is thinking, languishing in jail, with the promise that she can get out, providing she renounces her membership of a political party. This is Australia 2021. Disgrace. We need our freedoms back. And we need an Attorney General who understands the basics on which our freedoms are based. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Senator Roberts. And I uh, forgot to move um, the motion as moved by Senator Polly to take note of answer, so I'm going to do that now. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Polly to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, against, no. Thank you. Um, that now concludes the business. We'll now move to uh, tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Urquhart.
Thank you, Madam Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, I present the report of the Committee on Activating Greater Trade and Investment with Pacific Island Countries, and I move that the Senate takes note of the report. And I understand that Senator McCarthy wishes to speak to this report. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, uh, I'm pleased to see the report entitled One Region, One Family, One Future, Deepening Relations with the Pacific Nations Through Trade. The global coronavirus pandemic has closed borders across the Pacific region since early 2020 and subsequently disrupted tourism, trade and investments between Australia and our Pacific Island neighbours. Unsurprisingly, the measures aimed at protecting public health from the worst of the coronavirus pandemic may have also had a devastating economic impact on many Pacific Island countries, especially those reliant on international tourism or receiving remittances from their hard-working seasonal workers employed across Australia. Such has been the case here in the Northern Territory, which faced severe seasonal worker shortages for the Mango 2020 season. We were pleased to welcome 160 workers from Vanuatu under a pilot program in late 2020, which was mutually beneficial to the NT Mango industry and also helping the struggling Vanuatu economy. High Commissioner of Vanuatu, His Excellency, Mr. Samson Bilbilfair told the committee, we really welcome Australia's move with the pilot program to bring in workers from Vanuatu to the Northern Territory, because I think from that, we will be able to learn ways that under COVID-19, we can bring our seasonal workers back into our country. We look forward to Australia sharing the learnings out of the Northern Territory on how it goes with the 160 or 170 workers there. Of course, the committee acknowledged the need for regulation of employers and training of workers to address their vulnerability to worker exploitation. Concerns were raised regarding lack of payment or payment of less than the minimum wage, long hours of work in extreme heat conditions, exceeding laws on maximum work hours, substandard and overcrowded accommodation, exploitation by migration agents through misrepresentation and deduction of large sums from wages and employers violating rights to freedom of association and collective bargaining by banning union membership. These concerns are reflected in the report's recommendations, which recognises the need for improved regulatory and administrative processes, particularly access to superannuation. This report outlines the significant role the Australian economy can play in the region through improved and more open trade relations with Pacific Island countries. Many of these islands are ranked in the top 10 most remote economies as measured by their distance from global markets. Some islands are also among the smallest populations and poorest nations in the world too. The committee recognises the devastating economic impact of the coronavirus travel restrictions due to the growing importance of labour mobility schemes and remittances being sent back home to many families and communities across the Pacific. This highlights the need, in accordance with relevant public health advice and ongoing vaccination programs, for developing a safe travel bubble between Australia and those Pacific Island countries who are willing to participate. When safe to do so, this travel bubble will not only support Australia's trade and investment ties with the Pacific, but also prove critical to supporting Pacific employees and their communities back on their home islands, as well as the many farms and regional businesses needing their skills and hard work. The committee supported the need for creating the job creating investment to improve the Pacific Islands' lagging infrastructure. Much will be gained by Australia and the Pacific Nations embracing the Pacific Quality Infrastructure Initiative to support the delivery of better quality infrastructure and assist with further economic development. After 56 submissions, Madam Deputy President, and eight public hearings, 
including round tables with the diplomatic representatives of Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, New Caledonia, New Zealand, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea and Kiribati, and also with many business people trading in the Pacific region, this report looked for solutions to the many challenges facing the Pacific. I acknowledge in particular the Chair of the JSC FADT, Senator David Fawcett, and Chair of the Subcommittee, Mr Ted O'Brien MP. But I also acknowledge all committee members, in particular my Labor colleague, Senator Sheldon, who worked very closely with me on this inquiry. Among the many recommendations aimed squarely at helping activate trade with the Pacific include the report supports the implementation of the Pacific Agreement on Closer Economic Relations, PACER Plus, with Pacific Island countries to support long-term economic development, deeper security cooperation, and closer personal and business connections between Australians and Pacific Islanders. Members also want the Australian Government to forge closer economic ties with two key nations outside of PACER Plus in Papua New Guinea and Fiji. The report calls on pursuing measures to develop a regional Pacific standard with Australian expertise and support to assist both Australian and Pacific exporters to bolster their trade opportunities and gain easier access to larger markets. Australia focusing its aid for trade programs in the Pacific on building human resource, educational and institutional capacity in the Pacific Island countries to reform national economic and trade policies, improve trade facilitation processes and build trade enhancing solutions. Investigating the potential for improving infrastructure and its maintenance to encourage increased air and sea links between Australia and the Pacific. Reviewing existing labour mobility arrangements, including the Seasonal Worker Program and the Pacific Labour Scheme for the thousands of workers from the Pacific region, much of which should be aimed at improving regulatory and administrative processes, improving working conditions, including improved monitoring and enforcement activity and compliance, with relevant provisions on workers' entitlements. Improving workers' access to superannuation by making the transfer of funds into workers' superannuation accounts in the Pacific easier and faster. Improving workers' access to healthcare and insurance while on assignment in Australia. Improving communication and access to information on workers' rights. Incorporating industry-led third-party audited certifications such as Bear Farms, which is used in the horticultural industry to help oversee the ethical treatment of Pacific Island workers. A special mention must also go to the diplomatic and government representatives of Pacific Island countries who attended in person and by teleconference a parliamentary roundtable in Canberra, and they shared their invaluable insights on the challenges faced by communities on their home islands from the pandemic but also the many opportunities ahead. May I also add our thanks to the hardworking Secretariat of the Trade Subcommittee. Thank each and every one of you for the work you've done to assist the senators and members uh, in putting, putting forward this trade report. One region, one family, one future, deepening relations with the Pacific nations through trade. I commend the report to the Senate and Madam Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Minister. Oh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I present the government's response to the report of the Education Employment References Committee on its inquiry into the regulation of the relationship between car manufacturers and car dealers in Australia and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. As Senator Pratt. I'm seeking to speak on uh, the tabling of that report. Yes. Um, so it has been some time since our committee undertook that inquiry, uh, but it was a really important one. And the 
government has taken some steps to addressing some of the issues we raised. I have to say, Australia doesn't quite feel like itself anymore now that Holden cars and other Australian manufactured cars are disappearing from our roads. Uh, it's been some years now since the car manufacturing industry stopped production in Australia, and I still lament the day that that, now that that has happened. And I truly wish the current government had done more at the time to ensure that Australia continued with a viable manufacturing car manufacturing industry. However, here we are now today uh, with a new landscape uh, that was existed before in terms of vehicle imports and, and uh, retailers selling those cars. But now that Australian manufacturer has pretty much disappeared, it really brings to light the power dynamics between car dealers and retailers compared to the bargaining power that the manufacturers have over them. So I want to reflect briefly on some of the responses of the government to our recommendations. The ACCC, we had asked the ACCC expedite investigations into examining GM Holden and to provide public updates on that investigation and similar investigations into the relationship between manufacturers and car dealers into the future. Now, of course, the government has simply noted this, and I think that's acceptable in the context, of course, that the ACCC is an in independent statutory organisation. Uh, but I, in that context, really want to call on the ACCC to remind them about what has already happened in this space and that, indeed, consumers can be vulnerable to the fact that they have uh, Holden cars, many of which are still under warranty, that are driving on Australian roads, and that the warranty obligations have now been subcontracted or remain with different dealers. Um, but I'm concerned that because they've now got no longer got a vested interest in their ongoing business in Australia, it's incredibly important that Australian consumers got what they paid for when they've bought a Holden car in recent years. In that context, we also recommended that the ACCC ensure that Holden is meeting its obligations to Holden vehicle owners in relation to warranties, recalls, technical support and access to parts. And I would be uh, uh, I'm very concerned to ensure that that is the case. I know that state and territory regulators in this space, because the ACCC of course gets many of its powers uh, from the states, that they are indeed considering to ensure that we're able to strengthen that compliance and enforcement uh, in that area. The government announced uh, automotive reforms back in March of 2021, including um, uh, back in 2021 in relation to manufacturers' agents and new vehicle sales, and they took effect back in July. And this is in line with what the committee recommended in relation to increased fines, mandatory principles, and protection of dealers. Uh, uh, and opera who are operating as manufacturers' agents. Uh, we further made a recommendation in terms of mandatory best practice principles for the reimbursement of all reasonable expenses incurred in relation to warranty and recall work, including expenses associated with the diagnosis, administration of claims and claim audits. And again, this points to uh, a significant power imbalance between dealers, car re retailers and the manufacturers and indeed customers. Because in order to meet the consumer law, retailers, of course, have to ensure that they're providing a reasonable consumer guarantee. But what is happening is that the manufacturers of those goods who are supposed to meet what's in that guarantee are 
in many cases passing the cost and expense of meeting the failure of their products back on to the dealers who, who they licensed to sell those vehicles. It needs to be very clear that the consumer guarantee and a failure of a product that's sold is the manufacturer's responsibility. And the car manufacturers that license our suppliers here need to do a better job. They need to do, do a better job. Uh, and I'm pleased that in this context, consumer affairs ministers have agreed to look at uh, options to prohibit manufacturers from failing to indemnify suppliers and prohibit retribution by manufacturers against suppliers who seek indemnification from the work that they have had to do. It has been of disgust to me in learning throughout the course of this inquiry about the extent to which car manufacturers were pushing their liabilities on to dealers. And in that context, uh, it's significant uh, that th they have been pushing that uh, liability onto dealers because of the lack of uh, the power imbalance. And really, this highlighted a need for mandatory binding, binding arbitration to resolve disputes, which is what the committee recommended. We were very pleased to find that the government has supported this in principle, and I look forward to working with. Uh, vehicle dealers in the future to ensure that the government makes good progress on this commitment. It is simply unreasonable uh, that the importer has all the power and the small business or even larger business owners can be left completely stranded after in good faith they have made the investments in their dealership yards etc. Uh, in order to meet their obligations, only to find that the rug is pulled out from underneath them by a large manufacturer. And we've seen this happen time and time again in the course of the evidence that was given to us in, in the inquiry. I note lastly the, recommendation, the response of the government to our recommendation in relation to the Small Business and Family on Enterprise Ombudsman. And I look forward to following that up with them. But in closing, I want to say, uh, given the short amount of time that is left, uh, that it was not easy for car dealers to come forward to talk to us about the disadvantage they felt because they felt, even in giving evidence, that they could be punished by these large manufacturers in future contract negotiations. Uh, Although we tried very hard to soothe them with the protections of the parliament in terms of giving evidence, they felt very vulnerable uh, in terms of being able to do that. So I really want to pay tribute to the brave small businesses that did speak up and worked together in order to raise their concerns before our committee. And I would encu encourage this kind of engagement uh, from them in the future. And I want to say thanks to Senator McGrath as Deputy Chair of the Committee, who um, is unfortunately leaving the Committee now and will be replaced by Senator Canavan. Um, Senator Pratt, are you seeking to leave to continue your remarks? Yes, remote? I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is Thank leave you. granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Senators, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on pages 7 to 9 of the notice paper. Um, yes, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I take note of documents uh, on page 7, document 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is Is leave granted? Is leave granted? I'll give it to myself if no one else will. <laughs> Leave's granted. Thank you. Um, Madam Deputy Chair, would you like me? To, uh, sorry, Acting Deputy Chair, would you like me to keep going on the pages, or do you want to deal with each page separately? Um, 
case others I, have. I can see Senator Seawick's on okay, feet, so we might go to Senator Seawick. Could I uh, seek leave to take note of, uh, take note of items seven and eight on page seven and seek leave to continue my remarks? Is leave granted? Yes. Leave is granted. Thank you. I call Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank uh, you. We move on to page eight. Yes, thank you. Um, can I take note of documents 14 and 16 on page eight and seek leave to continue my remarks? Is leave granted? Yes. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. Um, could I take note of items 17 and 18 on page eight and seek leave to continue my remarks? And is leave granted? Yes. Leave is granted. I think we have one on page nine. Is there anyone seeking to note that? Thank you. Um, we'll move on to uh, further consideration of reports and responses. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I might just deal with number four at the moment, and I take note of that. And I understand Senator Wong would like to speak to that document. Thank you. Take note of. Uh, num sorry, committee. Report on treaties number four and Senator on page nine, and Senator Wong wishes to speak to that document. Um, I call Senator Wong. Um, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Thank you to Senator Erka for making sure I got the call. I appreciate that. Uh, I do wish to take note of the report by the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, or J. Scott, on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And there are particular aspects of the report I would like the Senate to note, and they are the committee's considerations and recommendations in relation to the situation in Myanmar, which of course would be a party to the ASEP as an ASEAN member state. So at the outset, I want to reiterate Labor's view that the 1st of February coup against the democratically elected government of Myanmar by the Tatmadaw was a direct attack against Myanmar's ongoing democratic transition. And I reiterate my concern and frustration that the Morrison-Joyce government has not taken sufficient action to put pressure on the leaders of the coup. Uh, Labor immediately condemned the coup and the subsequent violent crackdown against peaceful protesters across the country in which over a thousand innocent civilians died. On the 2nd of February, we called on the government to review Australia's defence cooperation with the Tatmadaw and other bilateral cooperation and to consider implementing targeted sanctions against those responsible for the coup. Unfortunately, it took more than a month for this government to suspend military cooperation with the Tatmadaw, although, of course, the opposition welcomed this decision when it was finally made. In April, we called on the government to provide visa pathways for at-risk Myanmar nationals so they could remain in Australia. And once again, about a month later, the government said that those on temporary visas could apply to extend their stay. But now seven months have passed since the coup and the Morrison-Joyce government has still not implemented any additional targeted sanctions against those responsible for the coup and human rights abuses in Myanmar. And this is despite many of our like-minded partners taking strong action. The European Union has sanctioned 43 individuals and six entities. The US has sanctioned over 50 individuals and 20 entities. The United Kingdom has sanctioned the entire ruling state administrative council, as well as other Tatmadaw linked companies. And Canada has sanctioned 25 individuals and 10 entities. And the government's inaction is despite the government chaired Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Trade, recommending in June that sanctions against the Tatmadaw Tapandor should be put in place. And last week's J. Scott, whose report we are discussing today, embarrassingly having to remind the Morrison-Joyce government once again of the need to act. So we have a government-chaired parliamentary committee reminding the government to follow through on a recommendation of another government-chaired parliamentary committee to do something the government should have done months ago. One of the three recommendations of this Joe Scott report was that the Morrison-Joyce government continue to pursue the restor restoration of civilian democratic rule in Myanmar as a foreign policy priority and considers making a declaration to this effect at the time of ratification. So they've had a lot of reminders to do their job. Labor members of the committee also noted that not only has the Morrison-Joyce government failed to act on the recommendation from the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Trade, 
a committee that they lead to enact standalone targeted sanctions legislation to address human rights violation and violations and corruption, similar to the United States Magnitsky Act. In the meantime, Labor members of the committee have again called on the government to, under existing mechanisms, sanction additional senior members in the Tatmadaw and Tatmadaw-linked entities who have directly played a role in the overthrow of democracy and the subsequent violent suppression of protests. Indeed, the J. Scott as a whole supported Labor's view in this report that submissions highlighted the importance of enacting Magnitsky-style laws and the relevance of these laws in responding to the situation in Myanmar. So it isn't just Labor calling for the Morrison Joyce government to show more leadership in response to the coup in Myanmar, although we have done so for this from the start. It is also members of the government themselves, members of the Morrison Joyce government being the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister to take action. And the reason is simple. The Morrison Joyce's government, Morrison Joyce government's refusal to implement any sanctions since the coup sends precisely the wrong message that Australia doesn't care, that we're mere bystanders to democratic backsliding in our region. And unfortunately, that is the approach Mr Morrison takes to everything. Dodge responsibility and only ever do too little too late. And it's the approach he's taken to serious issues of diplomacy and leadership in our region. I say to the Senate, it's past time for Mr Morrison and Senator Payne to act in support of Myanmar's democracy, to implement targeted sanctions and support the people and the democracy of Myanmar. And I seek leave to continue my report. Thank you, Senator so, uh, Wong. Uh, I note um, Senator Seawitz seeking the call. Uh, yes, I am. I seek leave to take note of report two, the Economics References Committee, the Greenfields Cash Cows Regulation of Foreign Investments in Australia report. And I understand that Senator Wish Wilson would like to speak to it. I call Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, yes, I, I'd like to take note of this uh, very important report, which I, I know you personally were, were involved in this inquiry. Um, the Greens initiated this inquiry in uh, late 2019. Uh, foreign investment in this country is a significant matter of public interest. Uh, everywhere I go in my state of Tasmania, I've got someone in my year complaining about foreign investment. Now, I know this country was built on foreign investment and will continue to be built on foreign investment. And it's very important that we get the settings in our foreign investment laws right, especially our FERB or Foreign Investment Review Board approvals. Um, we're never going to have public confidence uh, in our laws while they fail to operate uh, transparently uh, and effectively and give that public confidence. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I will certainly want to start by thanking the committee uh, for their great work and, and for an excellent uh, report, uh, particularly Fiona Allen, who, uh, who wrote this report. Um, there's a lot of good information in the report. And the, the report, some of the language is quite scathing towards the Treasury, the lack of cooperation by some uh, in the government in relation to this inquiry. Um, and I think it's, it's quite concerning uh, that in, in an area like foreign investment um, around trade and treaties, uh, we're not getting full cooperation from the government. Uh, the Greens made substantial uh, contributions throughout the free trade debate in this place in the recent decade, especially around a number of tra uh, free trade deals that were being signed on by uh, the Abbott government uh, and the Morrison government, because we were concerned about uh, limits on our sovereignty, especially as a parliament. And it turns out that some of the required changes to our foreign investment uh, approvals are hamstrung by this myriad uh, of free trade deals or so-called free trade deals that we've signed with these countries. Um, I would like to uh, say that um, while the report, I think, has got some excellent content uh, and we took significant witness evidence and we had some fantastic case studies, I know you, Acting Deputy President, spent a lot of time looking at Alinta, the acquisition of Alinta, and certainly three out of the six case studies the committee looked at were Tasmanian acquisitions. Um, and I was very pleased uh, with the way that was handled. Um, the Greens did make um, substantial additional comments to the report, uh, not a dissenting report, but additional comments. Um, we called it in the dark. 
There's four key recommendations we would like to have seen the committee uh, recommend, uh, and the Greens will continue to push for those recommendations. Um, the first one really was that uh, there's kind of no point in having uh, conditions that are voluntary. When a foreign investor signs up to buy an Australian asset, especially an iconic Australian business, and they make undertakings to the Treasurer, and therefore by default the Australian people at the time, they should be required to meet those undertakings, especially in the case of Tasmania with Van Derry, uh, the country's most iconic dairy, uh, where a foreign investor outbid a local consortium by making a series of undertakings that were never met. Uh, that's got to end, especially if we want to uh, re-establish public confidence in our foreign investment laws. Um, we also believe that uh, there should be no reason that the Treasurer should not publish their, their reasons, unless there's a national security issue, uh, for giving foreign investment approval. So we have, um, you know, we have made a recommendation there that uh, exemption certificates should be made public uh, and that there should be no reason at all why considering what a massive matter of public interest is, that that kind of information is not uh, required. We also believe that money laundering is a significant problem in this country. Australians, be they buying rural properties or be they buying investment properties, are often competing against money launderers for proceeds from illicit crime. And one of the case studies the committee looked at was uh, front page Peter Dutton, uh, Mr Peter Dutton in the other place, talking about how he'd busted a Chinese money laundering syndicate. Well, it was lucky for us that the Chinese government gave us that information. Otherwise, we would never have even known that that had occurred. We just don't have the powers in place or the resources to detect illicit funds. So uh, we believe that that needs to change. We need a beneficial ownership register so we know who owns these businesses, who's buying what, and we need to remove exemptions under anti-money laundering laws that allow uh, service providers to get away without providing monitoring requirements to regulators. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? I seek uh, leave to continue my remarks. Thank you leave for prompting me. Thank you. Uh, Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I take note of document 1, 3 and 8 on page 9, and if I could advise you that Senator Sheldon wishes to speak to uh, document, uh, sorry, committee report 1 and 3 on that page. Uh, I call Senator um, Tony Sheldon, perhaps just to speak initially on um, matter number 1, Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, just make sure of this. So on the temporary migration report, um, the Select Committee on Temporary Migration uh, commended the, and I want to commend the work of the committee, particularly that of its chair, Senator Raf Ciccone, and his dedicated and tireless efforts through the course of this inquiry, as well as that of my colleagues, Senator Jess Walsh. As Senator Giacconi noted yesterday, the COVID-19 pandemic and its closure of international borders exposed a deep dependency of our economy on of temporary migration. We had the second largest temporary migration workforce in the OECD before the pandemic. But alongside that came rampant exploitation and wage theft. This is what made worse or even abled by the precarious nature of the workers' existence. The vulnerability has been an outcome of this temporary status. The report exposed a system that is broken and failing to deliver what it must, a system in desperate need of reform. The committee heard about all kinds of ways temporary migrant workers were being exploited, everything from underpayments, unfair deductions, threats to have a person's visa cancelled, unsafe conditions, unpaid training, and withholding a visa, hold of passports and many other examples. And even in extreme examples, practices such as human trafficking, slavery, and slavery-like practices such as forced labour and debt bondage. The inquiry heard devastating evidence such as that of a man, a qualified welder, with years of experience in his home country. No matter how hard he worked, his employer made him do more, leaving little time for lunch or even bathroom breaks. He had to sacrifice family time, and because of this, his onerous work hours, he had little opportunity for English language study, even though his permanent resident application required an acceptable level of English. 
was also when was only when we he overheard native born co workers wondering how their boss could pay the man and other migrant workers with their excessive overtime penalty rates that he realized he was being ripped off. Acting to be president, there needs to be a comprehensive review of Australia's visa system. That it, and that's what's report envisages. An investigation by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age into migrant worker abuses in the Australian meat industry, published in recent days, has uncovered shocking evidence of the scale of problems that exist. The headline alone in today's devastating article tells you everything you need to know about how broken the system is. It reads, Chinese meat workers bear the scars of mistreatment in Australia's Visa factories. It tells the story of a Chinese meat worker named Wang who had a tank of near boiling water spill on him while he was working on a cow carcass at Tees Australia Bill Awila Abattoir in Queensland. He turned up for work as usual the next day despite needing medical attention because he did not want to endanger his permanent residency chances. It was a bad gamble months later and still in pain. He was out of a job anyway and his hope of a better life in Australia was in ruins. He told the journalist, such things happened to me, but would not happen to local people. Why? Because we want to stay in Australia. We want to have long time visas. If we further said, if you are an Australian local people, you don't have to worry about this. You have equal opposition with the owner like anyone else. We are poor people. We have no power when we talk with factory. Now, the newspaper investigation also covered a Chinese meat worker at a Victorian abattoir who was not taken to hospital after being concussed at work. An Argentinian at the same meat works being forced to turn up for work before being vaccinated for Q fever, contrary to the Victorian Health Department recommendations. A Taiwanese abattoir worker ordered to return to work while he was bleeding from the mouth from an injury so severe he would later need surgery. The man was not paid sick leave tells of a migrant abattoir worker from Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, and have, having borrowed money or sold possessions, all those workers from those states, to pay recruitment syndicates $70,000 or more to secure a job after being promised it would be a permanent residence, lead to permanent residency. The role of the temporary migration is an incredibly important role, and the visa isn't a particularly important um, responsibility for this government to oversight. The role of temporary migration of filling areas where Aussies cannot quickly enough meet demand remains during this time of unprecedented economic challenge. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. And just for the record, let's be clear that you were speaking to item three in committee reports, temporary migration select committee report. Uh, and Senator Sheldon, do you seek leave to continue your remarks? Uh, I do, thank you. And is leave granted? Yes, thank you. Uh, Senator Sheldon, um, the Whip, Senator Urquhart, indicated you also wish to make a contribution on item number one, Road Safety Joint Select Committee Report Improving Safety into Australia Government Response. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. I'll give you the call, Senator Sheldon. Well, I rise to speak on the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Reference Committee Report importance of a viable, safe, sustainable and efficient road transport industry. I'd like to thank the committee again for the report and to thank its chair, Senator Glenn Stirl, uh, in particular. Transport workers have, have been the backbone of Australia's response to the pandemic. They've kept supply chains moving through lockdowns, travel restrictions and international border closures. Like other essential workers in aged care, in the health system, in the disability sector, in retail, truck drivers continue to be undervalued and overworked, which is why it's so disgraceful that Toll has chosen now, under the cover of the pandemic, to launch an attack on the paying conditions that owner drivers have built up over decades. Toll has been hard at work eroding these conditions across the country. The New South Wales Queensland branch of the TWU has been forced to take Toll to court over $52 million in unpaid late fees to owner drivers. The fees relate to over 5,000 individual late payments over the Christmas period last year. New South Wales and Queensland State Secretary of the Transport Workers Union, Richard Olson, said 
Drivers were going above and beyond to meet the highest demand that they have ever faced Christmas during a pandemic. And the Christmas period is when they were ripped off. These owner drivers are small business owners, usually just one person with one truck, and all they're asking for is to be paid by toll on time. He said, owner drivers operate in wafer thin margins. It is a disgrace they are forced to struggle with cash flow while their hard work has achieved record profits for the likes of Amazon, whose goods they transport through its contracts with toll. Clearly, at the risk of their own health, they had continued to work across, across state borders and work across areas of concern, whilst complying with high safety standards. But Toll, another, its business had a different approach. Paul, an owner driver in New South Wales, had to say, say this about Toll's behaviour. We sat on a Zoom with Toll where they promised no redundancies, no short shifts, and no closures if workers agreed to be paid every two weeks instead of every week. Three weeks later, they were down in Wollongong trying to close three depots and outsource the work. What's the point of a legal agreement if Toll aren't going to uphold their end of the deal? In Queensland, Toll has scrapped, uh, scrapped the owner-driver agreements they had in place since 2000, which paid hourly rates for work completed. They've been replaced with inferior contracts, under which drivers are paid a daily retainer and only paid more if they manage to exceed a benchmark set for them each day. 80% of drivers aren't meeting that benchmark. And this works out to be an effective $500 a week paid cut on average. So not only have drivers been, have seen a massive pay cut, but this new payment model pushes owner drivers to drive faster and make more deliveries to be able to pay their mortgages and put food on the table. May even put Uber to shame, heaven forbid. Owner drivers must pay the, for the upkeep and maintenance of their own trucks. They deserve the certainty of at least a consistent, reliable payment for their work. Alan, an owner driver at Toll said, drivers have to pay the mortgage and feed the family. You have to make those payments first. Then if you are short, you have to make the money go forward enough for maintenance of the truck. Everyone who uses the road is less safe when owner drivers are undercut and shortchanged. A quote from the Queensland branch of the TWU. Despite a boom in transport throughout the pandemic, Toll is trying to cut its own labour cost and compete, but this is clearly not the answer. When standards are dragged down in trucking, Australia's deadliest, deadliest industry, people die. Already more than 200 people have been killed in truck crashes this year alone. Bill, another owner driver from Toll, described his harrowing circumstance, along with a number of others, including the fact that visa holders were too scared to speak out because of fear of jeopardy of losing their job when working for subcontracting companies, not paid for overtime, underpaid on the minimum wage. So these are critical, critically important areas that Toll needs to get its act together. It needs to start turning around and treating owner drivers and contracting workers um, a proper wage and an appropriate arrangement. And this government should stop sitting on its hands. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Sheldon. And do you seek leave to continue your remarks? I do, thank you. Is leave granted? Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm now on page 10. Uh, if I can take note of documents 15, 17, 19, 20, 21. And would you like me to move on to the Auditor General's report? Uh, we might just wait and case Okay, Senator and I'll seek leave to continue my remarks on those. Thank you very much, Senator Urquhart. Senator Seawitt, nothing from you? Okay, well, we will proceed then to Auditor General's reports. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Urquhart. If I could take note of document uh, the Auditor General report number one on page 10 and number three on page 11 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, I believe that completes the Senate's consideration of committee reports, government responses and Auditor General reports. Um, ministerial statements. Uh, are there any ministerial statements? I table a document relating Senator to the McKenzie. Or or, sorry, Chair. I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Urban Congestion Fund.
Are there no are there any further statements, Minister? No. Senator Senator Seawitt. On the I seek leave to take note of that document and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Corporations Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Amendment Bill 2021 for, con for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance, in accordance with Standing Order um, 115 brackets 3, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 14th of October 2021. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill of 2021 without amendment. Clark. We so the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of general business. Call the clerk. General Business Notice Number 1240, standing in the name of Senator Seawitt in relation to COVID-19 and income support. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate um, does uh, note, oh, sorry, I move the, the um, motion um, as the clerk uh, just read out. Um, and that motion notes that the Morrison government has abandoned people in lockdown on income support payments and calls on the government to reinstate the coronavirus supplement to ensure people are supported to stay safe at home. And the reason I'm moving this is to ensure that this place debates and make sure they understand that people on income support, 90 per cent of people on income support in those areas currently in lockdown in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT are not receiving any additional payments. And the Greens believe that is simply unfair, it's unconscionable, and it actually is contrary to sensible public health decision making in that if people can't get enough financial support to be able to put food on the table, to pay for a roof over their head, to pay for essential medications. They are going to go out and try and find work. It often will be frontline work that, is ex that could expose them to unhealthy situations, particularly if they're having to keep searching and keep going out for that work. It means that they are not staying home, which they're being asked to do. It means they are forced to go out in unsafe situations, potentially bringing COVID home to their families, because they are not receiving an income that is adequate to be able to live above the poverty line and put food on the table. I'd like to quote from an article from, member, from people from the Anti-Poverty Centre and also that's Jay Coonan and Kristen O'Connell and Jeremy Paxton, who's volunteers with the Australian Unemployed Workers Union. People who have deep experience, lived experience, actually trying to survive an income support, 
working and advocating for people on income support and working very closely and having experienced, lived experience of what it's like to survive when you're unemployed, trying to look for work, trying to deal with mutual obligations um, on a payment that is below the poverty line. And they make the point. It's an article today in the Guardian. Oh, yesterday, I beg your pardon, in the Guardian. They say it's abundantly clear shutting down the economy hurts the poorest most. Lockdowns are necessary, but the social crisis they create are optional. I couldn't agree more. Because by not ensuring that those people on the low payment of JobSeeker, for example, just $44 a day, are living way below the poverty line, and they are not getting a cent of support if they were unlucky enough to be able to only find less than eight hours work. I'll point out that people who have lost more than 20 hours work get $750 a week for a disaster payment, yet somebody who has not been able to find work Remembering that structural unemployment is the heart, the basis on which our economy is, uh, works and operates, so those people that are unemployed who haven't been able to find work are left to try and live on $315 a week. Can you see the inequality there straight up? Can you see why they're saying that inequality that the COVID crisis is deepening inequality, when the government thinks that it's OK for billionaires, for big business, who have claimed the, the JobKeeper payment think it's, and made huge profits, oh, we calculated wrongly when we put in our application. Get lots of money, start paying dividends to the shareholders, Bonuses to their executives? Oh, they've done a good job. They've got a job keeper. It's okay for them to keep the millions and millions and millions that they've been paid out of job keeper. But firstly, the government then chases people that are on income support and may have received job keeper as well. Start chasing them for debts, but you don't chase the billionaires for the money that they've claimed that turns out they made a mistake, but worse than that, or just as bad as that, I should say, is that what we see now is a deliberate choice by government to let those rich people keep the money they've got from the system, but they won't support people who are trying to survive in lockdown to help them keep safe as part of a public health message, they won't pay them an additional payment. No, no, you stay on $315 a week. You try and make ends meet. You try and keep a roof over your head. And what do you think is going to happen when, they, when people lose that accommodation? Or they're forced to share other accommodation, which is also extremely uh, unhealthy in the current lockdown circumstances. Oh no, we're not going to give those people any support. The 90 per cent of people that are trying to struggle already in normal circumstances, we know it's really people can't survive, that they're living in poverty on $44 a day. But during lockdown, when it's more expensive, as the article from um, the Unemployed Workers' Union and Anti-Poverty Centre point out, it's much harder during lockdown because all the cheap brands go, for example. Or you get home delivery. And people trying to survive on $44 a day, believe me, every single cent counts. So they can't afford to get groceries delivered. They don't have any savings that they can use. They have nothing because you cannot save when you're trying to survive on $44 a day. So now they're in lockdown, not 
being able to afford to get groceries delivered, having to go and find groceries, again exposing themselves to unhealthy situations. It's no wonder we're seeing the demand on emergency food services escalate dramatically, phone calls es escalate dramatically, because it's the charities that are picking up the pieces because the government would prefer for billionaires and millionaires and big business to keep the money that they mistakenly claim through JobKeeper than actually put money in and bring back the coronavirus supplement. Now, the, the government knew, they knew that the coronavirus supplement helped so many people during the initial lockdown. They know very well, and ACOS has pointed it out very clearly, because they talk to their members, their, their members' members, the people, their members, the people that, that are supported through the services that ACOS, because ACOS is a peak organisation. And we heard, and I've read out here in this place on numerous occasions, what the corona supplement meant to people. It meant that they didn't have to go out in difficult situations. It meant that they could, in fact, surprise, surprise, eat three meals a day, that they could pay their utility bills, that they could keep a roof over their head, that they could buy the medications that they need. It made them much safer and helped us get through lock the initial lockdown. But how are those people going to survive because we know that we're not going to come that New South Wales and Victoria they've just extended the lockdown we know it's going to take quite a number of months now and they are still going to be struggling to survive in lockdown in unsafe situations in under the poverty line now the government's made a choice and I've said this before they have made a political choice to keep people in poverty you can take no other, you can look at you can take no other alternative view. They have made a choice that people who are trying to survive on job seeker should be kept below the poverty line, should be made to struggle even more in difficult circumstances. It is a very well known fact, and we hear it every day, that lockdown is impacting on people's mental health. We know that living in poverty impacts on people's mental health. Now, if you can, if you're lucky enough to be able to find a mental health specialist, or worker, or carer, that costs you money. We already know that that the that the mental health professionals are booked out months and months ahead, and that people are struggling to find mental health support. So if you're dealing with lockdown already and you're dealing with lockdown in poverty, what do you think that is doing to people's mental health? It is having very significant impacts on their mental health. They cannot afford to find mental health support. So we are escalating the mental health crisis in this country for those that are currently on income support living in poverty. Shame on this government. The coronavirus supplement helped people enormously. It was the right thing to do. It showed that the government understood that you couldn't live in poverty in lockdown. So what the government's done now is chosen to give some people additional money so that they're not living in poverty during lockdown, but not to give the people that are already condemned to poverty additional support so they don't have to live in poverty. We now have two systems here. We have the system where we'll reward and we'll support, quite rightly, people that were working before to keep them out of poverty, but we won't actually support those who cannot find work will keep them living in poverty. Hence our very strong assertion that the government's approach will escalate inequality in this country.
The Anti-Poverty Centre, in the article published yesterday, said and made the, the point, with cheap goods flying off supermarket shelves, more of us are confronted with the choice of skipping meals, falling behind on bills or paying rent. Surviving on JobSeeker is not COVID safe. Buying the essentials forces us to leave home. Wealthy people get groceries delivered and poor people get COVID exposure. The nightmare scenario is transmission at a food bank. We are, as we battle Delta, they go on, we need payments that ensure everyone, especially unemployed people, can afford to stay home safely, even as living costs go up. We need to make sure families feeling the pressure of being cooped up together don't experience unnecessary financial stress. They also point out that that can contribute to further uh, domestic and family violence because of you creating a pressure cooker for these families. Poverty traps, they go on, poverty also traps us in unemployment. Even frontline workers, even the frontline workers we most need as our health system struggles. If, if they go on, as COVID spreads further into our communities, so does inequality. To solve both problems, we need to protect everybody. I absolutely agree. That is why we need additional payments to those people on income support. We need to bring back the coronavirus supplement. So, in fact, we are again all in this together because at the moment we are not. Uh, thank you, Senator Seward. And I might note that that appears it might be your final contribution in the Senate. And I thank you for your 16 years of dedicated service to this parliament and the Australian people as a senator for the Greens party. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Small. Acting Deputy President, you are indeed correct. And shortly, both Senator Seward and I will be leaving this place bound for the airport and heading home to Western Australia after some five weeks here in the capital. And it is the 5,908th day that Senator Seward has represented the state that I also call home. So I wanted to acknowledge that at the start. But uh, turning to the matter at hand, the Morrison government uh, remains today just as committed to protecting lives and livelihoods as at the onset of the pandemic. Indeed, we remain focused on supporting all Australians as we reopen the economy because uh, this is a government that rejects the assertion um, that we do have two streams here in Australia. With respect to the coronavirus supplement and JobKeeper, the situation was very different in this country at the onset of the pandemic. We were facing materially different circumstances in that this was a government that made decisions with very limited information. A once-in-a-century pandemic uh, was afflicting us and indeed the rest of the world, and that ne by necessity means that we made different decisions. As more information has come to hand through the pandemic, we have altered the government's policy positions, not only with respect to social uh, security payments, but also more broadly in terms of our stewardship of the Australian economy. That is, I think, what responsible government is, because fundamentally every dollar that you ask us to give away, Senator Seward, has to be taken from someone that earned it. So when the Morrison government did in fact introduce those coronavirus supplements last year, we were facing a period of total national shutdown, practically overnight and for an indefinite period of time. Now, uh, in 2021, we know that our economy recovers quickly from lockdowns thanks to the resilience that our economic supports gave to the economy. We saw more people in work uh, in July this year than there were before the onset of the pandemic. Indeed, unemployment had dropped to a low of 4.6 per cent. Uh, workforce participation at 66.2 per cent in June, including a record high for female participation. So we know that our economic comeback was strong and that our economy recovers quickly when the, res the necessary restrictions to preserve lives in Australia uh, are, in fact, lifted. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the Commonwealth Government has spent more than $291 billion in direct assistance to individuals, 
businesses and Australian communities. That includes the coronavirus supplement we talk of today, but of course JobKeeper and now, more relevantly, the COVID-19 disaster payment as just one of the supports in place to Australians who are doing it tough. The COVID-19 disaster payment provides targeted and quick support to those who have lost work due to lockdowns. I note that some of these disaster payments are hitting bank accounts less than an hour after the request is made. That is, by definition, targeted, time-limited and effective support to Australians. We know, though, that this is temporary, and it has to be temporary. Any nation must live within its means, and the key to getting out of this is vaccinations. We encourage every Australian to roll up, get vaccinated, as I've done, so that our lives and our livelihoods can get back to a post-COVID normal. In New South Wales, we're seeing really promising rates of vaccination, and I think that gives the people of New South Wales hope and confidence that their hard, hard work is worthwhile. From 1 April this year, the government increased the working age payments, including the JobKeeper payment, by $50 permanently increasing the income-free areas to support job seekers as they secure employment and re-enter the workforce, something that we give every opportunity to in an economy that has rebounded so strongly as the Australian economy. The reason that we focus so strongly on work here on the government benches is not only because of this concept as an economic, uh, economic construct, I should say, but also as a social construct because we understand that work is central to an individual's sense of belonging in a community, connection to their community, and indeed connection to their families in that they're able to offer opportunities to their kids that they might not have had themselves. The single biggest year increase, sorry, single biggest increase year on year to that job seeker payment made by this government, an increase of 9.7 per cent or $50 was designed to ensure that Australia's safety net was effective as that, effective as a safety net, but not a replacement income. Because fundamentally, as I said before, every dollar that we give to someone through that safety net structure needs to be taken from someone that earned it. There is a compact with that, and that's why this government has strengthened mutual obligations throughout the economic recovery. Because that's the arrangement that we enter into here in Australia. If you want to go, you get to go, as the Prime Minister said. There's been no change in the government's view about the role of our social security safety net in Australian society. Our system has served us very well, because prior to this crisis, we saw the proportion of working age Australians reliant on payments down to their lowest level in 30 years, at just 13.5%. And I think that speaks very strongly to the sense of opportunity that the Morrison government's economic management has created. Our government's key focus is creating jobs or helping business to create jobs more correctly and getting people back into work because that is what improves the living standards of the, themselves and their families and their communities. It is not a wage. It is not a salary. And few countries are in the position to provide the strong safety net that we do. JobSeeker is a non-contributory taxpayer-funded payment that provides that safety net irrespective of their circumstances. It's funded by the taxpayers of Australia, and we owe them. We owe them the responsibility to manage that money carefully. That responsibility extends not only to us but to the future generations of Australians who will need to meet the cost of the system in decades to come. We spoke often over the last couple of, uh, couple of years in Australia around intergenerational debt, none more so than in the wake of having to spend, by necessity of a once-in-a-century pandemic, huge amounts of borrowed money. Indeed, the one-off increase to the job seeker payment of $50 uh, we cost $9 billion in borrowed money over the Ford estimates. That is money that, yes, strengthens the safety net here in Australia today, but will be needed to be paid back 
by the Australians of tomorrow. Fundamentally, that is why we have continued through the pandemic to alter policy settings in light of increasing information. We now know we have vaccines in Australia and a road out of this pandemic. We know that the economy bounces back strongly when restrictions are leaved. And that's why, on the 28th of July, the Prime Minister announced the expansion of the COVID-19 disaster payment. From Monday, the 2nd of August this year, increased financial support was available for hundreds of thousands of Australian workers as they were affected by public health orders and restricted movements uh, in their respective state jurisdictions. The current rates of the payment at $450 a week for those who have lost between eight and 20 hours of work and $750 a week for those who have lost 20 or more hours of work reflects the lessons that we learned from the JobKeeper program in terms of making it temporary, time-limited, specific and rapid assistance to those Australians who needed it, meanwhile upholding our compact with the Australian taxpayer to get value for money and ensure that that money was used responsibly. From Tuesday, the 3rd of August, just a day later, a $200 per week payment is available uh, to eligible income support recipients who have lost eight hours or more uh, of work, which is not taxable, will not be included in the income test, and does not need to be reported as income to Services Australia. Claims can be made simply through the MyGov uh, website and, indeed, are hitting bank accounts, as I said, in some cases in less than 60 minutes. That expanded payment arrangement is available from day one of any lockdown. So the government is focused on encouraging those under lockdown at home to stay home and reduce the spread of the virus. They're also encouraging all Australians, obviously, to get vaccinated, because that is how we get back out of this. That is how we allow our economy to prosper. That is how we get families reunited, whether they be split across state borders or indeed split across the globe. Ultimately, we all want the same thing here, and that is for opportunity to resume. So throughout this pandemic, the government has been focused on lives and livelihoods. We have responded to changes in information and we've responded uh, to the needs of Australians, both those temporarily affected by lockdowns and those in need of a safety net until they're able to, uh, to secure gainful employment, as we would all hope that they would. Ultimately, we stand by the success of these policy decisions, basis those impressive, uh, impressive economic indicators uh, through this pandemic, as we have seen unemployment drop to 4.6 per cent. We've seen participation rates hit near record highs and, indeed, a record high participation rate for females in the Australian workforce. That is what success looks like. And it upholds the compact with Australians that when we take a dollar off them to give to an Australian in need, they are genuinely in need. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you very much, Senator Small. And I call Senator Sheldon remotely. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. So also, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge Senator Seward for her forthright and the difference she's made for the unemployed, employed, uh, all those people have been disadvantaged across the community and giving them a voice. And I'd just like to again extend my uh, very best wishes to her. So first of all, you know, the income support for workers, companies and the unemployed makes economic sense. The government's JobKeeper scheme made payments to businesses who would otherwise have had pressure to lay off staff due to the economic impact of COVID-19. The total cost of JobKeeper is likely to be around $90 billion, making it the largest single one-off scheme the Australian government has ever, ever run. Now, of course, to receive the payment, business and not-for-profits had to demonstrate or forecast a particular shortfall in revenue. Businesses with revenue over $1 billion needed a shortfall of 50 per cent. Businesses with revenue under $1 billion needed a shortfall of 30 per cent, and not-for-profits needed a shortfall of 15 per cent. According to an analysis by the Palm Tree Budget Office, over the last six months of the scheme, $13 billion was paid to businesses which had actually increased revenue. Now, we've seen a situation now where these uh, millionaires are making substantial profit 
on corporate welfare, whilst the government's failing to hold them to account and be able to redistribute those resources to where it's needed. The early months of JobKeeper, 15% of the money went to firms with rising earnings. These firms then received, as I say, $13 billion across the whole program. Now, Labor has led the public debate over JobKeeper, misuse, point of firms such as Ascent Group, AP Eagers, and Best and Less, as well as the men's only Australia Club and King's School, who got JobKeeper despite increasing their earnings and no callback. And a special mention should go out to um, Jerry Harvey. And I, I think I, I, I could sum it up in a number of ways, but I think there might be a very nice way it's been summed up by Joe Aston um, just yesterday in rear window in the AFR. I quote, Harvey conducted a round of farcical media interviews in which he refused to even discuss his JobKeeper backflip and complained. I've got certain people in the media that keep attacking me all the time, he said. He hung up on Raphael Epstein after accusing the ABC radio host of bullying him, stating it was groundless. The outlandish exchange ending with the immortal line, you still there, Jerry Harvey? Mm. That hasn't happened in a while. He struggled to emphasize with Harvey or his hurrying persecution. This time four years ago on national television, he was appealing for this columnist to be, and now to be um, summarily executed. And now Jerry would really prefer not to talk about JobKeeper at all. He has that much in common with the treasurer Josh Frydenberg. The challenges of these uh, arrangements, when you look at companies like um, Jerry Harvey, where only part of the money is being paid back, begrudgingly, receiving corporate welfare whilst abusing those that receive welfare, saying it's illegitimate and improper. I mean, quite clearly, it raises serious questions about Jerry Harvey and his entire business. Some companies have repaid with payments totaling $225 million, around 0.25% of the total. That is only 0.25% of the total. But also, but almost all the repayments have come from public companies whose JobKeeper had to be reported in their annual reports. In New Zealand, which is an online register listing all recipients of their wage subsidy scheme, around 5% has been repaid. This is likely due to most transparency being greater in the New Zealand proposal and proposition than what's been done by the Morrison government. You know, they're hiding behind uh, the, the desire not to pursue these corporate welfare chiefs, and they're receiving support, unfortunately, from crossbenchers that are also not driving the tone that should be right about all Australians, all businesses, be paying their fair share of tax and not ripping off the system. But to make matters worse, you've got one condition for the billionaires and there's another condition for 11,000 plus people that have had demands put on them to pay money back. Many of them due to misinformation that they received on the reports that have been made public so far. Now they get 11,000 struggling, poorly paid, people trying to raise a family, trying to put it, keep a roof over their home. And then you've got Jerry Harvey and you've got the $13 billion that those companies have extorted, extorted from the Australian public and taxpayers. And the real problem here is the government don't want Australians to see how badly they steered the job keeper ship. When we see firms like Best and Less who told their investors that this was a one-off sugar hit from JobKeeper that was never re to be repeated, that's the sort of example that you don't need. This money available to the budget right now could be do more to struggling, support struggling businesses and, and the community. And of course, you know, the government in notices uh, for the 11,000 settlement customers related to the JobKeeper payments these notices are often one or two thousand dollars. Centrelink clients are paying them back out of their pension at ten or fifteen dollars a fortnight. After a single payment, 
they have often paid more than the Australian billionaire shareholders and millionaire CEOs. That's clear what the government's priority is. Of course, the government priority regarding the, the uh, situation that people are in from JobKeeper was also exemplified by its failure to turn around and include Donata workers, uh, those aviation workers, many of whom had previously worked for Qantas when the company was bought by a overseas operator. Australian taxpayers for many decades, average age in the late 40s, raising a family, some points supporting grandkids, failed to receive a uh, job keeper. And you know, this is quite clear when you look at that in the contrast to the fact that the government had actually turned around and had a figure of $60 billion that was a shortfall in what they planned on putting towards um, the recovery um, only last year. Now, of course, we go to the situation where, you know, what's happening uh, for people that are in uh, difficult financial situations. And of course, we look at insecure work. We now know over 40% of Australians are now engaged in various forms of insecure work. When you don't have paid sick leave, if you develop symptoms, your choice is either go to work sick or stay home without pay and go hungry. Some people have made ludicrous statements that casual workers get a casual loading in lieu of paid sick leave. So they should have money saved away. Try telling that to people earning the minimum wage while raising a family and paying exorbitant housing costs and bills. Try telling that to aged care workers, 90% of whom are on casual or part-time contracts below minimum income needed to survive. And of course, turning to road transport, the Morrison government has quite clearly abandoned food delivery riders. who are earning as little as $6.67 an hour on exploitive platforms like Uber, and don't get any paid leave whatsoever. Even as they perform essential and risky work delivering meals to people isolating in their homes, then there are parcel delivery drivers at Amazon, another group of Australian workers being exploited by multinational tax dodgers. The ABC expose last week showed that the horrendous conditions of work at Amazon, and of course, Amazon calls them independent contractors. Now, they're not human beings, they're not workers, not people carrying out a duty of care um, in, in, uh, um, to make sure deliveries are made on behalf of their company. No, they are independent contractors, which means they have no rights, no paid sick leave, no entitlement to minimum wage. One driver, Alex Aliff, said, and I quote, they've created an atmosphere of fear. They want drivers to think that they can't do anything wrong. They have to do what Amazon says, like it or lump it, he said. I would also like, he also went on to say, I would like to make enough money to actually live on. This is just no way to live. Because this government isn't really worried about you living on a living, whether it be the support that they've given and failed to give to various workers, or particularly, particularly the lack of regulatory protection for some of the most disadvantaged workers. The CW Secretary, National Secretary Michael Caine said, a deadly recipe of wage theft, contr theft, control and threat of the sack has been laid bare at Amazon Flex. Worker Alex Aliff, using Amazon Flex as his only source of income, was left with under $18,000 in annual earnings after expenses. Well, you know, we saw the amount of money that Amazon and other companies made out of the and continue to make out of the pandemic. Now, Amazon and other companies at the top of the supply chain like Aldi are driving down paying conditions for transport workers, such as truck drivers across Australia, many of them owner drivers. But no protections from this government, no voice from this government. Why would thousands, an example, why would thousands of, of uh, tolls drivers be forced to go on strike last week? Because transport operators like Toll and FedEx are floundering under pressure to compete with Amazon Flex's sham contracting model. It is why Australia is facing weeks of disruption to food, alcohol and fuel supplies as workers are forced to fight threats of mass outsourcing under this government's watch.
hardworking Australians that have kept us going through this pandemic, now being threatened um, with their job security because of a failing in the industrial relations system to give people fair and reasonable rights. The Big Rigs reported this week, this two weeks ago, interstate operator Kevin McDonald said that staff at the Shell Roadhouse, and this is where we get to the point of protecting people. You now we've got Mr. Uh, McDonald says that staff at the Shell Roadhouse in Gilgandra denied him a sit down meal because they had been threatened with a $5,000 fine by New South Wales police. To quote McDonald, it is just crippling them. It's hurting them financially and it's hurting the truck drivers. I want to commend Mr. McDonald, Big Riggs and Senator Stirl because after they raised this issue, the Gilgandra issue was resolved. But Ms. Morris, Mr. Morrison should be making sure that there are clear and consistent rules about this nationwide. So the government needs to be looking at its consequences and its impact of the decisions that it's made over this period of time. Even Mr. Morrison's own workers in the Australian Public Service are being abandoned during the pandemic. At a hearing of the Job Security Committee last week, we heard that APS workers are being outsourced to labour hire companies by the thousands. And while APS workers are entitled to paid vaccine leave and paid leave if they have to isolate, labour hire companies like Hayes, which received over $300 million from the federal government last year, are not giving their APS workers those same rights. Now, it's clear that the pressure that's been going on small business in Western Sydney and this government has failed, failed in its vaccine and quarantine rollout. Like, I, I know, that, I know that the government gets sick and tired of hearing this, but you did fail. Admit to your failure the fact that you've put us in this community and Western Sydney in such dire straits. And of course you failed to make sure that it was delivered to people in the mo in most remote Indigenous communities. Now, you failed to turn around and make sure that there is a proper system that applies for areas such as tourism and aviation sectors. You know, even where government have done a tremendous job of keeping COVID-19 out, such as in Queensland, Western Australia, Tasmania and Northern Territory, there is still a heavy economic toll as a result of Mr Morrison's failures on vaccines and quarantine. In the Northern Territory, for example, tourism operators are suffering as a result of not having the same support that the federal government provided last year. Tourism Central Australia CEO Daniel Rochford said, and I quote, the reality is last year was bad, but this year has been disastrous. The only difference is that we don't have the safety net that we had this time last year. And that goes to the essence of the incompetency of this government. A failure to turn around and appropriately and adequately support the community in times of need whilst picking winners and losers, billionaire winners and regular hard-working people that are receiving uh, welfare benefits are the losers. So corporate welfare for one and persecution for the other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, if I could, on indulgence, I would just like to take a minute, since this is the last general business debate for Senator Seawitt. So I just really wanted to say thank you for your work and your support over the time that we've worked together. As a new senator and a member of the Community Affairs Committee, and in the pre-COVID world, I used to joke that I spent more time with Senator Askew than I did my own family. But of course, you were always there as well. And we also had a couple of WA trips together where we were the only two physically holding up the fort. Now, whilst there's been more issues we've disagreed on than agreed on, and we'll get to those soon, you've always conducted yourself professionally, demonstrated a tireless work ethic, and is someone who I believe is innately decent. Now, for some of us on the opposite side of organisations such as the Unemployed Workers Union, whom I know you've tried to explain them to me, but still eludes me, you were always supportive when the political discourse went far beyond being anywhere near appropriate behaviour. You never made politics personal. You supported everyone on the Community Affairs Committee and always understood that there were family circumstances afoot 
and quite often they were discussed over a wine in an airport lounge in between hearing venues. So I, for one, will miss your contribution to this place and wish you all the best. Thank you. But as you know from our time on our community affairs inquiries into raising the new start rate, the Centrelink compliance program and cashless debit card, there are actually very few times we were on the same side of the issue. And I guess here we are again. So we may as well finish where we started. The Morrison government has, throughout this pandemic, worked on financial assistance for Australians to suit the situation of the time. This pandemic has evolved in such a way that it's hard to believe in early 2020 we weren't really sure how it spread and what the long-term impacts would be. And then, in the fastest speed we've ever seen, the world got to work on a vaccine, a vaccine that we're now seeing close to 2 million Australians receiving each and every week. And we know that vaccination is the key to our recovery, to reopening internally, but also to the rest of the world. We need to learn to live with this virus. And I do know that it is Senator Seward that's calling for the government to reinstate the coronavirus supplement, even though she is a senator from Fortress WA, the COVID free land where West Australians can live their lives unaffected by lockdowns. And we know this because Premier McGowan keeps telling us this, that the lock the border cry has now its own merchandise. And those dreadful people from the eastern side of Australia, will you just stay away from us in WA? So why would the Morrison government look to a national payment when clearly there's no need for it in Western Australia? Because this is what we do as a government. We ensure that the financial assistance is targeted and it reaches the people who actually require it the most. Why would the land of West Australia want national resources diverted away from Australians who are experiencing lockdown when they enjoy all the freedoms the Premier consistently speaks of. But I would just like to note today he has genuinely been overtaken by Premier Palaszczuk this week, allowing in a plane load of footballers and their families whilst keeping a three-year-old separated from his family, which I do very gratefully note that that is looking to be rectified soon, but then to claim she wants to stay closed off, well, except from footballers and celebrities, until children are all vaccinated. All children, despite globally there not being one vaccine approved for children under 12. The chutzpah is unbelievable. I'd like to say more. And I know through you, Chair, after our speech the other day, I have absolutely no doubt it would be deemed as unparliamentary language. But what we have seen this year from the Morrison government is the single biggest boost to unemployment benefits increasing it by $50, along with permanently increasing the income-free areas to support job seekers as they look to secure employment and re-enter the workforce. Now, when the whole country was locked down, there was a coronavirus supplement, but this was always a temporary measure and was for all Australians on JobSeeker, because all of Australia was locked down. Now, whilst we have New South Wales, ACT and Victoria in lockdown, these conditions aren't national. No lockdowns in Queensland, Tasmania, South Australia, the Northern Territory and, of course, the locked off but not locked down Western Australia. The payments that we've made available to all Australians have never been based on a set and forget model. They've been planned and timed to ensure that they can have the greatest impact when required. And that's why last year, from April through to September, there was available to all job seeker and other payment recipients an additional $550 per fortnight. But we've seen the landscape change. Not every state has been in lockdown at the same time since then. But this government does recognise that these restrictions, when imposed by state and territory governments, can mean additional financial hardship, with hours lost or work totally put on hold. And that's why, in order to support Australians that are affected in lockdown, states and territories, we've put in place the COVID disaster payment. Now, it's up to $750 a week, but for those already receiving government support, it means an additional $200 a week. So on top of the already increased job seeker payment, those Australians are receiving an additional $400 per fortnight on their payments. 
and this payment came into effect on 3 August 2021 and will continue every single week whilst that state or territory remains in lockdown. There are also crisis payments available if someone is deemed a close contact or needs to quarantine or a close contact and needs to quarantine or if in fact they test positive for the virus. These are measured and targeted supports to those Australians who are impacted by lockdowns, lockdowns put in place by state and territory leaders. So, Senator Seward, I know has a very different view than I do when it looks at social security. On this side, we believe it's a safety net for all Australians, and I know Senator Seward looks to it more as a living wage model. And that is a point of difference that I know we've shared on a number of our inquiries and debates. But the Morrison government has committed to supporting job seekers in a multiple of ways, not only in those lockdown states and the additional payments being received, but in initiatives around ensuring there are training opportunities, there are opportunities to assist people back into the workforce and to see them come out of this pandemic as we've seen so many other people go back into the workplace and try and re-enter the workforce to ensure they're not reliant on government payments. But it is a fitting way, I think, to finish the day, Senator Seward, talking about one of our favourite topics, <laughs> again from opposite sides of the chamber. You will be missed from the Community Affairs Committee, and I wish you all the very best in the future. And I look forward to talking to you on our DSP inquiry on Monday. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Walsh? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I, too, uh, rise to speak on Senator Seawood's motion, uh, her motion today, that notes that the Morrison government has abandoned people in lockdowns on income support uh, payments. And I, too, um, would like to add some words and pay tribute to, to Senator Seawitt uh, on what is her uh, last day uh, in the federal parliament. Uh, and Senator Seawitt, um, you are a senator who has never forgotten where you come from. Uh, you've never forgotten who you came into the parliament to, to fight for. Uh, and just in my time here, I've seen you do an amazing job of making sure that the invisible people of our country have a strong and loud voice. Uh, and no doubt um, you will continue to make sure that the forgotten people of our country are heard um, as you go on with your life beyond this parliament. Um, so thank you very much for all of the incredible work that you have done uh, and uh, going to the, to the motion that Senator Seawood has put forward uh, today, um, the Prime Minister and the entire Morrison government have failed to adequately support uh, the Australian people throughout this pandemic. Uh, and this is what we've come to expect from a Prime Minister who would rather blame people, who would rather shift responsibility uh, than lead, than lead people through. Um, because under this Prime Minister, um, it's always someone else's responsibility. Uh, it's always someone else's job. Uh, this is a Prime Minister who would rather pick a fight with a state premier than help struggling Australians. Uh, and there are so many Australians who are struggling around the country today. Uh, he would rather let people slip through the cracks than admit um, when he's got something wrong. Uh, and during 2020, we all found out the hard way um, that financial support uh, is absolutely critical to keeping people going through this pandemic, keeping people going with the economic crisis that has resulted from the health crisis that we are all experiencing. Um, we learned in 2020 just how important, consistent, um, reliable support that people can count on is in keeping people in jobs um, and keeping businesses afloat uh, and helping people survive through what um, can only be described as extraordinarily difficult times. Uh, but somehow, as we came into 2021, 
uh, it seems that this lesson um, of 2020 was really completely lost on the Morrison government, um, a government that decided as it came into 2020 um, that the pandemic was already over, that it was over in Christmas uh, 2020. Uh, and they decided that the pandemic was over when they came into 2021 because like everyone, they wanted it to be, um, because it was all just a little bit too hard, um, because it was someone else's problem to keep coming up with solutions to keep the country going. Uh, but as we know, and as we know, um, really the hard way right now with millions of Australians locked down across the country. Um, this virus doesn't take holidays like the Prime Minister does. This virus doesn't take holidays like the Morrison government does. It doesn't care about calendars. It doesn't care if you're over it. Uh, and so despite what we learned in 2020, um, when lockdowns commenced this year, in 2021, the Morrison government was absolutely too slow to start and deliver and act on the vital financial support that people needed and that people continue to need today. Financial support which was essential to keep businesses afloat. Um, financial support that was essential to keep workers in jobs. Um, financial support um, that was essential to keep people reliant on social security um, being able to keep their heads above water. Financial support that was vital to keeping families housed and keeping families fed. Um, so in March, despite this pandemic being far from over, the government decided that it was time to cancel JobKeeper. Um, and what an extraordinary decision that was. What an extraordinarily bad decision that was. The government cancelling JobKeeper payments, the very wage subsidy that had seen so many millions of Australians through, um, the economic crisis that followed, the health crisis in 2020. Uh, and that was despite the calls of so many people uh, that JobKeeper should not be ended early. So many people, including those on our benches, who could see that it was way too early to end the financial support that people needed to keep their heads above water. Uh, and it wasn't until June um, this year that the government announced a new COVID disaster payment. Uh, and even then, it took them until the end of July to match the original JobKeeper rates uh, and to include a payment for people who had lost work uh, and who were on income support. And during this time, hundreds of thousands of people were forced to scramble to make ends meet as their hours were cut and as jobs were lost. Hundreds of thousands of people. People who were already stressed by the health risks of the pandemic. People who were already stressed about whether they would have a job to go back to at the end. And people who were already stressed about the impact on their children, on the impact of their elderly parents, on the impact on their communities. Um, and absolutely at a time when the country was again in the middle of the COVID crisis, the government was nowhere to be seen. Right when people needed the government to have their backs, right, right when people needed a break from the government, right when they needed certainty about what was going to happen for them and for their families. The Morrison government told them to wait, just to hold tight, to hold tight as the country started to lock down again, while the government figured out what its plan would be to provide essential financial support, essential financial support that they cut too early despite the warnings. Uh, and instead, the Morrison government told people to wait and to raid their savings, to raid their super savings and superannuation that so many lower waged Australians just don't have. Uh, to raid the superannuation that people should be able to keep for their retirement. And the Morrison government had months to rebuild a financial support program for the next stage of this crisis such as the third wave that we are facing right now. Um, but again, it was too late. It was too little and too late. It took 
four weeks into the Greater Sydney lockdown to finally build a package which equaled the original JobKeeper payment rates four weeks into a lockdown when people were struggling. So if only this government had learned the lessons of 2020, if only they had rebuilt JobKeeper without the rorts. Uh, and the JobKeeper rorts saw $13 billion of taxpayer money paid to big businesses, um, big businesses who went on to make a profit. Uh, and we've heard the Treasurer try to justify how this happened. Uh, but he, as the manager of the scheme, he had the power to make changes to ensure that the scheme was working as the Parliament intended uh, and that the public money that the people had entrusted the government was spent appropriately. Uh, and the Treasurer did nothing for six months, while $13 billion of taxpayer money flowed straight into the pockets of some of Australia's wealthiest and most profitable companies and executives. $13 billion that was intended to support struggling businesses to keep their staff employed and keep their doors open during the pandemic. Um, $13 billion which instead went directly into big business profits. Uh, now, this government has made some efforts to recover JobKeeper payments. Um, but of course, those efforts have not been to recover JobKeeper payments from the businesses who used that public money to boost their profits and pay their executive bonuses. No, the government's efforts to recover JobKeeper payments have been from people who received them whilst on social security. Um, what a complete disgrace. 11,000 people have been sent debt notices from this government trying to claw back the $33 million in overpayments, uh, an average of around $300, $3,000 per person. Uh, and that is the priority that the government has put on recovering JobKeeper payments, not the $13 billion that went to companies that were making profits, not the $13 billion that went into executive bonuses, not the $13 billion that has gone into lining the bank accounts of companies that were already profitable, but going after the payments that were made to people on social security. Um, the hypocrisy of this government is extraordinary. The hypocrisy of this government knows absolutely no bounds. Uh, but none of us would be surprised by that because this is a government that always goes after the vulnerable people in our community first. Always hard on the vulnerable and soft on the strong. That is the character of this Morrison government. Uh, and who could forget what this government said to the victims of their illegal robo-debt scheme, their illegal robo-debt scheme. We'll find you, we'll track you down and you will have to repay those debts and you may end up in prison. That is what the minister said to the victims of the illegal robo-debt scheme. Uh, and meanwhile, they've left um, the companies who received $13 billion of taxpayer money to boost their profits completely off the hook. Um, they are using an entirely different language to talk to those companies, those recipients of public welfare. Um, we're not in the politics of envy, Prime Minister Morrison says. If there are some companies that feel they want to hand that back, great, good for them. So it's one rule for big business and it's another rule for struggling Australians under the Morrison government. Now, Labor, we just do not accept that Social Security recipients should be hounded to pay back their debts while big business pocket $13 billion that it turns out that they did not need. Uh, and that's why we have been publicly calling for a greater transparency about the payments of JobKeeper to large companies making big profits. Um, because in order to put pressure on these companies to pay back the money, we actually need to know who received money uh, and how much they got. Uh, because this government has absolutely no plan to get back the $13 billion that companies have profited. That $13 billion should be put into perspective um, about what else that taxpayer money could have been used for, because that is more than this government spent in a year on public schools. Um, it is um, enough 
to have built fibre to the home broadband for every urban home in Australia. And those of us who have been remoting in, we would have really appreciated that investment. Uh, it's almost $1,000 for every Australian adult, $13 billion, which could have been used to support businesses still in lockdown due to this government's total failure to roll out the vaccine which could have been used to properly fix the problems in aged care, which this government has still not responded to, starting with a plan for the workers. $13 billion, which could have supported workers who this government left off JobKeeper in the first place. Workers in our hardest hit and most insecure industries. Workers that this government told to just smash open their piggy banks, just drain their superannuation while they left some of the richest Senator companies pocket Walsh, your billion time dollars. has expired. I'll now call the minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the next meeting of the Senate. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Thank minister. you. I move that A, the President may alter the day and time of the next meeting of the Senate at the request of or the agreement of the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, and the time of meeting shall be notified to each Senator. B. The Senate may meet in a manner and form not otherwise provided in the standing orders with the agreement of the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, and that the rules and orders necessary to constitute such a meeting may be determined by the Procedure Committee. And C. Leave of absence granted to every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting today to the day on which the Senate next meets. The question is, is that the motion is is that question be agreed to? All those of the opinion say aye. Aye. Against no, the ayes have it. I now propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Roberts? Yes, Madam Acting Deputy President. Proceed. Thank you. As a servant to the Sorry? Uh, sorry. Continue. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I ask questions from constituents. To what depths of insanity and wickedness have we sunk when government believes it has licence to dictate to parents that they are no longer able to look after their grandchildren? When it comes to care for children, government has no right to intrude into families and decide what a normal household activity looks like. While Victoria takes the prize for this particularly grotesque directive, all state, territory and federal governments have shown stupidity and inhumanity on incongruent, hypocritical and needlessly destructive COVID restrictions. Quoting former US Vice President Hubert Humphrey, the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of their life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, State and federal governance during COVID fails this moral test. Our children are forgotten. Physical, emotional, psychological, educational and health needs have been in the main ignored. Yesterday, the Queensland Premier, instead of using her Chief Health Officer as her usual shield to avoid an intelligent statement on our state's future, she used our children. Feigning concern, her question was, what's going to happen to the children if we open borders too soon? We already know what's happening to our children, a terrifying, unfolding tragedy. In Victoria, the government received a health report on the state of its children, an ugly, mortifying reflection on Victoria's abuse of people. Yet the Premier ignores it, buries it, deems it largely unworthy of comment and continues to threaten and scold Victorians over non-compliance with his own insane worldview. Any moral, just, competent and compassionate government would solemnly reflect on more than 340 teenagers suffering mental health emergencies admitted every week to hospitals, a 162% increase. 156 teenagers every week rush to hospital for attempting suicide or self-harm. 37 of them needing emergency treatment or surgery, an 88% increase. 90% increase in children with eating disorders. This is the ultimate transgression, neglect and abandonment. This is our vulnerable children's cry for help. Our persistent ignorance and silence on children's mental health needs is unforgivable, particularly after 18 months of COVID mismanagement. In New South Wales, daily, more than 40 children and teenagers rush to hospital for self-harm, 
up 31 per cent. Acute mental health admissions for children and young people, up 43 per cent. At Gold Coast Hospital, a 212 per cent spike in eating disorders from 2019 to 2020. Queensland's Butterfly Foundation says calls for help increased 34 per cent for eating disorders from January 2020 to January 2021. 85 per cent were first-time callers for the helpline. In August, Lifeline Suicide Prevention had its busiest days in its 57-year history. Children may wait six to nine months before seeing a psychiatrist. Children suffering with depression, eating disorders or suicidal thoughts may not be able to wait nine months. Will this be the final nail in their coffin? Parents now have to work from home, educate their children and are now frontline mental health workers. Our children's mental health needs have become more urgent as never-ending draconian restrictions offer no light at the end of a lengthening tunnel. Yet our health officials eagerly and excitedly round up our young for mass vaccinations. We humans are gregarious and our primal need to socialise sustains our very breath. Persistent, externally, capriciously imposed social isolation tears at the fabric of what makes us human, keeps us physically well and holds us literally sane. An adult brain can work hard at rationalising the incursions, loss of freedoms and isolation. Sometimes, though, it's even too much for adults. Children's brains are vulnerable and underdeveloped, and it's inhuman to expect children to process and cope with restrictions that adults impose. Adults who themselves appear on the edge of insanity. Our children suffer the greatest deprivations. Deprivation of liberty, deprivation of education, deprivation of normal development, deprivation of swings, slippery sides and rides on the bike, swims at the beach and local sport, deprivation of crucial friendship supports and separated parents, deprivation of loving grandparents' arms and hugs. Children must urgently return to the anchors that sustain us. Mental health professionals are campaigning for children's mental health needs and it's overdue that we hear their voices. People are rightly increasingly cynical about governments falsely claiming to be keeping us safe a deeply sad mocking of reality. Governments are driving us to the wall of insanity and our children are first in line as collateral damage. Without our mental health, we have no solid grasp on living a life. Our first duty is to save our children, human, humankind's hope and promise. We have one flag, we have one community, we Order. have one nation, we Senator have one Roberts, future. Um, I'll take this opportunity to thank all senators, Senate officials and parliamentary staff for their assistance in operations during this unique parliamentary session. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday the 18th of October at 10am.